13, 13, 12, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to GeoPoetry 2020. So my name is Patrick Corbett, and I am speaking to you from Edinburgh. And I have got a few introduction slides to give uh, before we get into the main program. First of all, I would like to acknowledge the various organizations that have helped bring this together. Uh, it's largely been run by the Geological Society on whom Zoom's platform we are operating. Thanks to sponsorship from the Scottish Energy Forum, everybody's allowed to join in. Uh, I don't know how many people we have, but we were getting up towards 400 registrations and we are live on YouTube, so we could have a very large audience. It's also supported by the Scottish Poetry Library, where we should have been meeting uh, in the pre-COVID planning. We were going to meet in the Scottish Poetry Library, uh, and we are also hosted by the Edinburgh uh, Geological Society. So i just like to thank the organizing committee uh, under myself there. There's a group of people that have done various things along the way to help uh, help promote, help give advice, uh, help to make contacts with poets. We're very fortunate to have a lovely uh, collection of both uh, professional geoscientists and professional poets here today, but also amateur geologists and amateur poets, which I hope you will all uh, take into account when we are talking. Uh, we've got uh, a very busy program, you know, so after uh, the, the introduction, uh, we go into the uh, first session. We're going to have a short break somewhere in the mid-morning. Uh, and the idea is that each of our contributors is going to try and have a completely seamless uh, move on this technology from one to the other. So there won't be people introducing, the poets will introduce themselves uh, and then they will talk for a either five or 15 minute slot that they have been allocated. Uh, and then the afternoon we have a few more breaks and then this long day of poetry, some eight and a half hours ends up at somewhere after six this evening. And uh, by that time, I think we'll have learnt a little bit more about both geopoetry and geopoetics. Uh, I do draw attention, you've all been sent, those that are registered, have all been sent um, a document with all the poems in, all the biographies of the speakers and all their contributions, uh, such as they have. And right on the last page of this document, John Hegley has given us a, a, a sketch which he's asked us to think about and provide a caption. Uh, and this caption, uh, you can send your entry to me and I will collate all these by midnight on Sunday. So we're not going to give you a long time to think about this. So uh, the caption competition uh, for John Hegley's poem uh, is uh, in the back uh, of your document. So as I say, the way we're going to work is to uh, have the poets, hopefully they keep microphones and videos off, uh, if you want to make comments direct to the speakers, then you can put those in the chat, those that have access to the chat. Uh, and, and if there is a time, there may be possibility for the, author, the poet to, to read those and to come back on something. But they can also review feedback after their slot. So it's not really a, a long period of discussion after each poem. We will be monitoring the time slots, and this is uh, live streamed and... Uh, the recording of this will be available afterwards on the Joel Sox webpage, uh, so you have this. So the background to this meeting, it really is a follow-up to one that was held by Professor Brian Lovell uh, in 2011 in the Geological Society, uh, where they had something like 100 people turn up and, and maybe 20 poems. And some people in the uh, session today we're also at this first meeting unfortunately Brian Lovell is not with us as I understand we wanted to do something in the geological society in Scotland and thought that poetry and geology comes together so nicely in in Edinburgh that's a great place to bring together those people in the geoscience community that work with poetry and also the wider poetry community through the poetry library and I was interested to see what's out there and we've brought together 
uh, quite a lot of material. We also provided inspiration, so some people have sat down and uh, both written some new stuff. Uh, and to a certain extent, I follow in the footsteps of Patrick Geddes. Um, he, was a, he, was, uh, he first taught at Heriot Watt University, so there's a nice link there to, to my institution. Uh, and he had these three birds, the sympathy, synergy, and synthesis. So I think we're looking at sympathy for the challenges that poets face, sympathy for the challenges that geologists face. We try to work together, and then we're hoping to produce a volume at the end of this. And, you know, the, the whole thing here is to improve what we do and, and why we do at a time when we have a very great visibility of geoscience, great demand for energy and minerals. Uh, where I come from in the oil and gas industry, we always have a health and safety moment. So I just remind all the people online to make sure they've turned things off the stove and everything because you can get sucked into this. So Brian, uh, uh, Brian, uh, if I can get rid of the... Maybe I can get rid of this here. Uh, Brian had a sort of call to arms at the Geopoetry event, you know, and I let you read that yourself. Uh, and, I, and I highlight the last... Uh, phrase here, the last sentence. Poets and geologists have a common cause, a search for words to help us understand what we do. So I think that's what we're doing here today. So um, you are lucky or not in Edinburgh because it's currently, well it was raining and so I would be very stressed out because the whole meeting was planned to go up onto Arthur's seat on a nice sunny day like in the picture and have uh, Yvonne Reddick uh, read to us some poems and gather on the hill. Uh, so knowing that we were going to be online today, uh, we took this part of the event uh, and had a socially distanced walk a, a few weekends ago. Um, and I have recorded something which I am now playing for you. Uh, it starts silent, so don't worry. It starts with a, a, a sort of Arthur's seat. Dorothy Wordsworth, 16th of September, 1803. This morning it was downright dismal, very dark and promising nothing but a wet day. And before breakfast was over, the rain began, though not heavily. We set out upon our walk and went through many streets to Holyrood House and thence to the hill called Arthur's Seat, a high hill, very rocky at the top and below covered with smooth turf on which sheep were grazing. We climbed up till we came to St Anthony's Well and Chapel, as it is called, but it is more like a hermitage than a chapel, a small ruin, which from its situation is exceedingly interesting, though in itself not remarkable. We sat down on a stone not far from the chapel, overlooking a pastoral hollow as wild and solitary as any in the heart of the Highland Mountains. There, instead of the roaring of torrents, we listened to the noises of the city, which were blended in one loud, indistinct buzz, a regular sound in the air, which in certain moods of feeling and at certain times might have a more tranquilizing effect upon the mind than those which we are accustomed to hear in such places. Well, I'll hand over to Yvonne. Sorry. Thank you very much indeed, Pat. It's wonderful to be here. Um, that was a, a wonderful, wonderful walk um, that we did. It was a brilliant coming together of poets and geologists. If you just bear with me a moment, um, I'm going to share my screen with you. So with a bit of luck, uh, you can see some images of some of the walks that we encountered. Um, and you can uh, you can take a look at the details of the hike. So here we go. I hope you can see that. Um, so we were a team of poets, geologists and hikers going up Arthur's seat this August. Uh, I'm going to take you on the hike. We'll be pausing at intervals to read a few poems 
and I hope one day you can follow the hike yourself. Um, so to hear those words by Dorothy Wordsworth, we were actually standing on a basalt intrusion. Um, and Pat was giving us some wonderful, wonderful information um, about the volcano and uh, the history of Arthur's seat. Um, any misinterpretations or any inaccuracies in the geological information are all mine. I can take credit for them. Um, so uh, after we've heard after we'd heard from Dorothy Wordsworth, we headed up to the top of Arthur's seat, which is that kind of lion's head feature, which is made out of basalt. Um, and Pat told us that this was basalt that had come a bit nearer to the surface of the earth, and it, it was below the crater of the volcano itself. Robert and Pat spotted something rather interesting. It was that vein of crystals uh, that you should be able to see on the photo. Um, and, and that uh, has, has found its way into the basalt. So my poem for the top of Arthur's seat is William Topaz McGonagall's wonderful Edinburgh. Beautiful city of Edinburgh borrow where the tourist can drown his sorrow by viewing your monuments and statues fine during the lovely summertime. I'm sure it will his spirits cheer as Sir Walter Scott's monument he draws near that stands in East Prince's Street amongst flowery gardens fine and neat. And Edinburgh Castle is magnificent to be seen with its beautiful walks and trees so green, which seems like a fairy dell. And nearby its rocky basement is St Margaret's Well, where the tourist can drink at when he feels dry and view the castle from beneath so very high, which seems almost towering to the sky. Then as for Nelson's monument that stands on Calton Hill, as the tourist gazes thereon, with wonder his heart does fill, as he thinks on Admiral Nelson, who did the Frenchman kill. Then as for Salisbury Crags, they are most beautiful to be seen, especially in the month of June, when the grass is green, their numerous molehills can be seen, and the busy little creatures howking away, searching for worms among the clay. And as the tourist's eye does wander to and fro from the south side of Salisbury Crags below, his bosom with admiration feels all aglow as he views the beautiful scenery in the valley below. And if, with an observant eye, the little loch beneath he scans, he can see the wild ducks about and beautiful white swans. Then as for Arthur's seat, I'm sure it is a treat most worthy to be seen with its rugged rocks and pastures green and the sheep browsing on its sides to and fro with slow paced strides and the little lambkins at play during the live long summer day. Beautiful city of Edinburgh, the truth to express your beauties are matchless, I must confess, at which no one dare gainsay, but that you are the grandest city in Scotland at the present day. So that's William Topaz McGonagall, impervious to the criticisms and laughter of his contemporaries. So um, also on the summit of Arthur's seat, we saw some very interesting rock. Uh, it looked a little bit like the vent agglomerates that you can see um, over on the east side of the volcano, uh, but Pat identified it as an Anthropocene agglomerate. That's concrete to you and me. Um, at the top of the topmost hill, we read Jackie Kay's beautiful poem, Fear. I've been away from Glasgow for so long that I would make an absolute mess of the Scots if I tried to do it, so um, bear with me. Fear. If you went to the topmost hill where we used to climb as girls, you'd see the snow that day, fear, settling on the skills. You'd mind of another day, maybe. We ran down the hill in the snow, sliding and singing our way to the foot, lassies laughing together, how broad. The years slipping away, out in the weather. And now we're suddenly old, fear. Our friendship's ne'er been weary. We've eyes seen the world differently. Where would I have been without my Joe, my fear, my fiercy, my dearie-o? 
Our hair might be silver now, our walk only a bit doddery. But we've had a whirl and a blast, girl, through the cold blast winter, through spring, summer. Oh, a lifetime, my fear, my bonnie lassie, I defend you, me. Blithe and blatter, here we gang down the hill, no matter, past the bracken, bothy, bonnie, braes, barley, out by the roaring sea, still having a blether. We who loved sincerely, we who loved so fiercely, the snow ne'er looked so barry, nor the winter trees so pretty. Come on, come on, my dearie, take my hand, my fear. So when we descended from the top of Arthur's seat onto the kind of flank of the lion from the northeast side, we could see a view that stretched all the way across Holyrood Park to a wisp of um, smoke coming up from the Grangemouth refinery. And west, we could look towards the volcanic plug of Bass Rock. Um, and Pat pointed out two small floating rigs in the Firth. And as an oil engineer's daughter, I was absolutely fascinated. What he also spotted on the way down was a deposit of barite. Um, and he was telling us all that it's used in drilling mud uh, on oil platforms. So it was, a, it was a fascinating walk from that perspective. Um, and apropos of heat and forges and fuel, I wanted to read you one of my absolute favorite poems. This is The Tradition by Kathleen Jamie, and it, it, it's stunning. For years, I wandered hill and moor, half looking for the road winding into fairyland, where that blacksmith kept a forge who'd heat red hot the dragging links that bound me to the past. Then, with one almighty hammer blow, unfetter me at last. Older now, I know nor fee nor anvil breaks those chains, and the wild ways we think we walk just bring us here again. So we wrapped up our walk um, with a stroll along Queen's Ride, and we could see Dunsapi Loch. Uh, Pat pointed out incredible things to us that were evidence of the volcano's volcanic um, and volatile past. Uh, we saw an enormous volcanic bomb, we saw a vent agglomerate, um, and we saw some silicon sides which uh, formed in, in a fault, and you can see a photo of them on the right hand side there. But we also got to take a look at uh, Samson's ribs and the lines of Samson's ribs, because this was the Geo Poetry Gathering, look a little bit like lines of poetry to us. And we're saying that there are probably quite a lot of poems that could still be written, actually based on Arthur's seat and based on our meanderings around it. Um, I just wanted to wrap up with a quick reflection about what interdisciplinarity is and, and what it means to me. I, I found it the most wonderful and, and fruitful opportunity to collaborate. I remember my old manager at the Institute for Advanced Study at, at Warwick University saying, interdisciplinarity is well worth doing, if nothing else, it improves your social life. But what we're doing today is better than that, it's transdisciplinarity. It's far more interesting, it's far more engaging, and, and just on Arthur's seat, I had some brilliant conversations um, with geologists, and you know, the, the cross fertilization of ideas was absolutely fantastic. So, um, I just wanted to thank Patrick, uh, Robert, and Ken who were there on the day, especially Pat for organizing this. Um, and thank you to John, Richard and Aero from the Manchester and District Walkers um, for coming along. It was a wonderful occasion and I hope at some point we'll be able to repeat it in the future. Thank you very much indeed. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Rob Francis, and uh, I am the one of the lecturers in uh, creative and professional writing at the University of Wolverhampton. 
and currently the poet in residence for the Black Country Geological Society. And I'm working on a project that I'm calling the Chain Coral Chorus. And that's what I wanna talk briefly about with you today. So, as I said, I'm part of the Black Country and that's where I'm uh, transmitting from today in the heart of Dudley. Um, and the Black Country is a, a, a small post-industrial place in the, the West Midlands. It's just kind of to the west and north of uh, Birmingham. Um, mainly known for its industrial past and the part it played in, it, in the Industrial Revolution through chain works and nail workers and glass works and such like. Um, but I kind of also think of it as a, as a strange, marginal, liminal and borderless place. It's kind of not quite north and not quite south. It's uh, a strange mix of rural and urban and green and grey space. Um, we've got our own set of dialects and uh, unique culture and community uh, and our own flag but no one can really decide where it begins and ends. And a sort of joke in the black country uh, is if you want to start a fight round here, you just need to ask someone, where is the black country? Um, and I think what this sort of gives rise to is a, a sort of strange in-betweenness or off-kilterness and, and liminality, because we've got this strange mix of green and gray space of rural and urban, of ruined and renovated because so much of our identity is kind of drawn from our industrial past, but much, much of that has now kind of been uh, uh, ruined or, or, or built over. So we're also this kind of weird mix of, um, of uh, new and old as well. And in a kind of Freudian sense, sort of, a weird mix of homely and unhomely and, and safe and unsafe. And um, one of the kind of uh, areas of thought that I use to, to think, think about this is uh, to think about it in terms of environmental psychology and especially the work of uh, the, the theorist Harold Brashansky, who uh, coined the term place identity. And this is what he said about place identity. He called it a substructure of self-identity consisting of memories, ideas, feelings, attitudes, values, preferences, meanings and conceptions of behaviour and experience that occur in places and satisfy an individual's biological, psychological, social and cultural needs. And the environmental psychologists argue that a, a place uh, meets a person's needs and they become dependent on it when they choose to stay there. The longer a person stays in a place, the greater the likelihood of the, that, that place being incorporated into their identity structure, especially if that place offers feelings of distinctiveness, of continuity, of self-esteem and self-efficacy. So place dependence refers to the kind of functional features of a place that then facilitate the activities uh, and emotional connections that the uh, psychologists call place attachment. So we could maybe see our kind of place identity as being a kind of biological organism that sort of moves through time space and develops uh, a, a sense of self within place through the accommodation and the assimilation and evaluation of the social world, but also of the physical world and the lay of the land and the makeup of the land, because that's what gives rise to the cultures and communities. And the other important aspect of environmental psychology is that they argue that a kind of uh, sense of continuity about our sense of self within locales uh, is as important to our identities as our class, genders, religions, ethnicities, and all the other things that we, we note as important markers of our identity. So this is where I kind of 
think about this in sort of metaphorical terms as well, because you could see place identity as a kind of form of chains of, of various different chain links and that they link the person and the the community to the to the particular place and culture that they exist in but they're also linked together so you get this kind of strange web or mesh of different symbols and signifiers within a place um and this kind of takes me into the kind of the black country uh, and my metaphor of chain coral uh, many of you will already know that chain coral is a, a now extinct form of coral that sort of branches off in single cells forming really beautiful honeycomb patterns uh, and this was found uh, uh, to colonize an area 480 million years ago that was to become the black country uh, and the black country is in part known famously for its chain makers uh, and so the chain and the symbol of the chain runs very deep in the cultural psyche of our region. Uh, which has kind of led me into investigating the Black Country Geopark and working with the Black Country Geological Society. Um, the Black Country Geopark is a, a series of different sites of geological significance uh, and really glorious, beautiful, lush areas of natural uh, uh, nature reserves. Um, it's also where they found the Dudley bug, which was a giant trilobite that they found in Wren's Nest Nature Reserve, uh, which then became uh, the symbol on the crest of Dudley. So that's how kind of uh, important it is to, um, to, to, the, to the region and the, the geological significance of the region. And obviously uh, without the fossil rich grounds and the limestone rich grounds of the region we wouldn't have had uh, our place in the industrial past and indeed the the unique uh, chain linked honeycombed cultures and communities that drew out of that as well so this is what i do i'm, I'm going around and i'm investigating the 40 plus sites of the region um and and uh taking a kind of geopoet's eye view of where the um where the where the bedrock of place identity comes from and that's sort of what i'm looking for really i'm, I'm trying to delve into the grounds to kind of bring about uh the sort of foundation stones of where this um where this this black country place identity lurks and i think you know, this is where it really connects for me with uh, the sort of foundation texts of geopoetics as well, and in particular Kenneth White's work, because what I'm doing here really is a is a deep time observation of my immediate locale. White was very very keen on kind of refiguring our relationship with our immediate uh, everyday realms, so it's a, a deep time observation. It's an understanding of the minutiae of the locale and also a calling for new ways of seeing and new ways of recording place through an embodied knowledge because I'm going out and getting my, my fingers dirty within a place that I know very well, but I'm now learning about on new terms. It becomes this embodied knowledge that White was so passionate about, is so passionate about. Uh, and what this brings about, I think, is again, what White called the topological presence or even a, a kind of topological reverie, which I think I think of in, in, as akin to the kind of romantics like John Clare and William Blake, uh, or, or even Gothic writers when they think about the sublime and being awestruck by sort of humanity's insig insignificance at the face of geology as well. Um, and I'd like to finish there. Uh, that's a kind of brief outline of the sort of poetics that I'm dealing with, really. Uh, and finish with a poem, uh, which was one of the first poems I wrote as part of this residency, uh, which is called Through Filth. And in this, I'm going to take you through the caves of Dudley, through the caverns that are underneath the town. 
back to the Silurian era and into the industrial past as well. Through filth. Attend, descend with me mucker down below grounds of Pagnell's Priory, where I hid the Rizome Echo of Cluniac monks and their prayer, enkindled, inflamed, like our own smithy's scorched core to gem, sand to glass, dust to daggers, smelt by quicksilver fingers and nail mecking kins full of ken for our caverns. These caverns, descend with me mucker, descend down below renna roots and lime, where the cut chain links Nidhog, Yggdrasil, to corner shop, call centre, from chain coral helixing revelations to brackets, a battle, ghost ship, colony, empires of mivering and overing here, sending out canting wisps of caggy-headed scrappies older than god time, attend, moist ore moves in slow spit splitting femi, firm as fossil, cold as core, the ray of Svedberg of scuttles in here, just patient sediments with the brood of halcyte, silica shale, tracks of tabulite ordering roots for proto beings and proto action. Down here, when the stone and slick sand fertilizers for stealer, glass mecca, almost teen lad with armor, with chisel, with lens to spy crinoid ruins, insect set in geo nest, attend. Here rests the Dudley bug, Moloch. It's our slow burn municipal crest. Electra protects brave chests in protean soils and lets us swarm in Stercore in Veneta. Thank you very much. Happy National Poetry Day. Thank you for having me and enjoy the rest of your day. Cool. I think I'm starting. Cool. Hi, everyone. Sorry, awkward Zoom moment. Um, so I'm Jack Cooper. Um, if you end up liking my poetry, uh, you can find more on my Twitter, Jack Cooper 666. I'm not a devil worshipper. I was 14 when I set up the account. Um, so one of the things that I love about poetry is how it pushes you towards new topics, whether you're a reader or a writer. You think you've started to write a simple love poem, but an hour later you're in the depths of the internet discovering the intricacies of how rats swim, or at least that's what I was doing last night. Um, but without the Hugh Miller writing competition, I'd never have spent weeks immersed in Scotland's remarkable geological history and the life and work of its champion Hugh Miller who was a geologist and devout Christian, uh, exploring how the two informed each other in his book, The Testimony of the Rocks, which spoke to me as a lapsed Catholic and a current biologist, inspiring my poem. And Lara Reed was very kind enough to send me a first edition of The Testimony of the Rocks, which I'd just like to thank her for, because uh, that was incredible. So here is The Testimony of the Rocks. From a pew of sandstone and grey whack, I watched the tide fall from Sikar Point like a shallow breath from scarred lungs. Scotland, self-assembling cathedral, I love the rough-hewn altars you dragged out the sea floor. Like any man with an eye on the line and a smile caught on his mouth like a hook, the cliffs are at my back and eternity stretches ahead above, beneath. Today, I will worship whatever I find under the sky's soaring vault. I will sit with the stone and sand, listen to the waves and what little God I have left. Thank you very much.
Brilliant, Jack. Thank you. Um, hello, uh, my name's uh, Neil Hodgson. I, uh, surrounded by all of the uh, sort of geo poetry talent that we have on on the schedule today, I, I feel a bit like a, a child that's wandered onto the, or slightly overdressed child, I should say, um, wandered onto the stage at Glastonbury and and all of a sudden wondering quite quite why I'm, I'm here but I've got a five minute slot and I'm going to just read one poem called Time Tide uh, with a bit of a preamble so I'm going to share my screen right now um, so bear with me Right, classically, I've caught this up. I'm gonna do that again. Bear with me, sorry, sorry, right. Okay. That's fine, Bill. Right. Okay. I'm too sorry for that, for that pause. Um, so what I'm hoping. <laughs> Well, I, I've really messed that up. Anyway, oh, let's go through this. Uh, much to everyone's surprise, I've been a geologist now for about uh, 40 years. Um, I started my career running up um, ocean island volcanoes, looking for carbonatites. And then um, I joined the oil industry and I've been like a geo uh, journeyman for um, the rest of uh, for my career. Um, and I'm looking at the strangest geologists around the world. But what I'm interested in now is talking about uh, uh, soft rocks and structures, source rocks, seismic, uh, deep water fans, contrites, crustal architecture, and um, missed opportunities and what it takes to uh, force us to look back in, uh, in time together. Outcrops. Um, Cliff seismic lines are fuller of missing time than they are of captured moments, especially the high energy rocks, uh, sands in deltas and carbonates. There's so much rewalking that at any one moment, almost nothing is being preserved, even in the quiet uh, deep water deposition, orbital forcing changes sediment supply seasonally or over hundreds or thousands of years, um, leaving big gaps in time. And, Current scour the basin floors, removing sediments or at least stopping deposition. Uh, of course, the rack and ruin of um, inversion causing unconformities, again, eating huge quantities of time and, and may entirely remove the, the record of that time in the rock. Uh, so the continuous rock record, what, what does that even mean? Uh, if you have one piece of shale sat on top of another piece of shale, one clay flake, another clay flake. Is that one per second? Is that one per hour, one per year? What does it mean continuous? What you've actually done is collected an awful lot of missing time with little tiny moments um, that, that are recorded and, and they capture that moment in time. Um, around the world, in all of geology, there must be moments or seconds minutes perhaps perhaps lifetimes that are not represented anywhere on earth and locally most stories of tumbling fate and gravity that is geology are just not saved so every recorded moment every piece of rock is special it's perhaps the only record of an event or, or even the moment in the in, in the whole of the world's life uh, Carl Sagan said that uh, humanity's purpose was to witness the universe and the purpose of rocks is to tell the stories throughout time. 
So the purpose of the rocks that never get deposited, the missing time, what is that for? So I wanted to make some marks that uh, talked about the stories being memorized in the rock face, the struggles, the chance preservations. I, uh, I used a, an old medium, relief printing, which um, hopefully you can see on the shared slide or, or perhaps uh, perhaps not, perhaps in the materials that supplied with the, um, with the talk. Uh, so what, what I do is uh, I use um, lino printing to, to make an image of the rock face. So uh, let's look at the rock face at a single grain of sand. It's a, a, a single grain of sand that's stirred up by the passing fin of a plesiosaur and it settles to the seabed and it's captured and it records that single random moment in time. It becomes tied in time. Time tied. Time tied in tangle and twiggery bound to one story of a random moment frozen for empty eons to no witness. A deep memory in a silent library of strata until chance and torture reveals in mist wrapped dawn on crashing coast or endless peak the drama of that captured scene. And it's gone. Lost to time. Thank you very much. Hello, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Eamon Dolan. I'm speaking from Glossop in the sunny Peak District. I hope you can all hear me clearly. So I'm going to read uh, a very short poem. I wrote in uh, Syrian Desert back in 1992. So that was 28 years ago. Uh, so I'm going to show you a picture mosaic, um, some of the shots I took when I, when I was in Syria at the time. So just bear with me one second. I hope you can all see that. So I was working as a well site geologist. And the poem is just a, a play on words with some references to the locality and people. And essentially, it's about chasing oil, but always, not always finding it. And it's called Lines Written in the Vain Prospect of Wealth. Land is land, and Mother Earth does not forget the time when all was still. Her riches laid some eons past, could not escape the cast of eyes from Al Farat, and crews who drift among the sands of Tyam, the sands that Mother Earth had said were mine. But time was running out for this particular spot, the one that Al Farat had got. And when tooth bit dust, for so it must, like tooth and nail in Holy Grail, the search was on but not for long. The oil they come to find had another place in mind. And like a precious child who runs to mother with a cut, the Omar field was aptly put. And on returning to the fold, remember, all that glitters isn't gold. Thank you. Eamon, did you mean to share the pictures with us? Yes. Did you not do that or are you trying to change your mind or? No, I thought I was sharing it actually. Okay, do you want to bring them up? <sighs> yeah, there we are. Okay, apologize for that. Okay, I'll stop the share now, thank you. I'm sharing. Hello, my name's Rachel Tennant. I'm just going to get this on full screen. Um, 
I'm a landscape architect, artist and poet, and my work is a collaboration of all art forms, um, an exploration of landscape and people. I'm fascinated by the science of the earth, its geology, geography, the cultural heritage of landscape through language, place and memories, the tentative relationship of people to the land through ownership, use and displacement, as well as our perceptions of beauty, nature and wildness. I've got two poems to share today out of the Geopoetry pamphlet. And my first poem is about Easdale and the slate quarries. Roofing the world. Princess, countess, duchess, ladies, split along the cleavage of quartz and minerals. Sizes cut by nappers, trimmed, dressed and stacked, perfect despite crenulation. Tiny island innards dragged out for winnings from quarries descending deep below sea level where arthritic splitters crouched in pools behind a slim line rim. From mutated mudstone squeezed by an ocean's load, delivering silky dark indigo shale, rippled by iron pyrites, yet watertight when overlapped, shipped around the globe. A yearly peak of nine million, stilled when walls slumped and waters swamped workings, leaving a mole of loose slate, shifting on the shingle, flashing with its fool's gold. Thank you. And that's it with the artwork. Uh, my next poem, <coughs> excuse me, is about a sint. And the name may derive from an old Norse word, but there's also a legend that the name comes from a fight between the two brothers, Unt and Asunt, meaning man of peace and man of discord. The latter, having won the tussle, gave his name to the parish. And this is called Asunt. Hard to separate people from a knock and lock and landscape. Harsh facts of geology, history and a highland controversy. When thrusting egos were built on older rocks, heaved over younger. Glacial islands, Cunyac, Sullivan and Canisp, fractured and squeezed by howling desolation. People and earth scraped from the land through tenure and turbulence pooled with memories. Even your name means discord. And that's the poem with the artwork. So thank you very much for letting me share my poems with you today and uh, look forward to hearing the rest. Hello, I'm, my name is Brian Rosen and um, I come from a family which is not scientific, but is largely interested in languages, literature, and politics. And uh, somewhere a little bit of interest in poetry brushed off on me, although I went into science. And I <clears throat> work still in retirement at the Natural History Museum as an associate, when we're allowed in, of course, at the moment we're not. Um, I'm a geologist, firstly, and a marine biologist, secondly. I'm interested in the history of geology, and my special subject is corals and reefs, past and present. The two poems I'm going to read are both sort of autobiographical and indicate a part of me which is, as it were, left behind or influenced by quite a lot of time spent in Wales over my lifetime. So, for the first one is Here Be Dragons. Here be dragons, or so the old maps say, but Plutarch, respected, wise old ancient, just says bar, the only inhabitants there are poets and inventors of fables. My mother bought us the pebbles on the beach for a summer camp in Wales, a perfect little Knowlton Haven, for Clarence Ellis, unknowingly to unlock fables of our own from strange stripes, twirls and mottles, bands and speckles, white shelly bits imprisoned, jasper reds and serpent greens, smooth, wet, glinting gems flickering preciously in the western sun as the falling tide receded. 
beckoning us deeper into the crevices of our minds to conjure far thoughts, soaring into times and places on those pebbles, old, old maps. See now what started there. Without leaving Knowlton's horseshoe cove, we crossed the seas to rivers, swamps and lakes which left our own shores long ago, raging volcanoes choking distant lands from seething fiery cauldrons deep beneath, upheavals unimaginable, turning rocks to caramel and toffee, jam-packing muddy oozes into brittle slate for shingle beaches and roofs for all of Wales and the world beyond. For Seden, in his corner of old, old maps, his engraved cheeks puffed out in fury, driving waves and winds towards the prancing dragons in the other corner, while he hurls sand into tornadoes, roaring across the reds and ochres of desert desolations. Titans in another corner crumple rocks in their fists as mere wet rags, making of them ranks and crests of icy ranges. Noachian floods now receding, no doves in sight, and in the distance see there strange beasts, worthy of old fables, imprinting, sinking, the falling tides just leaving soft expanses of tempting soft diluvium as the beasts seek far haven, but failing, they bequeath instead their bones to collectors, TV shows, savants and curators. My father, beloved, or maybe not, by local librarians, for borrowing far too many books for far too long, appeared one day with Willie Lay's droll tales of tales of his dragons in amber, defying old Plutarch with fables unravelling riddles of ancient life, endless, timeless, ultimately inscrutable in worlds long gone. So much space and time collapsed like cosmology's black holes, but all into pebbles on a beach. I reflect a while beneath warm, clear waves and dare to swim with sharks in coral groves. The call of ancient worlds becomes my fate. Home from our voyages, our gems now lifeless, dry and dull, still in our young hands. Museum experts pronounce for us, reducing our stripes, twirls, shelly bits and speckles to learned polysyllables. But still to me, epic relics of tortuous journeys in continuum with one small Welsh beach still shaping all my years. Herein are my fables, just as Plutarch said, but my dragons in amber, so to speak, are real enough instead. And now, a uh, much shorter one called Voilcum Keruin, which is uh, the highest peak in the in Manath Proseli, the Proseli Mountains in Pembrokeshire, written a rather long time ago. I came in from the wind across the moors into a sullen eastern arc of frowning hillsides, still but for darting specks of wheat ears. Dark clouds overhead, racing gale shredded over three rock gashes and grey strewn slate. I entered the clefts by lurid ferns, scatters of yellowing fleece and soaking moss, and here's a low cave. I crouch and look to hear inside the hill the distant ring of dripping in a lost tunnel, echoing beyond the breath of Arthur's sleeping nights, deserted Wayland Wolf's Glen Smithy, forgotten Neolithic rites, to whispers of Welsh flannelled miners. I search for a hint of crystal, gangspar, blend or mine glance, something eye or elder irony to find what drew them in. It seems it was so rich they took every grain away. Or was this rocky passage just speculative, disconsolative, accumulative, slaty waste now hewn into silence, other than the first hiss of determined all night rain as darkening mist descends and drops of water yield my only glint. I, I just want to say that there's a slate theme I picked up without knowing it from Rachel's uh, poems just now. Um, anyway, I, I'm also supposed to announce that there's now a 10 minute break. Well, uh, yes, Brian, we'll come in because we've got a bit longer. We start again at 10.50, so we've got ourselves ahead. So, you know, it may be that we people want to have a little bit of discussion. The panelists could have a little bit of discussion or in the chat line. Um, and, and, you know, I'm, I'm absolutely moved by the the connection between the, you know, the, the place attachment that started with uh, Rob's talk, you know, this thing about place identity, and then, you know, to, to have you end up saying, you know, the Welsh beach shapes 
all the years, you know, so this place identity for you is obviously so strong. It is enormous. It's absolutely, I, I just love place. And I would say that I, one of the games I play to the amusement of most of my family is trying to identify places in pictures where there's no caption, you know, in advertisements and things like that. It's a sort of hobby thing to say, oh, that's obviously such and such a mountain in Wales or such and such a beach in wherever, you know. So it's something I enjoy doing. Yes, place, 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 very much. Location, 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 in fact. <laughs> Lovely. And we put a, in, in the chat, we put the reference to this Clarence Ellis book on pebbles. So for, for people that go to the coast and love beaches, it's a great place to start understanding what, where all the pebbles come from. Well, it's been re, I think it's been reissued. And um, I also think, um, Willie, but Willie Lay's book is much less well known and is well worth digging out for those people particularly interested in the history of paleontology. That's well, you could put that in the... Um, in the chat. So I don't know if anybody on the chat uh, wants to ask Brian something or any of the speakers from this morning. Uh, we enjoyed the images that Rachel and, and Neil showed us. Very much. Um, yes. It's very nice. Images and place go together so nicely. Mm. So uh, if that's not, then we'll, we'll, we'll close this opening session. Thank you for that, Brian. We'll close this opening session and we'll start again at uh, 10 to 11. I think that's the right time. So we've got time to go and get another coffee. <laughs> uh, and uh, thanks very much, everybody, this morning.
Stuart, Stuart Graham, if you want to uh, start sharing your video and bring up. So we, we're about ready to kick off again um, with Stuart Graham. Stuart, are you there? Hello, can you hear me? Yep, you're up. Good. Okay, so welcome back to Geo Poetry 2020 and the second session. Patrick, can you give me my screen back with all the faces on it? We can see Stuart. Um, at, at the minute, okay, well, no, that's fine, as long as you can see me. Okay, so thank you very much. Scotland's geology poems, Lewisian, Moyne, and Permian. Hello, I'm Stuart Graham, and I have evolved from a geologist to become an environmentalist and a recreational poet. I work for the government's environmental agency, Nature Scott, previously known as Scottish Natural Heritage until just a few weeks ago. And I have helped deliver the conservation of nature and landscapes, including geology. Today, I am not going to be presenting a scientific paper, you'll be pleased to hear, but I am going to talk about three of my geological poems and cover my inspiration and drive to write them. The writing of poetry and artistic language is not the norm for a civil servant like myself. Indeed, the use of complex geological words or phrases in poetry is not something that many readers of poetry are going to be familiar with either. What drives me to write geological poetry quite apart from the fact that I enjoy doing so, is that I want the wider public to understand and value our geology. If they do that, then they will help support us in our efforts to conserve some fantastic sites, both for scientific study 
but also for the pure sheer enjoyment of the geological marvels that they contain. And this is something that all of us here today can play our part in through our geological poetry. I have had professional involvement in geological interpretation in my work with Nature Scott. And so I understand how hard it is to write brief, accurate, accessible text about geology. I'm sometimes asked to help people who are pulling together interpretation about the countryside. And they tend to know all about wildlife and all about farming, and they cover that really well. But when they come to the geology, they seem to get in a real muddle, and that really detracts from all the other good work that they've done. So part of my role is to help them rewrite and reinterpret the geology sections, and get them accurate. In the end of the day, it's hard to get that right. And you need to know your audience and the level of geological knowledge that they might have. If we water down a message too much, it can become meaningless. The public attention span is limited, so they won't read a lot of text, and nor do they like a lot of unfamiliar terminology. Yes, diagrams and pictures will help a lot, but it's going to be hard to get the text right and still capture the attention. However, we're very fortunate in that the ideas that we're trying to get across are almost magical in the variety, whether it's massive timescales involved, continental drift, dinosaurs, glaciation. And the modern day relevance of that is easy to see with global warming, extinctions and volcanoes all regularly making the news. So I'm getting interested now in how poetry can help solve this interpretation conundrum. Poetry allows that artistic element to be introduced, which permits more reflection and lateral thinking. This can help capture the imagination and help get potentially complex messages across in a more easily digestible form. It can also allow the introduction of humour. The three short pieces that I've picked for today were written initially for my own interest rather than for use in interpretation. So they certainly work best when presented to a geological, geologically knowledgeable audience, which of course we have today, thankfully. The first two describe the field area for my PhD research, and the final one reflects the geology where I currently live and work in the south of Scotland. Indeed, returning <laughs> to my, my research field area, after a 25 year absence that inspired me to start writing about geology in verse rather than scientifically. And I suspect the copy of Norman McCaig's Poems on Ascent, which I happened to have with me at the time, also had an influence on in me. Personally, I think my poetry is more accessible than scientific texts I've written about geology, but I'll let you be the judge of that. The first poem is Old Boy. Old Boy is a name that the geological survey geologists of the 19th century used to refer to the Lucian Nice. The reason for that was that the Lucian Nice are the oldest rocks in Scotland, and indeed amongst the oldest rocks in Europe. They have a very complicated history. Three of the geologists who helped unravel the mysteries of this Lucian Nice and the wider Northwest Highlands in general are Ben Peach, John Horn, and Charles Clough. And this short poem is in part my tribute to them. Now the screen that I have at the minute doesn't allow me to share the poems so what it I'll should do, do. If, you, if you go to the bottom, it should do. You should be able to bring up the scroll bar if you go to the bottom of your screen, don't you? It's been there all the way through until the break and it's vanished now. Hmm, the mysteries of... Why not just read the poems then? Yeah, I'm happy to, to read them out. It'd be better if they were in front of people, but I'll, I'll just go through them anyway. So, old boy. Older than life 
the ancient dark whale of Europe surfaces. His back, just visible. Many have tried to remould him, rework him. All have failed. Time means nothing to him. He has it on his side. He absorbs all comers, dike or meteorite. All get treated with the same indifference. You are the foundation on which great things lie. Sliced and sliced and stacked. Still the same expression. The sheer doubt, deadpan, gives nothing away. Peach, horn and cloth. Tough in tweed. Unraveled your mysteries, old boy. Gave you your name. During my PhD, I studied both the Lyceum Knights mentioned in the last poem and also the Moine. The Moine are a group of pre Cambrian, so that's pre life rocks that underlie most of the Northwest Highlands. There are rather repetitive sedimentary sequence of sands and months. And the Moine was originally deposited on top of Old Boy in the first poem, and it was then folded and pushed along the neighbour Moine thrusts to rest on top of younger fossiliferous Cambrian rocks to the west around Durnex. The Moine take their name from a, a rather featureless bog, a Voin bog, which can be found on the north coast of Scotland between John O'Groats and Cape Ra. And ironically, there's no rocks in the Moyne bog, and its only notable feature that I could observe was a ruined house called Moyne House, and it's perched at the highest point in the road, where the road crosses the bog. This is the second poem. Moyne. Like the Moyne House with his empty windows that gaze emotionless through time's oblivion across a no man's land that slopes precariously down to Europe's torn edge. The featureless moor of his name defines isolated abandonment. Not always so for our host, the Moyne. Proudly centre stage for the Baltical or Insha bonding, his half grabbing, welcoming all comers, salt or fresh, in thickening sequences of lifeless monotony. Intoxicated, you sang your increasingly contorted tune to the squeeze box of Noidartian extension and Caledonian compression before you were punched with plutons and slid out of control along neighbour and mine to nap cool off, then gaze uncomprehendingly towards America and erupting life. Where I now live in Dumfriesshire, uh, at the southern end of Scotland, or in this dale, there's a Permian basin infilled with desert sands, which were frequented on occasions at least by dinosaurs. And this basin was infilled from the surrounding older rocks which were in their day, the muds that were deposited in the Iapetus suture or ocean that lay between Scotland and England, and also the granites that had been injected into them. So this final poem interprets my local geology. The sands of time still running. Mountains race to fill the void of Nistale's yawning chasm. The hourglass of eternity empties its belly of sand, crystal granite and ocean mud. Ancient fire and water, fragmented hostages of an Iapetus suture, lie wrapped in the blanket of dry sand of long sleep. Roll and slide the grains arrive the conveyor belt of dunes to Permian horizons they never reach. A drifting monotony in heat, relieved by lamenting thunderstorms, still too early for desert blooms. A rose diagram in stone, 
relict of uncertain winds, unleashed to bury retreating dinosaur footprints in semi permanent oblivion. Until now, as we expose, we're forced to gaze back at a world no longer in the tropics, and feel the weight of frosty reception from the recently retreated ice cap. I'm afraid that my sands of time have now run out. Thank you for listening. Chris, are you there? You were uh, came in. Yeah, yes, yes, you. I'm here. Um, so I can't seem to turn my video on. Um. Yeah, okay, that seems to be there now. So, hi, I'm Chris Jack. I'm an engineering geologist. I work for a Danish engineering consultancy called Covey. So, I'm often traveling around um, looking at tunneling projects and various other engineering projects on the surface. Um, one such project a few years ago was on Ardrecchi Estate, which some people might be familiar with from Monarch of the Glen. And the estate was looking at uh, putting in a small hydroelectric scheme, which has now been constructed. And as part of that, I mapped a small glacial gorge in Dalradian rocks over a period of a couple of days. But unfortunately, I forgot my midgy net, and this was in August. And so I spent a couple of days in a very beautiful set in a, being consumed um, by midges. And it was quite a traumatic experience, and it's, it's, it was almost uh, transcendental in some ways. I kind of felt like I was going to have some sort of out-of-body experience at one point. And I think that, I don't know if that was just because of the midges or because of some side effect of the midge spray, but ever since then I've had some sort of version of this poem floating around my head and I, I took the opportunity to write it up when I saw this event coming up. So the poem's called Aeon of Ardvreki and it goes, standing in the river gouged gorge, observing, mapping, eaten by midges, amongst time smashed ocean, samites and schists, I am suddenly transported to the inky depths of Iapetus. Einstein said time is an illusion. Am I there and here, so close, tangible, that I could swim? Then an evil midgy bite, and I am back by the river. And that's me, thanks. Okay, so over to Andrew. Hello. Um, firstly, thanks to everyone for reading their poems so far. It's been very good. Um, I'm Andrew Millam, 20 years old, um, going into my final year of an environmental science degree, but chiefly a geologist. I love geology since A-level. And my poem today is about Aaron, the Isle of Arran in Scotland. Um, as most of you know, it's often called Scotland in miniature because of the mixture of lowland and highland areas and the range of geology. It's like a microcosm of Scotland. Um, so I had to write it down when I saw this event coming up. Um, and here it is, here's the first one. It's called The Soil Meets the Substrate. So. The soil meets the substrate where the tertiary dikes once swarmed and when Aaron's heated igneous past 
created an uneven and deformed rocky surface. Heat once ruled this Scottish isle with Devonian desert fury. Fanglomerates lie imbricated and stained, a hematitic mark in the geological story that continues. Old red sandstone is weathered now in honeycomb patterns with salt from the Clyde, from windy days when the air is strong enough to carry it. The granitic heights of Goatfell are less affected by the time, erosion, transportation, the peaks in energy and declines. On Brodick's shore, look up and see the lilac water-colored sky. Look down, tip your hat to the banded nice beneath this geologist's paradise. Um, that's the first poem. Um, and I went to Aaron first when I was very young and obviously couldn't read the geology at all. Um, but then when I went back there for A-level geology field work, I could start to read the geology and had a completely different take on the landscape. And the knowledge of geology added a complete another level to Aaron for me. And I think once you've got that geological knowledge, you can look at the world completely differently. Um, yeah, and I just love it. I, I was lucky enough to get, because uh, I write nature articles for various magazines, and I got uh, an article about the Isle of Arran's geology in Scotland magazine in the uh, July, August issue. Um, yeah, the, my final poems, uh, a more general one about geology in general. So here it goes. It's called The Geologist. It was deep winter when I left. Now the early strains of sun warm new and confused buds in this late February glade, displaying new colors, colors forgotten and kept safe in nature's attic for months, now brimming the horizon like a beacon. Colors calling back to red Devonian, green and jet black coal carboniferous, ice white quaternary to now, tying us into an ongoing story of seasons, colour and change. Thank you very much. That's all for me. Thank you. Hello. Uh, <clears throat> I hope everybody can see me. I'm Gordon Peters. Uh, very glad. Very you can glad see. I remember the first geo poetry almost a decade ago, and it's great to have moved on and see all these people and hear everything this morning. I'm speaking from uh, Alexandra Palace in North London, with which I have a 50 year relationship almost, but I'm gonna be talking about a Scottish hill. I'm a retired social service director and health and social development consultant. I grew up in the edge of Galloway, uh, and ever since being a geography and geology student in Edinburgh in the 60s, which makes me a bit of a transdisciplinarian, I think, I've had an almost magnetic pull towards a wheel of a hill which shapes and blends the middle Clyde landscape. And I'm going to try and share that now. Uh, and that's called Tinto Hill, which is an outstanding volcanic remnant in the southern edge of the central belt of Scotland. Um, although my working life's been about the social ecology of uh, looking after people, particularly social care, it's the personal relationship to a land in the sense of being for me, the place identity, which can't be separated. And that's the nub of this eulogy, a bit in the manner of Norman McCaig, a great favorite of mine, but about a much softer landscape. In conversation with Tinto Hill. Well misted for now, you don't just catch the eye from all around. Your feldspar slopes give the Clyde its elbow. You cause the very weather to spiral round. For years, these roads I drove were made of your pink stone and grit. Or a nearby sister, was it? Volcanic, volcanic outreach, now supporting lambs and a quiet river heading for a fall. Our time upsets the way of looking, 
But what's a few million between friends? And your dark patches so meld that tinted glow. You seem to be having a whale of a time, old Tinto, though I'm the one who's spouting. Yours is the making of this whole landscape, while we search for molecules of meaning, abstracted. I shall go for atoms of delight, sensing your neutrinos of granitic nourishment, a Clyde cider returning to dust while still alive. That's the point, you might say. Light and dark matter enfolds us. I am the one who's speaking. You are the one unfolding. Helping me to unlearn, for civilizations don't climb hills. Although drovers were known to go over your top, and cairns suggest your advantage. Standing here on your edge, watching a bullfinch and broken bark beneath the mountain, inhaling the foost of last year's beach and this year's lichen, while the stumps and moss expunge sure footing. For me, walking on dead twigs and pine needle talus is a windy undertaking. But you guide clouds on their way and dwarf the man-made windbreaks. The sway of the pine poles and the call of the nuthatch come now. Then I think of a trillion jewels of heat and bombs that you once vented and wonder, where do atoms go? One gust of wind brings a million microspores of ancestors you must have known. Which brings us back to the present matter. Hi. It means we don't know mostly, say experts of the dark. And thinking, now exactly what is that? Thank you. Off you go, John. You're on. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is John Boland. Um, these days, I'm a writer and artist based, um, well, I'm speaking to you from Forg in Aberdeenshire, but it's been lovely to hear evocations of places like Arran and Assent over the, over the course of this morning. Um, I have connection with a lot of place, I think. Thanks very much to the organisers for this opportunity to share some of my work. This presentation, um, in fact, blends elements of two ongoing projects, Pibroch and a collection of couplets uh, with a working title, Blood Times. Hmm? Pibroch arose out of an interest in how we effectively engage individuals, especially former rural workers like myself, with climate activism and action. Uh, the works evolved from a textual analysis of climate-related texts such as IPCC IPCC reports, scientific papers and um, testimonials, testimony formal and less formal from the Piper Alpha disaster inquiry. Um, and we, you'll see an example of one of those analyses in the course of the presentation. It became clear to me working through those texts, however, that, you know, everything in a sense is a geological process. You know, the idea of the Anthropocene has finally dismantled the human nature dichotomy that I feel we've all grown up with. And I was also very struck as I was doing that work on how time is handled in the various uh, documents and discourses and their impacts on conversations about climate emergency. Um, deep time tends to encourage a fatalistic optimism. You know, at the end of the day, we're all just a thin black line in the cliff, which kind of echoes, I think, some of the things Neil Hodgson was saying earlier. Whereas political time encourages despair, we're either too late too early or it'll take too long. But time's not absolute, you know, at the level of quantum gravity, it is not a fundamental absolute variable. It only has significance with respect to the second law of thermodynamics. So this tension inspired, if you like, the second strand, strand blood times. Um, so there is a set of inter intermingled couplets, which I won't, which won't be read and then a set of, of the poem pieces from, from people. The promise takes about 30 minutes, so I'll shut up now and hope uh, the work itself provokes your interest and reflection. Uh, Becky, could you run for us, please?
I watch the forecast. That is what I do. As if in need of telling that it hasn't rained in weeks, the cellar's full of water, the garden's silent and the cats are gone. Forecasters blur the truth in facts. In logs and axes, earnest men in day-glow life preservers seeking firm ground as they tread deep water, never daring to swim. Not yet. They phrase the flood as food insecurity or loss of ecological services, burden of disease or economic risk, quantifying the bloody obvious, ignoring the soon-to-be-extinct elephants in the room, anthropogenic forcing, indigenous knowledge, sacrifice zones. They calibrate catastrophe with varying degrees of confidence in years and decades, centuries with margins for error and long tail effects, framed for the purposes of governance in the capitalist hoax of obje objective time, whilst we thrive and suffer in moments, seasons, generations, lifetimes, cultures, never calling this thing out for what it is, this thing that's happening now. This thing that is our fault, a thing, a fault that's happening, only that. I watch the forecast. That is what I do. They said they smelled the smoke while coming up the... And then we saw the flames. It was dark by then. The tenement stood right up on the ridge. Great views from their top floor flat. Enviable. All that light. And the air when the neighbours only got the windies opposite. Safe as houses. That's still what they say. And the eldest was in with them. He was nine. And they said the lights were off. And the three of them were sleeping when they left. And this new natural gas is safer than the gas they had before. And they said it was only for the one. And the other thing, the Conroy's turning up, was unforeseen. And they said, you don't know how steep that brie is until you have to run. And they said the fire engines didn't come till later. And of course, they hoped it was the close next door. And they said the eldest boy could reach the snack if he stood up on a chair. And she should have turned the gas off and he should have called it a night. And you'd think someone would notice and do something, raise the alarm. And I know I could have been different. And you know you shouldn't have done it. And we know we should have, could have, should. That's what it'll be like. We listen to the news, it's what we do. This chunked up sense embedded in white noise, crash bang clatter of catastrophe, bottles thrown off the stair heat in a wally close. In an average year, infernos erupt as havocs wreaked, violence rips through crises of biblical proportions riven by the force of more and more and always more chasing the dragon of the worst the biggest ever record-breaking costliest unprecedented in an average year destructive power is blinding cast tragic shadow as if a bomb went off in a children's ward and new targets are set. 
for laser guided ordnance whilst looting begins amid scenes of devastation and human tragedy. In an average year, currencies collapse, prices double, electricity and bandwidth are cut off, much needed food and water is everywhere and nowhere to be found. Unrelenting misery, heaped upon misery. Stunning to look at. In an average year, tributes will be paid to those who stood no chance, who'd long since learned to fear as hope began to fade, pushed to the brink, defending homes, to rubble, fences will be built, more soldiers sent, ensuring an escape. Dad is wearing a survival suit. He must know. He does not have a radio. He does not ask to use the public address system. He leaves for his private bunker without giving further instructions. Dad takes no initiative in an attempt to save life. Perhaps not even his own. All Dad says is evidence, work control, module, alarm. Five minutes later he comes running back in a state of panic. Surely by then he knew. After that there was confusion, delirium, commotion, heckling. Dad slumps down trying to keep everyone saying, the whole world knows we're having problems. So he knew. He does not seem to be able to come up with any answers. No one takes charge. At this point, Dad says, attribution, adaptation, mitigation pathways, governance systems, scenarios. The personnel, the boys and girls, the women and men, the mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, sons and daughters wait in the mess. Some of them will decide they have to find a way out. Some will wait in hope of rescue. Some will leave because there's no point staying. Some will stay because they have been told to wait. Some take the view that they have nothing to lose. Some simply don't know what else to do. But all Dad says is, Private finance, sustainable option, industrial sequestration, future equilibrium, ecosystem services, weather security, human investment, indicator, billions, the fuck, the fuck, the fuck! There is no systematic attempt to lead us to a means of escape. A large number make no attempt to leave. The risk of death is considerable. Those who remain in expectation or obedience will succumb to the effects of smoke and gas. That's what happened last time. Dad will never mention 
fears melting, engulfing guilt, drowning nightmares, loss, compulsion, mates, distress, grief, starving, mum, shouting rape, addiction, exile, prison, rescue, youngest, grandchild, remorse, loneliness, denial, incarceration, pain, Anyway, in the worst case scenario, the brief but brilliant atmospheric transit of the asteroid will not be seen. Nothing will hurt or disappoint. The shock wave when the magma chamber bursts will not be felt. Nothing will be funny and nothing will be sad. The rumble of the tsunami will not be heard. Nothing will be loved or laughed about. The ash and sulphur in the air will not be tasted. Nothing will be... Nothing will be true. The stench of corruption will not be... Nothing will be mysterious or awesome. Nothing will be known. Till it is again. That almost needs a minute of reflection before we kick off with Doug. Very moving, John. Thank you. Off you go then. Yeah, please go ahead then, Doug. Yeah, I'm ready to go. You're on your off you go then. Thank you, John. Uh, that's a hard act to follow. Good morning, everyone. I'm Doug McDougall. I'm a geochemist based in Edinburgh and a writer. Um, I'm going to read a poem in a moment, moment, but before I start, I'd like to give you a little bit of background because I think the genesis of this poem is perhaps a little unusual. The poem is called Mountains in Portobello. Portobello as many of you know, the Portobello in the title at least, is a small seaside community in the north of Edinburgh. It has a very nice beach, very popular beach, but it doesn't have any mountains. Um, I've called the poem Mountains in Portobello. So why did I do that? Well, a little over a year ago, in June of 2019, a group of people gathered on Portobello Beach and made their own mountains 
small mountains made of sand. And I'm just going to share the screen now to show you some images of that day. This is a picture of the group that gathered on Portobello Beach to make mountains out of sand. Th this event was the brainchild of Scottish artist Katie P Patterson. And she designed and made precise scale models of five of the world's mountains. Kilimanjaro, Shasta, Stromboli, Fuji, and Uluru. And she molded them into sets of nesting sand buckets. <clears throat> and the public were invited to use these buckets to cast their own miniature mountains. Uh, and this actually happened not only at Portobello, but actually at 25 different locations around the coast of the UK during the span of British summertime in 2019. So that was roughly between the end of March and the beginning of November. Every weekend or two, people were making sand mountains like these on a beach. Each of these events was coordinated through a local art gallery, the one at Portobello was in partnership with Edinburgh's Fruit Market Gallery. And Katie timed these events so that towards the end of each one, the tide would come in and wash the sand mountains away. Uh, so this experience was meant to encourage people to think about time, about mountains, about sand, about the transitory nature of landscape and much more. And of course, also to have some fun at the beach. Katie called her project, First There is a Mountain. And she asked writers and scientists to prepare short texts to be read out at each one of these events. As a kind of reflection on the project, on the location, uh, uh, and on the, on, on the day itself. She asked if I could do that at Portobello and she gave us no real constraints. Uh, she didn't tell us whether to, we should write prose or poetry. And although I don't really consider myself to be a poet, my immediate thought was that really the appropriate thing for this uh, as a response to this project would be a poem. So here it is, uh, my poem called Mountains in Porto Portobello, a site specific poem. And I've, uh, I, I'll show some images of the day uh, to add a little bit of context. <clears throat> Mountains in Portobello, who would have thought that these small peaks, precise to scale, would grace this beach? This beach once trod by smugglers, Victorian ladies, Walter Scott, and George IV in his military finery, Fuji, Shasta, Uluru, Stromboli, Kilimanjaro. What is it about mountains that so beguiles us? Cathedrals of rock reaching for the sky, beckoning us to climb their summits for the sheer joy of pitting ourselves against a worthy adversary, or maybe just for the view. Fuji a postcard perfect cone, a holy mountain, part of the volcanic ring of fire that rims the great Pacific where ocean crust dives deep below the surface until the planet's heat turns it to magma. Across the wide Pacific Shasta, a ring of fire California cousin stands proud and sacred too. The tribes who lived in her shadow said she was inhabited by spirits. John Muir, that son of Dunbar, who began his life not far from here, nearly ended it on her peak until he found a hot spring near the summit to shelter him from a raging blizzard. Fiery Stromboli, rising from the sea, her lava fountains guiding wayward sailors like a lighthouse. She too was born of plate tectonics, of Africa sliding under Europe until again internal heat turned solid stone to liquid lava. 
and in Africa famed Kilimanjaro, a different kind of volcano, hot plume from deep within the earth rising up, splitting apart a continent, pushing the famous peak up to the clouds, her summit dusted with snow. Finally, Uluru, smallest of our five, looming red above the desert, this mountain no volcano, just a block of sandstone, grains of quartz and feldspar cemented, tilted up toward the sky. And here in Portobello are tiny seaside mountains shaped by human hands, no plate tectonics required, are also made of sand. Sand from other mountains, distant in time, in space. Mountains forged in fire, raised high. They had their fleeting moments in the sun before they too were worn away until no trace remained except this sand. Quartz, feldspar, mica, zircon, Minute grains winnowed by tropical rivers, scooped up by roving glaciers, piled here by North Sea waves, piled up again by us. One man who walked this beach in centuries past, a man who some say is the one who found time, once wrote, thinking of sand and mountains and time, that there is no vestige of a beginning, no prospect of an end. I think about his insight as we gather here to watch our mountains rise and fall, leaving nothing behind. A speeded up geological cycle that Mr. Hutton would appreciate. Time stretched, time shortened. Four billion years and more have shaped this earth so far. More billions still to come. What will they bring? More mountains, to be sure. More grains of sand cracked from their rocky peaks and carried to some future sea. A, a future sea not one of us will know. A sea with shorelines, inlets, headlands, cliffs, and beaches just like this one. But so far away in time that our imaginations fail we cannot even comprehend their presence. What feet will walk those beaches? What creatures dig their sand? What tides will wash them? What storms will roil their quiet shores? We cannot know, but here on this beach, we need no future guessing. We know the rising tide will swirl around our small sandy mountains until they slowly tilt and crumble, dissolve into the flat, monotonous shore, gone in a geological instant. Tomorrow, who will know that these miniature mountains ever existed here? Perhaps our memories will recall how we shaped a Fuji or a Shasta, and maybe a grain of quartz or two will remember vaguely how on its 400 millionth birthday, it somehow found itself a part of something strange and wonderful, a mountain on a beach. Thank you. That's me done then. Thanks, we're just waiting for Phil Ringrose to come in, I believe. Very powerful. Phil, if you're out there, it's over to you. Um, you were on the chat earlier on, so. <clears throat> 
not quite joining us. Does anybody want to come online and chat? <clears throat> So, uh, Doug, uh, are these writings all available, uh, inspired by this? You know, what a great way to engage young people um, in, in what's going on. And, well, it's uh, Katie Patterson, uh, the artist who devised that project, uh, has a website about the project and all the writings, all 25 of them from various people around the UK are on that website, along with uh, images from the different uh, days that she, uh, that she carried out that project. Yeah, okay, I see Phil's got a trouble having a, a link there. I don't know uh, if we can sort that out because you were in Phil, but I think you clicked on the wrong link. You, you should have a panelist link from Lecture Theatre. So uh, I think um, uh, Phil's PowerPoint is going to be put up by Becky, I suspect. Uh, Phil, are you able to talk, even if we can't see you? So Phil, your, your PowerPoint is coming up. So, uh, yes, uh, Phil, what should we do? Uh, should we um, move on to the, to the next speaker, if Michael is available, perhaps, uh, while we try and get you connected and come back to you? Thanks for the link for the previous work coming through on the chat line. So, uh, Becky, if you stop sharing, maybe we go to um, Michael, if you're out there. Michael Davenport. Or Gareth. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you, Phil. Can you hear me? It's Michael here. Oh, right. Sorry, Michael. Yes, we can hear you. Yes, we can't see you, Michael, but we can You're hear you. Press start video then. Yeah, start video. You can't start your video because the host has stopped it. Uh, Becky, you need to let uh, Michael start his video. I've got a line across start video. Click that. I know, again. but you, cl you click on it and it, uh, yeah. You can't start your video because the host has stopped it, it says. Yeah, okay. Can you read it, your poems? I don't really want to read them without the, the pictures and things and just spoil the whole thing. Um, I, I can maybe share my screen with your text. Uh, we seem I, to want to share some, I want to share some photographs and also yeah, no, okay. bring the poem up on the screen. Yeah, Otherwise, that's... it's pretty boring. Yeah, no, that's the idea. So, Becky, can you uh, uh, allow uh, Michael to talk? I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, I can talk, but I, I want to see my your host has actually you start your video. Start my video. Okay, I'll start it. Yeah, there you are. Over to you. Can you see me? Can everybody see me now? Hello? Yes, yes, we can definitely see you. Right. Hello, everybody. I'm Michael Davenport. I started writing poems often about science and scientists when I retired from high school science teaching about 20 years ago. The poem I'm going to read came out of a geological trip to the Colorado Plateau in the western USA. The, Im the images are from Dinosaur Quarry Utah. Now I'd like to share some images with you, so I'll press share screen. And I'll try and bring up the try and bring up the images. Uh, 
that's them. You see the images? Uh, yes, uh, uh, they, I can't see them quite yet. So have you clicked on the share screen and the share image? There's two bits you have to click on. Oh, don't share. Yes, that's working now, Michael. That's right. So you've got yours. I'll do a slide share, I think. Yeah, that's the way. And then you're, you're free to go. Put it on slideshow. I'm pressing on it, not getting slideshow, unfortunately. No, yeah. you go to the slideshow at the top. I can see where your mouse is. You're on the first slide. So go to slideshow on the top. Slideshow on the top. Slides. Or sli oh, no, slideshow. Yeah, slideshow. Go to slideshow on the top. Slideshow, I've got it, yeah. yeah you got it there. And then I've press, got it. press on got it. it. You got to cancel that, yeah, your percentage. We, uh, Patrick Geddes says, learning by doing. So I said to somebody today, we're all learning by doing. So click on the slideshow. Yeah, that's it. You got it. I've got it now, yeah. Thank goodness. No, you're good to go. Good to go, right, fine. Right. This is dinosaur called Uta in the USA, and this gives some sense of perspective to the, the small girl there. This was taken about 18 years ago. Now we'll go to the next one. The next one is a particularly fortunate coincidence. Um, I was just photographing this skeptical looking Stegosaurus when this, lo and behold, this creation science seminars and sermons bus drew up giving an alternative version of what was happening in Dinosaur Quarry. So I was particularly pleased to take this photograph. And after visiting and looking at these photographs, I made up this particular poem. Dinosaur Quarry Utah. A tiny girl is photographed, juxtaposed with spine of Stegosaurus. It's like a template made by titans. Bending, I feel my own like vertebrae. A minibus trails dust, draws up. CreationScience.com offers seminars and sermons. A woman in a floral dress steps out, says with certainty, serenity, they all came down in Noah's flood. She then expatiates upon her fault and grace, claims our connection is to angels, not to reptiles, apes. I think of what I'll never say to her, that I prefer pterosaurs to angels. How in heaven or on earth do bones of angel wings connect with angel vertebrae? Her explanations do not fit. It's not just this cliff, these mountains of hard evidence. I can feel it, feel it in my bones. That's it. Very That's nice it. picture of the dinosaur bone. So I think everybody I'll feels... Press, I'll press stop share. Yeah, stop share, press stop share at the top. Yeah, thanks That's very it. much, Michael. That's it now, yeah. Is that okay? Absolutely. So over to you, Phil, because I think you're ready to join us now. Yeah, do you hear me now? Perfectly. Ah, I, I had a technical mistake there. I would signed on as an attendee rather than as a panelist. So apologies for that. <laughs> um, do you see my video? Yeah, we can see your video. See you loud and clear from Norway, okay. I guess. That's great. I, I'm, yeah, Phil Ringrose. I'm, um, I'm also going to share my screen. Um, so uh, I'm a geologist originally from Edinburgh, now living in Trondheim, Norway. Um, and what I wanted to do was uh, take you a little bit into outer space. So let me just check that this is going to work. Um, should see the whole screen. Do you see the screen now? Um, great. Well, I'll just plow on then if there's no yes, complaints. It's great. It's great. Thank you, Patrick. Um, yeah, I, I was conscious I was following uh, Doug McDougall on the sands of Portobello Beach in the mountains. 
And I thought that was a, a lovely poem. And so just thinking about that connection, um, but also all the poems you've heard today about the geology of our earth, I'm going to try and get us all to look at the earth from outer space. We live on a rock after all. And this image here is of the Parthenon. And my last poem is going to think a little bit about Greek civilization um, and our civilization. Um, but above the Parthenon, if you just look in the top corner, you can see the moon, our natural satellite. But we also have lots of other satellites buzzing around our planet, which I'll talk about in my, my second poem. So, uh, and by the way, these poems, if you wanted to see them again or read them later, they're on my uh, poetry website, poetpip.org. Um, so my first poem, this is a true story, which I've tried to capture in some poetic stanzas. And you might think poems about aliens would be uh, hardly realistic, <laughs> but there's a bit of a mystery in this poem. So I'll read it first and maybe see if you can guess the mystery. But this is the story of the first alien to arrive on planet Earth. Phil, can you put it into full screen mode, I think? It's a good idea. Um, let's go here. Uh -huh. Hmm. Just go back again. End slideshow. Slideshow once more time. No better? There we go. The first alien. In preparing for arrival on planet Earth, the first alien skimmed the top of the atmosphere at an altitude of 170 kilometers and prepared for rotation and entry. The autopilot aligned the spacecraft for retroburn, but unfortunately, the support module failed to separate from the main craft, a spherical capsule about two meters wide. After a series of rapid gyrations, the two modules eventually separated over North Africa and a correct Earth entry alignment was achieved. Descending into the Earth's ever thickening atmosphere caused the craft to decelerate with a force of about 8G, but somehow the alien managed to remain conscious. Then at about 7,000 meters from the Earth's surface, the hatch of the space calf was released and the creature ejected by deploying a parachute. About 10 minutes later, the alien landed at 11.05 hours at a point about 26 km southwest of Engels, a town in the Saratov region of the Volga in Russia. The first people to meet this visitor from outer space were a farmer and his daughter. And not surprisingly, they were rather astonished and somewhat alarmed. The girl explained, exclaimed, can it be that you've come from outer space? To which the alien replied, which calmed the girl as she also understood Russian. He went on to explain that he had indeed traveled from outer space, but needed to find a telephone to call Moscow. And if you haven't worked out the riddle to the puzzle, it was an account of Yuri Gagarin's first arrival onto the Earth from outer space as the first cosmonaut. And perhaps in our Western society, those of you that come from the Western society, we underestimate the significance of his achievement because it was during the Cold War. But I think it's a great story, Yuri Gagarin. And it makes us think a little bit about, you know, where we live and the fact that we've never managed to get to outer space before the now 1960s. But if you think about to the now, the next poem called Offshore Newfoundland is inspired by an earthenaut, um, an event that happened last year. And the earthenaut is actually Greta Thunberg, somebody who's totally occupied with planet Earth um, and has been quite a 
champion in the last year or two for climate change and changing human behavior. And the reason I've called it Offshore Newfoundland is that what happened is that I was in an airship, an airliner. I was using Wi-Fi, so a very modern invention. And I was receiving a video text diary from Greta Thunberg's boat, Mazilla 2, as she was sailing across the Atlantic past Newfoundland to get to New York for the climate summit. Now, she refused to fly because of her campaign against greenhouse gas emissions. So she took a renewable powered boat across the ocean. And it was a fascinating event happening. And it also made me think about satellites, communication, and what we're doing on planet Earth. And I suspect that there's a couple of friends from Newfoundland listening to this poem. So I hope I hope they appreciate it too. So my second poem, Offshore Newfoundland. Using Wi-Fi in the sky, a twinkle in my eye sparkles with amazement and joy as I watch Greta's latest video diary, broadcast from her yacht while sailing in a gale, offshore Newfoundland. I was texting my bro and my daughter about her show, also sparkling with amazement and joy, and making plans for the weekend and the days ahead, broadcasting from an airliner cruising at altitude, offshore beachyhead. Not many of us appreciate that we third millennial apes depend so heavily on 2,000 orbiting satellites, sparkling in the sky, sending and receiving positions, coded trains of data, and sensing the Earth from geostationary orbits. I tell my students and some other reluctant astronauts, sparkling with amazement and joy, that modern human civilization would not be possible without space technology especially the GPS sats spinning in medium Earth orbits. And yet these orbiting jewels are bearers of bad news, sparkling with doom and gloom. We are rapidly destroying our habitat, burning forests and fuels, contaminating and destroying the Earth's biosphere, atmosphere, hydrosphere, and geosphere. But all eyes are on their devices. All eyes are saying, look at me bringing a little sparkle, amazement, and joy to the here and now. But our future depends on using our eyes in the sky. Saying, looking at you, since these could bring sparkle, amazement, and joy back to the future. You know the saying, the eyes have it? Well, indeed they do. It's a more a question of which eyes have it, the eyes on the ground or the eyes up there, Wi-Fi, or iFi. Hope you enjoyed that one. Um, and then to round off my trilogy of the Earth from Outer Space, I want to finish off with uh, a poem which I call The Bubble, which I wrote a while back. It's actually a shape poem in the shape of a bubble. And the poem was inspired by Greek civilization and listening to actually a lecture of Greek civilization, the rise and collapse of Greek civilization. And a while ago, I had the chance to visit the Parthenon, which is a beautiful structure constructed of pentalic marble, um, a sort of bioclastic limestone packed full of bivalves, crinoids, ooids, and breccia. So to get you back down to earth, um, here's a beautiful rock to look at. Um, and recently, actually, archaeologists have managed to match the Parthenon stone to the quarry where it came from using uh, advanced isotope analysis, in case you're interested. Um, but let me finish off with my poem, The Bubble, inspired by Greek civilization. Civilization is a thin, fragile membrane, one molecule thick spreading infinitely yet contained like a bubble with multiple curves and topological twists, refracting the light into myriads of colors, a birefringent prismatic shimmer, watchable forever. The flaws, knots and twists are healed by chemical spreading, remarkably in spite of and because of the tension. Complexity, elasticity, and the unfathomable bonds of history provide its flexibility, whilst the growth, 
of homogeneous monomolecularity brings a new and dangerous fragility. Keep and enjoy this human and cultural diversity in Africa, Asia, Europe, Australasia, the Americas, and the islands of the seas. Resist all the disjoining pressures, for the spread of uniformity makes the bubble more likely to pop. Hope you enjoyed my trilogy of the Earth from outer space, and I'm more than happy if the next foot brings us back down to Earth. So very much enjoyed it. Thanks, Philip. Um, that's nice, three nice poems there. And I recognize the um, influence of uh, fluids in rocks as well. So um, the next one up is Gareth. So Michael's been on. So Gareth, uh, if you could pick up uh, the next spot. And Phil, you need to stop sharing your screen. Yeah. I can't start my video. Because Phil's still got it. I think you can now. I think I think I've stopped. Yep, yep on. Great. Testing, testing. Hello, uh, young Gareth Evans. You're right. I wanted to be a geologist, but it didn't happen. Somehow I wound up as a building surveyor, but you can't keep the rocks out of me somehow. And anyway, as the last speaker said, down to earth it definitely is. First poem is called Saxon Sandal. The hippopotami are now long gone, but still the muddy rivers flow to sea. The mist it hangs above the flowing tide as filled of sail the long ship glides to shore. The men it carries step into the mud, then hauling all together beach the craft. In years to come, such men will spawn a breed that calls itself the English, full of pride. And yet the English are a blink a moat within the eye of earth, the planet blue. No man there was, nor creature of great mind, when England met with Scotland and stuck fast. The tree says, we have only found it last of that titanic carpet rock, that shock that formed the first of what we Britain call. But still to come, the swiping southern blow that lay, raised the mighty limestone barriskides and sketched the map of Britain that we know long before road or track, or snorting steam. Then came the desert sands that are yet red, where mighty lizards slithered on the dunes and let their footprints rear in beds of mud. And after lizards, as the deserts waved, and what is England drifted to the north, the tropic seas, with coloured shells a-coil, and fish-like things that bore their young alive. Ashore, the lizards lured to warm their blood, grew huge or very small, the feathered trim that vexes those who would not have it so. And underneath one left a sandaled foot, a tiny snail is pressed into the soft and clinging mud unseen by any man. The muddy tide flows in and then retreats. A film of fresher mud entombs the beast as North Sea lurches imperceptibly onto the land as it did times before. And nothing is there left, but all is change. The next poem is called Avon Gorge, the Lower Carboniferous. Excitement is not unknown here. Brunel's iron ship came home at last on a barge, and one thinks maybe his heart would have been glad. Brigstow bustles, and the buses swirl and dance by the weird fountains that hide the Froom culvert below, but that is now. It is a peaceful occupation to climb above the noisy portway, count the crinoids, set not in rock, but very rock themselves, when once they wave their feathery fronds to catch the current and the tiny swimming things. Away to the north, where still there is land, things that are no longer fish plunge into pools at danger or hide in rotted tree bowls. Look out with eyes that dimly know. Here though, the lime mud gently settles, and only the earthquakes tell, though there is none to learn, what is going to happen. And the third poem is called Cookfield, the Lower Cretaceous. 
On the sand flat of the lazy, mighty river, the great corpse lies stranded. The flood that bore the weakened beast away is long subsided, and the skittering hipsy loafer dance, they'll try anything. Pick already at the enormous offering. The once noble head lies shorn of dignity in a mud flavor. The last meal of cycad leaves will never now be digested, but nor will the little beasts feed for long. For in the mountains to the west, where the floods pick up the chirp pebbles, war storms are brewing and the great creature will have a decent burial. In the quarry, the workmen look at the strange spike which their fellow has found. They wait for Dr Mantell. Thank you, and happy National Poetry Day. Thank you, Gareth. Um, so next one up is Alina. Alina, uh, from Pakistan, are you uh, able to come in at this point? I can share your poem if you can talk. Hello? Are you able to hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Can, okay. I'll share my screen and then uh, I'll bring up your poem. Okay. So um, my, my poem is coming up, your poem is coming up now. Can you, you see that? Yeah. You, you, you should see this now, Alina, so you can read your poem and tell us about you. Alina, can you... Uh, Um, yes. Uh, Alina, are you there? Hello. Hello. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm there. Okay, so you read your poem and tell us about yourself. Yes. Uh, well, I want to um, say um, I'm really honored to be a part of this. I've been listening to some of the poetry of, um, you know, um, those who presented their submissions before me and um, all of them were amazing I and you know it, it had that soothing effect um, well I'm from Pakistan for those who are not familiar with this and I am uh, a geologist um, I've uh, done my MS in um, in geophysics I'm actually pursuing it I didn't got the degree yet and uh, I also work. I work in concession management. This is like an upstream regulatory body of Pakistan where I work. Uh, and I'm no poet, not even close. Uh, this is something I wrote um, during my office hours. Um, and I wrote because, you know, sometimes I, I, I never knew, I, I, you know, it could um, be something like that because... I never tried writing anything, so this is my first poetry. Um, at that moment, I just didn't have a very great time in my office, and something happened. I was really overwhelmed. So, uh, and I was also alone in my cubicle, so I don't know what to do. So, at that moment, I just took out my register and I wrote um, and tried to be, you know, um, tried to write whatever I felt um as it is uh but sometimes i believe when you're writing something especially when you are sharing your emotions you don't want to be very explicit about it uh so you want to hide behind something else and correlate whatever you're feeling with any natural phenomena or any other thing so the thing that came in my head was streams and the way they erode so it's about that. This is how I correlated my emotions with streams. And one uh, other reason of doing this uh, is that so that and everyone can connect with this. Because if I were to share my side of the story as it is and in a very explicit way, I don't I don't know if people could actually connect with it. So um, sometimes writing something um, and using metaphors or similes, it helps. Uh, you know, 
it kind of like creates a connection and a bond uh, between your poetry and anyone who is feeling slightly in a similar way uh but you know the scenarios and everything they cannot be exactly the same so before before i uh so i just want to start i hope you like it um and i uh, hope uh you could connect with it uh, and i believe uh, one thing more uh, that poetry or any other thing like painting or anything is more of a catharsis um you know it uh, these sometimes we get depressed and sometimes we don't have anybody to share our emotions with so i believe when you write anything on a piece of paper or when you draw something it's kind of like you let that feeling out so you feel a little relieved um let's start streams with the dry land wipe away the gra- sand grains and consign them to the ocean bed there they lay all forgotten piled up in murky water a day soon will come if they don't get dispersed a day of cementation a day of consolidation day when they'll turn into solid rock a rock a rock then might emerge might emerge from the depth already to be exposed all exposed in the air the cycle then will continue will turn it back into grains the grains will be dispersed once more to be consolidated yet again like the vigorous cycles the cycle of my vigorous dreams thank you so much Thank you Elena that was very nice and very moving story to go with it so you you read your first poem there to 125 people i think at the moment that's impressive so f- following on from that um just checking we have uh, elizabeth thank you very much elena so elizabeth over to you hi I'm Liz Wong. Um let me start my presentation. Um let me do that. And um so I'll give a little background on my project um what I'm currently doing right now um explaining the geology and science and I'll wrap up by reading two poems that I written uh today. Oops. So a little bit about myself. Um I I grew up in Malaysia. I went to the US for my undergraduate um and then I came to the UK. I did a master's in London, uh was up in Aberdeen for a bit and now I'm back in London. Um and my professional career so far has been working as a petroleum geologist um in mostly oil and gas companies um and now banking. Um and I'm really just starting a writing career right now, um getting started. uh to develop a body of work um uh, my debut novel is out next year um and this project is completely different um and it's a new thing that i'm starting on right now um uh i'll start with explaining what uh geology me- means to me uh to me geology is not just about rocks but it's also about the stories that they contain um there are all these so really different um and really strange herbs uh that we can't see right now because you know they don't exist right now but we can see them from the rocks and i put here uh a few examples of like very strange conditions that earth has experienced in its long life um and uh so first of all we have like a snowball earth in precambrian a very very long time ago where the earth was um either completely or mostly covered in um in ice uh and it is very different from right now as you can you can tell um uh you know there was maybe a bit of a uh, soft uh you know areas that weren't covered in ice but most of it was covered in ice you have the big coal forest of the carboniferous um huge coal forest across the world um you have the mega floods in northwestern us where basically uh the, the glaciers um existed throughout the us and there are uh, these massive ice lakes which broke and created huge floods um and and, and they are amazing 
um, that's Paleo Lake Mega Chat, which is uh, sort of a really large lake in Chat that existed sort of closer to our time, about 6,000 years ago. Um, and uh, it's this massive inland sea in, in Chat. And, you know, we, we don't have, it was the largest lake in, um, in the world at that point in time. So I, you know, in literary fiction and poetry, um, it tends to focus on the now, this, this sort of brief snapshot of this earth. Um, but we can go deeper into deep time, sort of understanding the sort of large scale immenseness of the rock record. Um, all these stories that Earth has, um, has, has, has experienced and it's, pres uh, it's sometimes preserved in the rock record. Um, there's so much rich material in there to mine from, uh, excuse the pun, uh, from understanding geology. And we can sort of imagine some of these strange stories um, into our current world. Uh, so I have two quotes up there on the screen. Uh, the first one is, uh, the past is a foreign country, they do things differently over there, uh, and that sort of explains itself. And the second one um, is actually about diversity of uh, people, but actually you can think a bit about diversity of um, stories we tell. So it's um, that when we reject the single story, we re when we realize that there is never a single story about any place, we regain a kind of paradise. Um, and, you know, right now, you know, we write stories about this current earth, but there are a lot more stories out there and they sort of deserve to be shared. Um, and so that brings me to my project. Uh, so I, I am been thinking and writing material about the Messina salinity crisis and how it would look like if it happened today. Um, and to start with that, I'm going to do a really quick geological introduction because some of you may not know uh, or may not be familiar with uh, Messinian Silidi crisis because it happened a very long time ago, uh, you know, actually six million years ago. And this is my chance to show some maps because I also like maps. Okay. Uh, so the, the Mediterranean Sea, I'm sure you're all familiar with it. It's a very large body of water. It's um, 2.5 million kilometers squared. Um, it's very deep. Okay, or, or, or it, it is deep. So it's um, you know at least um, 1,500 meters deep um, and the deepest points go you know over 5,000 meters deep. It's not just a shallow sea. So it's much deeper than the North Sea, which I think is sort of 90 meters average depth. Um, and part of the reason is because the Mediterranean Sea has oceanic crust in it. So, you know, it, it's a lot deeper. So it's very deep, very big. And um, about six million years ago, the Mediterranean Sea dried up uh, or, or else most of it. And you can see uh, pictures there that show uh, the event. And this is called the Messinian Salinity Crisis. Um, so these maps, uh, so the first one at the top uh, shows I can do a, I can do a mouse. Uh, you know, prior to the drying up, you have an open connection with the Atlantic Ocean, um, and, and the geology and the you know geography is slightly different because it's six million years ago. Um, you get these two uh, open uh, marine connections to uh, the Atlantic Ocean, um, and as the African continent moved into Europe, um, the tectonic movements of um, uh, cut off these two uh, marine connections, and um, the Mediterranean Sea started to dry up. It has a negative water budget. So it, it starts to dry up. Uh, it has no more connection to the open ocean, you know, and there is not enough rain to fill the Mediterranean Sea. It dries up, dries up over a couple of hundred million years old, uh, a couple of, hundred, couple of hundred of thousands of years. Um, it's like a puddle drying up in the sun for a very long time. Um, so as a result of that, the sea level falls uh, quite substantially. So uh, rivers start cutting down um, into the falling base level. It causes large canyons um, and there's lots of salt that cut, precipitates out of the water. So you have these large bodies of salt uh, throughout the Mediterranean basin. And you can see in the middle picture, most of the Mediterranean Sea has dried up there and it, it, there's a lot of exposed land. So about 5.3 million years ago, um, there was, uh, so the Atlantic Ocean um, eroded uh, into the Mediterranean Sea and caused a new connection, which exists till today, it's a Gibraltar. Um, and the Mediterranean Sea flooded over, again, over um, a very short period of time, actually, two years, um, some estimates are saying. So 
So, and I have a few more pictures here. So the, it, just to show you the scale of these things. So, um, so you can see at the top of the screen, uh, this is a seismic line. I, I don't think you were expecting seismic lines here, but here it is. Uh, so there's this red, um, red reflector um, and it's, sort of, it's a huge erosional surface. So basically when the, you know, when the rivers uh, cut down, it, it cut down quite deep into the, into the sediment. And you know, when it filled back up, it filled it back up with soft sediment. Um, there's also a picture of a sort of salt, uh, sort of gypsum really, it's sort of a close relation of salt. Um, it was deposited uh, when it dried up. And there is a picture of earth there and um, how it looked like you know, prior to the cutoff and how it looks like now in red. Um, so I also show this, which is a sort of modern day analog of Salton Sea, which is in California. It's not really an analog, it's not really a true geological analog because the Mediterranean Sea is a lot deeper, a lot bigger, whereas the Salton Sea is an inland lake really, and it's a lot shallower. But it's an analog in that Salton Sea is an example of uh, coastal sediments that have been basically abandoned. So you can see all these sort of abandoned structures, abandoned swimming pools. It used to be a resort town, a fishing destination, like how towns along the Mediterranean Sea uh, are like now. Um, but the lake dried up, there are these beach villas are abandoned, shops, boats, docks, swimming pools, all abandoned. And as we can imagine, like you can, if you imagine the Mediterranean Sea drying up now, uh, what, what would it look like? Something sort of similar to these sort of images of um, abandonment, human objects left in this sort of growing desert. Um, and so this one is uh, XKCD. These are comics from XKCD, which is a wonderful web comic about science. And I'm showing it to you today because it's a strip uh, called Time, um, and he has 3,000 panels, or actually 3,099 panels, so it takes a very long time to read. But it's one continuous story um, imagining human civilization um, during a time when the Mediterranean Sea has dried up and there are people living at the bottom of this dried up Met Sea. Um, and I wouldn't give the story away, but it's an amazing read. I, uh, really recommend everyone to read it. It's an example of how to integrate science with art to sort of reimagine this, you know, strange geological scenario into today's world. Um, so that's me done for now. And I will wrap it up by reading two poems that I've written as part of this project. Uh, the first one is called uh, Beach Umbrellas and Lost Sea. Um, in this new world, I'll feed Pat by the skeletons of beach umbrellas, braggots curling in the hot sand. Melting plastic permeates the linings of our noses. Water drips onto the sand grains, cementing into gypsum plates and pearly calcite rims. Water percolating, leaking deep somewhere. Water abrades the canyon walls, falling into a sharp point a V that cuts deeply through the Tethys, lost oceans, lost seas. Water seeking the low, that last low flattening to where it evaporates into clouds that burn our souls. Once we could walk to the edge of the infinite, our Ama and Gong Gong had said, we would not listen for we are young and we know everything. Um, and the second poem, which I'm going to read to you today is Nest. Uh, it's a new poem that I wrote recently. So um, here it goes. I found a nest of pebbles perched high on a river cracked ledge with no shadows stranded by the mother river. The aluminum twinkle of an empty crisp packet wave too. Walkers, it said, never rotting but crinkling caught in the hatched granite. The teeth of canyon walls scar the land, lips crack, tongues gritty, the sulfur fire stains the air, rotten eggs everywhere. Um, thank you for your time and attention. Um, I would appreciate any feedback and um, 
you know, you can contact me at my email address or my website, theelizabethwong.com. Thanks, Elizabeth. So uh, next up is Robert. Yeah, off you go, Rob. Yes, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Robert Seidel. I'm a, a PhD student of theology at the Open University in what is right now in almost sunny Milton Keynes. And I'm going to turn things around a little bit and tell what my poem is about after I read it, because uh, guessing or realizing what it is about as I go along is part of what the poem is about. So here goes. Helen. A hundred years she'd been asleep as if in a fairy tale, and she woke up from a kiss delivered to her bottom. Hot and fiery was that kiss she got from Hephaistos, Upward soon, its warmth suffused all across her body. The youthful maid began to glow, though she was well experienced, barely adult, yet by now a veritable femme fatale. Sparkling, joyfully alive, with her cheeks on fire, in renewed bloom she stood, and her fame spread far and wide. When they learned of that fair maid, nor fully roused from sleep, Near and far, adventurers had a mind to see her. All who came to yes. woo her were of honest interest possessed. Respectfully, they asked to look into her core being. Let us talk about the future. Tell me, what is it you plan next? What you want is dear to me. Speak to me, I'm listening. And the handsomest of all, young and dashing, smart and daring, cheerful and for action voiced was David Johnston. Many did she lend an ear. No one was as bold and breezy as David Johnston. No one came as close to her. Much did David Johnston dare and everything she granted him. All he did, she seemed to smile. Not one favor was denied. But even David Johnston underestimated Helen. How much the fair one glowed for him, he learned one day in spring. Without a word, she came to him when she could wait no longer, came with all consuming passion, came burning up in heat. Now, David Johnston thought that theirs had been a platonic affair, the love of such a goddess no mortal can endure. On that early morning, though, the storm of passion swept. David Johnston off his feet, and he sank in her embrace. The burning heat of Helen changed what David Johnston once had been, suffocated, overpowered, no more recognizable. David Johnston, David Johnston, tell us, do you rule your love? Did you wish when all was over, you'd never caught the sight of her? Or would you, on the contrary, do as you did a second time. Or just perhaps, with hindsight blessed, keep your distance somewhat more? No, I don't believe that you would stay away from Helen Fair. You longed to meet that lovely one, knowing well it was a risk. David Johnston, David Johnston, in your ashes rest in peace. May all who bravely dare to love your fine example emulate. Where your love did strike you down, David Johnston, rest in peace. Where Helen took you in her arms, there rest, immortal in our thoughts. And now well, the poem is about the eruption of Mount St. Helens and the death of uh, volcanologist David Johnston, whose anniversary we have just seen come around for the 40th time this May. Thanks, everyone. Been, honor, been an honor to be here. Thanks, David, and uh, nice to honor the memory of David Johnson. So, uh, Dick, it's over to you to wrap up before lunch.
Sorry, Dick, uh, you, I heard you come in, so I know you're out there somewhere. Hello? Yes, hello, Dick, you are online. Okay, am I visible yet? Yes, you are. Okay, I can't see myself, but as long as you can see me, that's the main thing. <clears throat> uh, I'm Dick Selly. I've spent most of my pr professional career at Imperial College, apart from some years working for oil companies and gap years, working in Greenland, the Sahara, Arabian deserts, and some horrible jungles. I'm not a poet, though my academic colleagues tell me that some of my research is geopoetry. I'm going to recite just one verse of a poem that has lost its author uh, and most of its verses. And I'm hoping that out there, uh, there is um, somebody who knows the author and can help with the lost verses. I'm going to try and share my screen. Not coming through as yet, Dick, but uh, ah. now I think we are coming through. Yes, it's here. Got it. Right. Rasse is one of the islands of the Inner Hebrides, and it lies between the Isle of Skye and the mainland region of Applecross. It measures about 20 kilometers by four, and it rises to a height of nearly 450 meters on the summit of the mountain Duncan. Duncan is an outlier of basalt lava from the sky tertiary volcanic center. And on its slope crops out some Cretaceous green sand. Beneath this near complete section of Jurassic strata from Cornbrash down to Lias, small patch of new red sandstone at the south end of the island, and northern Rasse is composed of Torridonian sandstone with underlying Lysian ice beyond and on the Isle of Rona. So no wonder Rasse has attracted many geologists. It's been a favorite field mapping area for undergraduates. I spent parts of several summers between 1959 to the mid 1960s doing undergraduate mapping and later hammering a PhD off the Torridonian of Rasse and the adjacent islands. Now, every year there were several undergrads mapping parts of Rasse, camping in tents, squatting in abandoned crofts, or if they were lucky, living the hay barn of the Mingis who farmed a farm at the south end of the island. On Saturday evenings, there were often informal mini geo Kayleys uh, in the Mingis hayloft, refreshed by cans of beer and whiskey. Someone always had a guitar and we sang what we might perhaps call geo-bothy ballads, including the ballad of the Rasse field geologist. This had many verses sung to a depressing tune, something like Abide With Me. Successive verses described the rain, the mist, the cold, the midges, the sheep, the peat bogs, the rain, the mist, the cold, the midges, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, very much in the style of William McGonagall, I'm afraid. Now, that song was sung over a number of years, and I don't know, cannot remember the name of the author, and I can only recall the first verse, and I wonder if there's anybody out there who can help me. I will recite the first verse, the Ballad of the Rasse Field Geologist, who would be a field geologist and on Duncan alone sit cold and wet and hungry too, and hammer lumps of stone. I can also offer this to you in Gaelic. Co pihi na gialach avi, fir er duncana na lech fein, na shui fur is fluch is achraho, a skalach clach le ord. With apologies for my accent, but I learnt my Gaelic on Rasse, which has a very peculiar uh, accent to it. So if anyone can help me, who was the author? Is that song still sung on Rasse, perhaps? And does anyone know the rest of the verses? 
Thank you for listening. Thanks, Dick, if you turn off your screen share. That takes us up to our lunch break. Uh, so we will be starting back on time uh, at uh, the time that you have in front of you, which I have somewhere here, uh, for this afternoon's session. We'll be starting with, uh, I think it's with uh, Sarah Acton, at quarter past one. So that's been a really fascinating session, as always, and we'll see you back here at quarter past one. Thank you very much, Dick, for that. I hope you find your missing verses and your, uh, the author of that poem. Thank you.
indicated support with a range of 900 pregnant spots for the male period in the field and space. The best data we have is the British Election Survey of 2014. Oh, are we all back? We have something like 105 people back. So we're... Do you make it quarter past, Pat? I make it, I make it quarter past, so you can start slowly. You've got your 20 minutes, so... Lovely. Well, welcome back, everybody. Um, I'd like to start by saying massive thank you to all of the panelists this morning for an incredibly inspirational morning of poetry and geology. I always learn something when I'm around geologists and I was really struck by the different poetry voices and also um, Alina mentioning in her introduction about that emotional connection that we have through poetry to earth history and our own perspective on that as well. So thank you to all of the panelists this morning. And also thank you to um, Pat, Pat Corbett and his team who've put this wonderful um, conference together. When Pat first mentioned um, this to me two years ago, it seemed like a, an awfully long time away and here we are now. My name is Sarah Acton. I'm a landscape poet and I run um, social engagement projects at different organizations. I'm also the Jurassic Coast World Heritage Site Poet in Residence, um, and I've been working alongside the Jurassic Coast Trust for the last three years. So thank you to them also for um, this lovely long-term opportunity to partner together. Um, and to work into different projects together. And it really came into its own last year when I was able to do a residency um, at Portland Museum through the Jurassic Coast Trust Volunteering Network. Um, they spent three months there collecting audio clips and talking to different quarrymen. And that project is going to be moving forwards in a completely different phase next year with some ACE funding to write a community play. So exciting times ahead with that collaboration and partnership uh, also. I was struck this morning by the different ways that we were all, all the panelists were talking about this concept of deep time. It's a phrase that we often hear when we're talking about earth history and I'm struck by this linear time that we as humans um, impose in order to rationalize our own life, lifespan and that of the earth. And I was picking up on all the different phrases we had this morning. We had missing time, time tide, um, the man who found time and several um, occurrences of the word deep time. So the poems that I'm going to present that I've written, especially for today, um, do take that theme as always, um, as its core theme, but also mix up the present, the future, um, and the past. Um, I've written a poetry cycle. I've called them sonnets, but uh, the poets among you will recognize that they're not quite sonnets. And um, I'm afraid the geologists in you, uh, here will recognize that a lot of the geology isn't quite uh, accurate geology either. I've tried to allow myself um, a creative spirit of play um, in order to be curious and explore the themes that I'm looking at. So the sequence is called Earth Shapers. I'm going to attempt to share my screen and provide a bit of a soundtrack for this. Um, I did go and record all of these in the places that they're talking about, the different cliffs. And then I tried to make a soundtrack of really, really slowed down um, versions of the poems. But it, the slower they became, they became very dark, actually. Um, and whilst I would love to share those with you, and I might put a few of them up on my SoundCloud, 
I thought that 10 minutes of, of listening to those with me talking on top of it might be a little bit too intense. So I'm going to try and share my screen. Now, once I start this, um, I have tried to adjust the audio levels so that you'll be able to hear me and I'll lean forwards a bit towards my laptop, but um, I'm not able to change it once I get started. I'm afraid uh, in, in the spirit of creativity and, and sort of um, happy accidents or unhappy accidents, you'll have to bear with it um, and maybe adjust your own volume if, if it's too much. Um, and then hopefully these poems will be made available at some point afterwards as well. So it's called the Earth Shapers Sequence. Earth Shapers, one, red rock. There was a time when there was a time when they say, because voice was here before you came, say towards or from the first darkness, when voice in sudden thought with the form of say, be, otter, raven, dog, thought to jump downstream, upstream, through sky holes howling ear, stole hunger, stole sun, stole night, stole, well, you know the kind of guy, makes good lies, swims fast, flips away before the sun stirs, So here it is. They say he cleared his throat and the music floated out. They say he soundtracked the dark sky with myth, dragged moon song from deep sea. Nothing speaks to such music as that he released. Sounds like wind and tree. Taking for fruit, plumpness, the peace. You have a word for the one who strangles water, gambles in poison to win corn, raids his children. Over 
survivors wear human skin to remember them, the habit of history. Beetles scuttle scratch creation story into shell, blow horns to gods, poor gifts, poor songs, heed, seasons, offer, restitution, wear geld, arms, A lesson from beer head. Two ways of seeing, twofold times exist. If you tune ears to polyphonic ground, mind clears to sense the deeper shifts and groans, where thought meets thought, head to head. Hello, I'm Sarah Acton, and this is the Wild Writing Electric pulses dictate texts, spells, tell in pictures this story. So let's see. That mast beams, crane, glitter metal, flings thousand sky hooks, nets. Being alone at the foot of the cliff, vision to pilgrims. The warrior springs a trap and all the people climbed in. Screams, there were many, represented over here in a zigzag of sound carried by gulls far, far offshore. As such frequencies disturbed nests of adders in sleep, though bears hibernating, heard none of this behind their cave doors. I think you didn't hear the soundtrack. We did hear the soundtrack and oh. uh, you were quite faint. So you sort of, your voice came in and out along the line, you know, so. Oh. So we had a, that's okay because it's like the geological record, but I think everybody wants to see your poems later. So, and I said that you would see them later. Absolutely. So those are the six, um, I, I did say it was going to be five sonnets, but I lost count when I was um, writing them. So those will be available somewhere later. Sorry for the faintness of the voice um, and the soundtrack, but that's, that's me done, I think. Okay, so I think it's, it's uh, me next. So I'm going to um, share the, my screen um, and bring up my poem. And uh, my place, you know, where I grew up is uh, a place in Dorset, because it's on the Jurassic Coast, referred to by Sarah previously. And I've put together three perfect poems. So this image has, you know, all the aspects of uh, Perbic that comes up in my poems. We have, uh, we have the plateau, we have the valleys coming down, we have the cliffs, we have the quarries, we have the stone profiles, the profile of the buildings, the profile of the cliff going down to the wave cut platform. We have the wave cut platform in the sea and we have the abandoned quarries, quarries that sourced buildings as famous as St. Paul's were coming from this quarries. So this picture contains all aspects of Purbeck in Dorset. And I'm going to read one poem and then I'm going to let you see two concrete poems and they're in the paperwork that comes with the meeting. So this, uh, Poem is called Bare Bones. Bare bones standing proud on the plateau over piles of strewn quarried rock. When the wind blows and rain patters, this feels like the most windswept of moors. 
An arch of hard limestone lies just below the surface. The puddled prints on its top side mark the passing of giants long ago. After rain, the air is fresh and the ground clog hudding. A snatched walk takes in oxygen under a patch of sailor blue sky. The welcome latch sounds on entry, releasing warm odors and trapped conversations of ghosts standing in the corridor. Quarrymen, farmers, actors. The walls, warm nicotine shades enveloping a womb-like special place where anything said stays inside, becoming fossilized. From here, deep gullies cut down and seaward into the soft underbelly where primroses and rooks rule banks or treetop roosts. All day long, the wind blows the sea spits and spumes, and all nature bends to the force of the great sculptor from the West. Concrete poems are something I think fit really well with geology. So here's a concrete poem where the form of the lines, and I'm not going to read this, the form of the lines are like the courses in the stone, the length of each word being like the size of the limestone, the um, left justification, like the coins, the right justification, the end of the walls. And the second verse there, you'll see that this is built like the geology from the bottom up, the way that the, the quarrymen build their walls from the bottom up. And uh, Perbicus is famous for its stone and all the buildings in Purbeck are built of this stone. So that celebrates the quarrymen, so much of Purbeck's history. And here is another concrete poem, which shows the profile that I showed in that earlier picture with the grass at the top of the cliffs, down through the quarries where the missing stone has gone to build St. Paul's and left just buttresses and down on the benches where people now swim and enjoy the wild swimming. And that's uh, how I spend a lot of my childhood sitting there looking at these cliffs. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Um, good afternoon. My name is Mark Cooper. Um, I live in Belfast, where I work for the Geological Survey of Northern Ireland. Um, so I've got three short poems for you, which I hope capture some of the linkages uh, between our modern world and the ancient or deep past. My first poem. Um, just captures a little um, uh, memory, shall we say, of geology in our urban environment. And it's called Early Glow. February new day light angles into Belfast corners, onto red brick rows and chimney stacks, raised from pits, molded by trade. Triassic mud, once again illuminated. My second poem um, is about a wonderful place that I try to visit often. Um, if you're ever over here in Northern Ireland, go and visit Killard Point in County Down. Okay. So, Killard Point. Before Vikings, St. Patrick and the early settlers, at Killard Point, an ice age founded on a coast once again revealed, its flesh stripped, ribs striated. 
a landscape scoured by forces hard to fathom. Some speak of kilometres, others miles of ice that passed over these rock surfaces with cargo of boulders, cobbles and pebbles swept from Scotland and the Ailsa Craig. Erratics that rest where farmers steer the plough, where whooper swans and brent geese graze. Stranded on storm beaches where painted ladies bask in warm autumnal sun. My final poem, another short one. I think I read this um, 10 years, maybe 11 years ago, down in Burlington House, but I still like it. I tweaked it a wee bit. Um, and it's about that moment when you, you know, anybody picks something up and discovers something, something amazing, something, you know, that can blow your mind. Uh, this is called Ammonite. Split the rock, right of line, owl eyes draw into mine, sight that has not seen since serpents swam in oceans green, and terrible lizards walked the rain-drenched forests. Split the rock, right of line, our eyes drawn into mine. Thank you. Let's see. Can you hear me? We can indeed, Lynn. You're online. Okay. Hi, my name's Lynn Goldsmith. I'm from uh, the United States on the West Coast. And what you see behind me is a photograph I took from a walk, a hike. Um, this is some of my favorite country. I feel really lucky to be here. And um, I think part of why I wrote this, not I think, I know, um, it's to think about the my our relationship to the earth and to appreciate it um it's also a place that gives me a lot of comfort <laughs> so i'm just gonna read <laughs> i'm not a good reader sorry <laughs> scree from cliff face rock falls to an angle of repose Pursuiting itself. Rubble waits for more of shaking up. Ice within mountain slopes. Water freezing to make new cracks. Maybe even to break rocks. Either way, however it happens. Cliff degrades through stressors. Biotic, chemical, thermal, topographic. Glacier to be covered. Scree to layer. Slope to become mantled. Burying occurs at all levels. So I was going to say more, but I think I'm going to stop. <laughs> so thank you. I want to thank all the other voices and contributors here. This is an amazing thing to have. So I think it'll keep going on for a long time. Thank you. If you want to say another poem, Lynn, you can, because uh, you've got a slot there. Um, I could, um, I should have said a couple things before that poem, um, angle of repose. It's a geological term, um, referring to like the steepest angle at which rocks can be piled at rest without slumping on the slope. And then scree in case someone doesn't know, it's like that, uh, loose rock debris covering a slope. Um, you might like what you'd see at the base of a cliff, for example. And the other thing that I thought of too was a quote, something to the effect of the earth has music. 
for those who listen. And I think it was originally thought to be by Shakespeare. Uh, and then that changed to George Santayana. And the last I read was that it was actually attributed to Reginald Holmes. So, um, sorry about that, I didn't mention that, but um, I could read another short one if you want. Let's see. This is called, um, oh, should I stop? It's called oh. Tor, it's short. And Tor is like a, um, a rock pinnacle, like a freestanding rock outcrop you'd see rising up. It's called Tor. You are what's left behind, pillows of rock worn, joints defined, topsoil gone, after pressure release, freeze thaw, chemical weathering has taken your sides. Their joints close enough to fall away into scree. To happen again is just a matter of time. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lynn. So, uh, Claire, uh, we're looking for Claire, who's the uh, one of the winners of the Hugh Miller competition. Claire, are you out there? If, if you're not there, Claire, we might go uh, straight to Cynthia Gallagher who I can see is there. So Cynthia, would you like to take this slot and we'll see if we can find Claire afterwards. Sure, that's fine. So Patrick, yeah, I did unmute. Yeah, you're and unmuted, but you uh, want to share your screen or share your video? I do, yes. Oh, okay, I'll start that. It says unable to start it because the host has stopped it. <laughs> uh, she will uh, pick this up and uh, okay. start you off. She's just, uh, because I've jumped one forward, she's probably just got to cat. There we are. All right. Um, my name is Cynthia Gallagher. I'm from Chicago, USA. And my first poem is based or was inspired by the, the oversized amethyst geodes that are my, they're at my local spa, but most likely they came from Brazil. So my poem is called Brazilian Amethyst Geodes. And Rio Grande do Sol, they slice amethyst geodes, the height of men, as easily as Brazil nuts. Open concave halves as if iron maidens revealing sharp, protruding purple crystals instead of torturous metal spikes. Will amethyst ensnare you? Move closer into a space where headaches and migraines may dissolve. Even amethyst anti-drunkenness name could help you flee alcohol's intoxication. Amethyst full-bodied prisms and pyramids dedicate themselves to your crown chakra. Place one piece under your pillow like a wine-stained tooth. And the amethyst fairy godmother of the lilac, mauve, and thistle night may grant you a serene night's sleep. My second poem is about glass. And according to scientists, glass is both a liquid and a solid. And it's a natural product. Uh, it's a natural rock that we just imitate <clears throat> in our production. And this poem is called Glass, the Liquid Solid. Ever since lightning first hit sand and beachcombers picked up shards of this petrified light, Humanity strove to imitate nature, the up close and the far away, as we always do, ever wanting to fly like birds, to camouflage ourselves, to swim like fish, to see into stars. When sand, lime, and soda mixed with furnace fire, there arose a globule of glass as viscous as white hot honey. 
blooming into a bright wobbly orange, rolling like taffy at the end of a blowpipe, the doubled lung giving it long air, exhale after creative exhale into a liquid transparent bubble. From hot crucible and glory hole, the vase and goblet, art glass and light bulb, the windows of the world, microscope and telescope, our observant mimicking eyes peering inward and upward from this bubble of earth. And my last poem is about Jade and it's dedicated to my sister Darcy who passed away but her favorite gem was Jade and I know my sister Sharon is watching now as well. It's called the Jade Room. Others may seek a life made in the shade sipping lemonade. My sister preferred to ponder Jade. She lived simply, didn't own many clothes, clipped coupons, bought art supply seconds. But when it came to Jade, only the most translucent jadeite, perhaps shot with hints of mauve or blue, would do for her small collection. Jade, the color of matcha latte I sip, the celadon cereal bowl on my shelf, or my sage colored tunic hand woven of linen, but my sister's jade, earth woven of crystals. She would have rather been a homebody in Chicago, but her husband's travels pulled her to far flung places. In New Orleans, near her new home, she drew me into a special jade room, a side and art gallery in the French Quarter. A curtain, inner sanctum of peace, buffeting the diamond, screaming from hands of Bourbon Street party goers outside. Each jade vase, scepter, circle, cabochon, snuff bottle and box, as lightly hued as green grapes or tart Granny Smith apples, or deeply shaded as savory olives or bitter kale. Each spoke to us in a hush, a silent wisdom. We stood in awe that each had traveled so far to gather here, yet remained delicate, perfect, and profound. Were we in a verdant secret garden or a temple lost in the jungle, covered in vines? So like my sister, who too lived in her own private place of patience, reverence, and contemplation, but with the strength and hardness to circle the world unscarred. Thank you so much. Thank you, Cynthia. Very difficult to read poems that are so personal, so thank you. So um, next up is Claire Winternecht. So Claire is going to switch them around. So Claire, you're, on, you're online now. Hello, my name is Claire Rinderganesh and I am half French, half American, but I lived in Scotland for 10 years. So this is my poem about the Standing Stones of Stenness um, from my memory of visiting them when I was still a wee lass. Standing Stones of Stenness. My ocean blue dress sways in the Orkney wind, clamorous, chilly, childlike. It plays with my cropped hair, teasing. Around me stand the standing stones of Stenness. I am a Scottish lass surrounded by my ancestors. They stand as tall as dad seemed when I dreamed of bow and arrows and thistle fairies. The stones feel like dad's chin, Unshaven, my pale fingertips touch the dark surface, dappled with white and gray, searching for the sand's grain memories they have lost. The stones smell cold, of purple heather, of dewy grass, of sheep droppings and sea salt. I stood here once with Dad and Mum, Jules and Eve, Brooklyn pulling on her lead. 
We created memories I now try to catch with my pencil. They swirl around me, still caught in the Orkney wind. They dance the gay Gordon, still in primary school, practicing for the Cayley. We left Scotland, and I hid my heart in a circle of lost friends, of bitter thoughts, of long French school days. Jules is at uni now. Eve is no longer we. I have grown as well. I'm no longer a sweet, willowy girl who dreams of fairies. Now I dream of the day I become a sandstone of sand grain memories dappled with white and gray. I dream of standing again among the standing stones of Stenness. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claire. So Claire's the winner of the group in the Hugh Miller. So it's very nice to have that poem read, Claire. And anybody dreaming of being sandstone, very nice dream to have. So that takes us on to Faith. Thank you, Claire. Uh, so Faith, you have the last slot before our little break. Oh, hello. Can you hear me? Loud and, loud and clear. Thank you. Hey, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Faith Limbrick. Um, I'm based in Shropshire and Edinburgh. Um, this is a piece called um, It's Happening Right Now, um, Right As I Talk To You. And it's um, a work adapted from a film that I'm making called Geomyth. Um, and that's coming out at the end, well, hopefully this month, but we'll, we'll have to wait and see. Um, so this um, is a spoken word performance. So there'll be video and pre-recorded sound and live spoken, um, spoken word. And um, this is inspired by um, long, some long distance hiking I did in the Southwest USA, um, especially in Northern Arizona and Southern Utah. Um, and also uh, in a particular place called the Puria Canyon, which runs from across the border of Utah and Arizona and in the Grand Canyon. I did, um, last year, I did a lot of hiking in that area. Um, I, I'm an artist. Um, I don't have a background in geology um, or geomorphology, but I'm very interested in geomorphology in particular. Um, and the work, the film and this work are, a sort of way of a way in which I could deal with um, seeing all these formations and um, amazing landscapes and um, how to um, trying to understand them without that sort of scientific background knowledge and um, and how and how one might be in that in those landscapes and think about them so that's sort of where it comes from. Um, so yes, I'm going to share a video and then just bear with me and I'll get it all started. And um, yes, oh, and actually, because I didn't, I forgot to put credits on. Um, there's a few, I, I, I thought I should say, um, speak some credits very quickly before I begin. So um, I just want to say thank you to um, my guitar player, John Ipe, the piano player, David Garfinkel, Clar um, Esmond Sage on clarinet and um, myself on the bassoon. Um, the imagery that I'm using um, is mostly my own imagery, but it's also um, from soil samples from um, Nicholas Corumpus that I um, took at Ascus Lab, which is an open public lab in Edinburgh. Um, and I think that's, yes, that's everything. So I'll begin. <laughs> second. So this is, um, it will be a black screen for a little while um, when I hit play and then imagery will come. So it is working even though it is black. <laughs> okay. So this is, um, it's happening right now, right as I talk to you.
Now take your eastern ledge and reach over the summit and touch your shoulder. Hold it. Now I want you to feel that coming right up through the central saddle. Lower through the middle to your play. Inhale to lift the shoulder and melt down. Spur stays long, ridge aligned. Exhale, hold it down. Narrowing on the way up like a diamond and broadening on the way down. Let us sit down in the seat of instinct. A migration occurs when all you can see is land, an inevitable relocation of the mind to the seat of the body. For the intellectual mind cannot lay hold of land without the body. A distance must be felt, a depth must be measured by a leg, a holding by a hand. <laughs> Independent eyes develop, growing two extra eyes on the top of the eyes you already have. They do not bore a nerve into the brain. In, the, in their wisdom, they bypass. They strike a direct deal with the gut. A mysterious electro-pulsing communication rises up. It reaches out from the middle and pulls forward. There is no language with land. There is just a wordless sense. There is a hole in the map. Light shines forth from the black that obscures the world. There is a hole in the obscuring map, revealing that which shines forth. It's like taking your brain for a massage. It's like how you feel when you sunk deeply into a bucket of goop and you just keep sinking. It's like when the sun shines on your face in the summer and you have your eyes closed and you're laying on the ground in some grass or something. It's like looking up at the clouds, blue sky and nothing else in view, feeling like you're stuck to the earth, like on a complex edge of a balloon you could fall off into the blue at any moment. It's like reality is real, just what is there and there's nothing else. It's like long ago. I called out amongst the rocks. <laughs> Eroded mountain tops.
steps, buckling bedrock, fundamental bodies, monolithic power, scorched delicate matter, conundrums of the mind, geological mysteries, exogenic excavations, denudation, rock-eating lichens, substrata piling up like fillings in a sandwich. A marked and pronounced discontinuity has puzzled the people who take care to take note for much time. Where there should be a plain narrative of rock formations, there stands in its stead a great mystery of the ages. Now as we pass through the, through the Manabe formation and into the Shinle, we begin to traverse the domain of the dinosaurs weirdly shaped valleys which looked as though they must have been carved by unfeasibly large rivers. Erratic boulders teetering for centuries, great monoliths slumped against the canyon walls, tired of their own bodies, denudation and stone-eating lichens, subtle traces of atmospheres, vestiges of peoples and animals, dinosaur footprints in concrete mud, Ghosts appeared as the dust of ancient rocks. mediated by bacteria, augmented and not meant to see. The tools offered us a way of experiencing a different kind of knowledge. Align the hour hand with the sun. South lies halfway between the hour hand and 12 o'clock. Desert colours dance under refracted sunlight. In slow motion, the beams tickle the sediment and rocks. Particles scatter from the sudden intrusion of a foot on the riverbed, disturbing the vision with murky swells. Slowly out of the darkness, a small porthole of light appears. It traverses the map below, revealing that which shines forth an intricate and intimate picture of delicate, mysterious structures. A disembodied voice tells you about the migratory path of the brain to the gut, an instinctual mode of being. More than 500 mineral species and fossils of wildly diverse life forms, including worms, trilobites, shellfish, corals, dinosaur footprints and bones and plants and animal remains, including ice age mammoths, fossilized jellyfish, uprising schist, the upper part of the upper Triassic Shinle formation, snail shells, burned charcoal remains, back guano, Fool's gold, javelina fighting tusks, forgotten tent stakes, and that granola bar packet that accidentally got away in the wind. Cake layers of sedimentary rock. The substrata piles up like fillings in a sandwich. Cake. Sandwich. <laughs> Thank you. 
And for all I know, it came from the body of a chihuahua who told me that it was seeking gems in the river. And I mean that chihuahua had a crazy addiction to the crystal's radiant shiny sheen. I mean, I could see it in its little bulging eyes. That's all I'm saying. And to be honest with you, the chihuahua wasn't even the main problem here. Whatever that chihuahua coughed up, I mean, it was like an egg. It was sort of hard and round and dusty pink. Not really knowing what to do, I slipped it into the pouch on my dress. It had not even been three days yet, and forgetting to, that it was in my pocket, I was on a winter's beach in December. I guess the warmth of my hand must have provoked its hatching and, oh my gosh, you would never believe what came out of that egg. What came out of that egg? What came out of that egg? I'll tell you what came out of that egg. What came out of that egg was a little miniature greyhound. Cool. Thank you very much. Um, I think we've got a 10 minute break now, so we can all have a nice cup of tea. <laughs> that was inspirational. Thanks, Faith. No 2.25. Stop sharing your screen. Yes. Your <laughs> uh, is that stop now? Yeah. Yeah, great.
Sorry, we're just about to kick off this next session. With Norman when he's ready. I'm here, Patrick. If you, if you can hear me. Yes, you're ready to go. So you just put your video on, and we're all ready to go. It says the host has stopped it. Uh, Becky will. Uh, enable your video mm -hmm. when she picks this up which is pretty quick okay here we are good good bright sunshine outside <laughs> that better that's great you're on your broadcasting so ready to go well, welcome back, everyone. Um, it's been a marvellous day so far. And uh, my name is Norman Bissell, and I'm coming to you from the Isle of Ling on the west coast of Scotland. And I'm just about to bring up the, um, the slideshow that I, I'm going to present to you. Can you see that now? Uh, maybe Patrick can tell no, me. It's not quite up yet. So. No, okay, I'll just escape again and come back in. Two clicks, one top left and one bottom right, usually. Yep, I'll just go again. Share. Yeah, you're sharing now. Okay. And uh, give you the full screen. Okay, I'm going to give you a short talk about geopoetry and geopoetics. Uh, I'm the director of the Scottish Centre for Geopoetics, which has been going for 25 years now. And um, I want to take you through some aspects of mainly of geopoetics. I think this morning and this afternoon, we've had some wonderful examples of geopoetry. And some of them I would suggest are also examples of geopoetics. Uh, so I'm not going to say that much about geopoetry, but I'm going to say quite a lot about geopoetics. And I hope that um, when you if there is time at the end that you might put some, if you have any questions or comments about what I'm saying, please put them in the chat. And I'll, if we've got time at the end, I'll try to, uh, I'll, I'll try to answer some of them and come back to some discussion. Here's a poem I, I wrote a few years ago, um, and it's about a geopoetic approach to the world when you go out. When you go out into the world, Try to use all your senses. Touch and taste wild thyme. Smell hawthorn and kelp. Watch herring gulls soar. Listen to the sound of the sea. Above all, open your mind. And who knows what you will find. The image is just round the corner from where I am here in Cullipool on Ling, on the west coast of Ling, looking over to Mull. Uh, it's a slate island and you can see Ben Moore in the background there on Mull and uh, where the Mull volcano spread its uh, lava, its basalt, over to Ling and much further east. So what is geopoetics? Well, I want to suggest a number of aspects of it. It's a much wider concept than, uh, than geopoetry, but it's essentially along the same lines. It places the earth at the center of our experience. It cares about the earth and is interested in conserving all its life forms. Very importantly, it tries to develop a heightened awareness of the earth of which we humans are part. 
And in that short poem I read you there, it tried to encompass the idea of that we use all our senses and our knowledge to become attuned to the world. It seeks to overcome the separation of mind and body and of human beings from the more than human world. And it learns from others who have gone before us and have attempted to leave what Kenneth White calls the motorway of Western civilization. I'm just going to quickly give you one or two um, mentions to some of these forerunners of geopoetics. Alexander von Humboldt, a polymath, an explorer, a writer, a conservationist, a very important founder of these ideas that we're talking about today. Then there was Henry Thoreau, uh, a writer and naturalist, perhaps best known for his uh, book, uh, Walden, A Life in the Woods. And uh, as you can see, Patrick Geddes, Scotsman, biologist, sociologist, and a city planner. Nan Shepherd, a walker, writer of novels and of poetry, and most famous for her book, The Living Mountain. Then you have Joan Eardley, a painter who spent some of her time in Glasgow, in Townhead, where my family came from, and also in Catalina on the northeast coast of Scotland. And you can see that she's, she's creatively expressing the village of Catalina outdoors in her work. Kenneth White was the founder of the International Institute of Geopoetics in 1989. Scottish poet, thinker, has spent most of his uh, life in France, left in 1967 and lived there and now in Brittany um, since then. He, um, I would say he, he has come back to Scotland a lot, of course, in the intervening years since then. But his ideas and the idea of geopoetics is not really new. It's based on creative expression of the earth, which goes back as far as 30,000 years ago um, in the cave paintings in France and Spain, in Celtic culture, shamanism, and in Aboriginal, Inuit, and Native American cultures who sought to live in harmony with the earth before colonization interfered. These are some of Kenneth White's essay books that if you're interested in following up and reading more about geopoetics, uh, these are probably some of the best books to start with. And so is this is probably the best introduction in English to geopoetics, it's by called The Radical Field by Tony McManus. And I'll be coming back to Tony. He was an English teacher in, in the Edinburgh area, a musician and writer, and he was a pioneer of geopoetics in Scotland. Other, other aspects of geopoetics I've not touched on. It's a way of perceiving and being or living in the world. It's a transdisciplinary world outlook which seeks to develop a sense of world. And again, we've seen this morning and this afternoon um, some transdisciplinary work from scientists, poets, and those who are both. Scottish Centre is part of an international movement, which there are geopoetic centres uh, in various countries. Quebec is a very big group in Canada. Uh, smaller groups in Europe and larger groups in France. And we've just recently got going the, uh, an American group called Geopoetics Appalachia. Most of our members are in Scotland, but also in other parts of the United Kingdom. And what Geopoetics seeks to do is create radical cultural renewal for us as individuals and for society as a whole. Perhaps the most important aspect of geopoetics for us here today is that it attempts to create expressively uh, the earth in a variety of ways. 
you want a short definition of geopoetics, it's the creative expression of the earth. And this can be in a whole variety of manner. Poetry, of course, prose, visual arts, music, geology, botany, philosophy, and combinations and collaborations of these, as we have seen already today. This short poem is the title poem from my uh, poetry collection called Slate, Sea and Sky. An island on the rim of the world, in that space between slate, sea and sky, where air and ocean currents are plays of wild energy and the light changes everything. And that little poem has gone a long way. It's been included in a couple of uh, anthologies and it's also um, inspired a composer, uh, Liz Lane, to write a, a piece for solo cornet and brass band, which has been recorded by um, some of the best brass bands in the world. Tony McManus, he founded the Scottish Centre on Burns Night, appropriately, 1995. We now have over 80 members in these different countries and as well as throughout Scotland. We, um, we have day events and two day, three day conferences, which combine talks and discussion with guided walks and creative workshops. This is our annual journal. We, we've produced eight issues of Stravig, which contains poems, essays, artwork, and you can read most of them online at our website. Strabeg, um, that was the theme of issue six a couple of years ago, uh, Living on the Edge. And we welcome uh, submissions, uh, which will go to our editorial group of about six uh, members. And we, the submissions have to be in by the end of January each year and the, the journal comes out in the summer. So you, any of you today would be most welcome to submit work. We haven't quite decided on the theme for next year, but um, as I say, we're, we'll be publicizing that in, the, in November. This was one of the conferences that we held. Um, I think that photograph was taken by Helen no, I took the photograph and it was of Helen Bowden, who's one of the contributors today and one of the workshops that she was leading, um, looking over to Isle of Ling in the background from uh, Elna Bech on the Isle of Seal. And you can see uh, further down there on the left hand side, uh, a creative ethnology group, which was having a discussion and other groups in the main hall there in 2017. So what about the future? Well, the Scottish Centre works with individuals, with other centres and university departments to attempt to develop geopoetics further. We, be, we feel that further theoretical work is needed. Um, we've had some articles in the past in Strabeg about um, geology and geopoetics. Uh, John Gordon, who many of you will know, uh, he contributed, I think, at least two essays on that subject, but more are most welcome. Everyone is welcome to join the Scottish Centre for Geopoetics and take part in our events and activities. It's not an exclusive club. Uh, it, it, um, it's a membership organisation, a voluntary organisation, and the membership costs £10 per year and £5 if you're unwaged. And the bonus is that you get a free copy of Grounding a World, Essays on the Work of Kenneth White, which I will post out to you if, you, um, if and when you join the Scottish Centre. The next event we have is a Geopoetics Day on Saturday the 7th of November. It will be an online event like this one, it had been planned to be a, a, an actual event, but it will be uh, virtual now. 
and it will include the Tony McManus Geopoetics Lecture by Professor Richard Roberts. And we believe there is radical hope for the future in the theory practice of geopoetics. If you want to know more, um, you can have a look at our website, uh, which is on the screen there. And also um, you can write to me at my email address there. I'm happy to send you more information and answer any questions. You can see there Tinto Hill again, which Gordon Peters uh, and Pat was there uh, last June. And uh, we had a very good few days there talking and practicing geopoetics. So that's, I think, all I want to say. But I look forward to hearing some questions and discussion if we can, if I can get back to the main screen. Uh, yeah. So it's across to you now, Sarah. Thanks, Nori. Great, Sarah, you can bring yourself up. If you start speaking, I think you'll come through to the foreground. Oh, okay. Hello. Yes. I'm here. I'm here. I've, I've, um, do I have to click my... No, you're on full screen video. Uh, oh, am I? You want to share your screen? Not yet. Um, uh, not yet. But because um, I'm going to show a, a film. Do it when uh, you're ready. So can you still see me if I do this? If you're showing a film, we see you in the corner, but we see you now. You're seeing me full screen? Yes. Okay, brilliant. Okay, well, I'm, I'm Sarah Tremlett. Um, I'd just like to say a bit, thank you. It's just sort of overwhelming, all of these um, wonderful poems and filmmakers, poets, scientists, um, you know, a whole mix of, of things going around in my head. And I feel just like a kind of little pebble in this mountain of immense talent. So, um, well, basically I'm a poetry filmmaker, I'm an artist, and um, I've just written a book called The Poetics of Poetry Film, which is out with Intellect Books in Before Christmas. Um, I curate and judge at festivals. And um, today I'm going to be talking about um, a project I've been working on for some time, which is, um, on uh, re combining research for family history with um, poetry, film, poetry, visits to sites and place. Um, I've been researching 25 years at least on my own family history. And my family are all, uh, they all were either miners or farmers or worked with um, rivers as um, paper makers, tanners. Um, they were all um, doing basic work on the land. And um, I decided that I was going to do a project that uh, would, I would visit the sites and then um, try and get a sense of these places through uh, working with film and poetry and my own feelings. Um, as to, to get a sense of identity um, in some way. Um, uh, so uh, last year I showed um, my work at the, um, at the um, Scottish Centre for Geopoetics. And that was a film called Paper River. And it kind of looked into the river calm in Devon. Um, where I uh, went and made a poetry film and researched the, um, the mill there, which my great grandfather ran. And there were problems during the First World War. Um, in fact, there was a strike. So that was quite a socio-political um, little episode from the First World War. And today I'm going to be showing, um, uh, it's basically a kind of a, uh, a letter or a conversation to an ancestor 
from actually the 12th century, who was a miner in Cornwall. And I went, fortunately, this particular site, there's a, a farm stay, and I could visit the actual location. And um, so I went there and got a feel of the place and um, they mined manganese at this site. So um, I'd like to, um, and so my thoughts revolved around manganese, uh, uh, this person, why he was there. Um, and so some of it is um, put into a poetry film and other parts are written as prose more as reference to kind of contextualize that film. So, but today, all I'm going to show is the poetry film. Um, I don't know whether I should talk much more about, I have been working with um, Helen Johnson in Brighton on uh, family history poetry films. And um, I'm working on a larger project called Trace, which is for poets and filmmakers to make works together on family history. Um, that's on the Liberated Words website, uh, which I'm co-direct, um, which is all about poetry film. Um, uh, I think then I can actually just play the film now. So I'll have a go. The compute, this sound may not be the best. Um, it's ideal if you have headphones. So. If you could, that would be great. If not, it doesn't really matter. So I'll just try and share my screen and go ahead with that. Um, let's just see. And share sound as well. Your so, screen is sharing, yes. Good, and I'll start playing now and hopefully good. you'll I am driven down, though limp from the shadow side, to the shepherd's hut by the lake, dug from springs for the farmer's son. A storm is coming, it is you, soul tossing and turning, compassing the leadening tool, buffeting the family stone circle. My system I slowly undoes to natural language, scanning ditch, stream, rock, ore, stardust to bone, stone to dust, shafts of rain descend, below the black hum of picks meet leaping manganese bison from Neanderthal caves. You rumble signs, windlass, prospector. See where the adit must cut, how deep the vein where a warm seam runs wet in a hoarfrost. Or fungus grows and blackened leaves hang from trees. Rising colander springs send messages, lift ore, Polished, rolling far, rough, falling close by, finding fist's pocket, rub stone. Finger to mouth, we taste silomelane, magic, dark, light, merlinite, wash in the jewel fire of pyrolusite that is both uplifted in glassmaker's hands, stained amethyst or liquid rose for chapel or brandished in clenched warrior fist, the hardest manganese steel. Which economics did you choose? Taming God or invincible sword for Spartan, Viking or Cornish king? Miner, iron smelter, maker of legends or dreams? 
You bang doors, but I push open windows, fix on the opaque spiking lake, a scrying soul conjuring fire from water. All my stones safe under the bed, like a healing madman tethered by the mystic veil. As you fall still against drying rain, uncanny under the druzy pond, brim shimmering. Thank you. Thank you. That's that's all from me. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sarah. So that leads us. Um, I think it's Helen Natras, if uh, if I'm right. No, sorry. Um, uh, Brian, what, what Brian Worley is coming up next. So Brian is standing there, so he's ready to go. So as soon as you start speaking, Brian, you'll be on. OK, right. I'm uh, a geomorphologist or a retired geomorphologist. And I'm now living in Sheffield, but a lot of the time in my former existence, I was teaching at Queen's University Belfast. And one of the things that's interested me in particular in getting concepts over to students is having a sense of, of history. So what I'm going to do now is actually talk a little bit about um, poems which include some geology, which are not necessarily uh, geological poems. And it's a bit lecture-like, I suppose, but, whoops, where are we? There we go. But you can see um, some of the material, and I've referred to some books, which you might be interested in. So the covers are on there. Okay, we, we start off actually with uh, Ben Bulban and William Butler Yeats and his grave below that. But as this is a, a Wordsworth year, I thought we'd start off with Wordsworth. And there are one or two books related to this, John White's book, Wordsworth and the Geologists. And uh, he brings in a number of uh, eminent geologists who started the Geological Society of London, William Buckland, Adam Sedgwick, William Hull, and George Bellis Greenoff. And I mentioned Jonathan Otley there, who is a, a swill maker and clock maker in Keswick, but taught Adam Sedgwick a lot, and that's not often realised. So Wordsworth had something to say about uh, geology, not always favourably, even though he had friends in the Geological Society of London. Uh, a book by Noah Hengman some time ago, Roman Romantic Rocks, and he looks at Wordsworth's poem, Resolution and Independence, sometimes known as the Leech Gatherer. Uh, but he's going in, as you see there, um, Heideggerian theory of poetry touches on similar themes. I'm not going to go in that direction at all, but we will touch some of the places uh, looked at Barshansky in terms of a, a geological sense of place. And I, got this book by Terry Eagleton not that long ago, How to Read a Poem, which is not so much how to read a poem, how to interpret a poem. And on the blurb, it says, uh, how does poetry differ from po prose? Um, is there a language peculiar to poetry? What do we mean by imagery? And it's that imagery one that I think is important in terms of creativity and imagination. And one of the things that I'm particularly interested in is how to read a landscape from a geomorphological point of view and, and how adding metadata onto a scene can interpret it uh, in, in a rather perhaps more meaningful way. So as soon as you know that this image here on the front of Terry Eagleton's book 
is called the Blue Pool, geologists will, and I suspect Patrick will immediately go and think of the Blue Pool and the Isle of Purbeck. And here's the eye geology map pointing to the Blue Pool. So as soon as you think of that, a geologist will be thinking of Purbeck Chalk, Jurassic Coast over to the, uh, to the right of the, and the east, bagshot beds and the heath and plants associated with that SSSI. So though the image looks Mediterranean, in fact, it has quite literally another worldly, a Purbeckian view on that particular lyric scene. And of course, some poets have been called nature poets and the geology of place. And these are almost left a trace in the, in the landscape through Popes in Winter Park, Conrad's Ode to a Trilobite, and of course, Arnold's Dover Beach. So you can interpret that in all sorts of different ways through Emily Dickinson and a number of Scottish poets, in particular, Norman Mackay, Shirley MacLean and Hugh McDiarmid and Edwin Morgan. And in particular, Edwin Morgan, I think is a, a very fine poet, the, the Macher, and I have in front of me uh, a signed book of Edwin Morgan's collected poems. And I'll refer to one of those later. So what I've called here landscape affinities, geology actually provides the landscape, the bare bones, the background on which pretty much everything is draped. The roads we drive on, what we see where our food comes from, how can we all incorporate these images and an imagination and in particular meaning? And I'm here concerned with geological meaning and linking into that. So we've already referred to the Lewisian and, and Ascent, and it was the geology of this landscape that became that was the bones of its beauty. So here's a poem. Uh, I'm not sure whether I should be reading these uh, at the moment, but anyway, um, you can read it for yourself in that extract. I'm just trying to just go back. But you immediately, I think, get the geologicalness yeah. of and his incorporation into that. Um, for those who are geologists and those who aren't, I would highly recommend uh, Mike Leader, who's retired cinematologist from, uh, from Leeds, and, and Joy Lawless book, Geo Britannica. In a number of the chapters, he uses headings, and this is a quote from Norman Nicholson's autobiographical Wednesday Early Closing. And that, you can read it here, in many respects, he's looking at a landscape which is now post-industrial. You can go to Hogbarrow and Millham and you will not see the ironworks and you have to know how to interpret the old limestone workings and the pits and so on in there. But Nicholson particularly refers back to Wordsworth and this is uh, part of a poem related to, to Dudden Bridge and of course there's uh, the Ode to the River doesn't buy Wordsworth. And the use of geological words like hematite, okay, he spells it with an A, we now tend not to, but nevertheless, his interpretation of landscapes is, I think, quite important in, from that point of view on the dismantling of Mill and Ironworks. That was his life actually being dismantled, though he was a teacher, not in, actually in the mild works. So we could say that Nicholson, in fact, is a, a precursor of what we might now think of as the Anthropocene movement. And I, I've listed a number of poems there. The figures in brackets are in the collected poems, the, the page numbers. But Leader and Lawler cite Nicholson a number of things. Um, the poem Beck, which I recited way back in 2011, John Sock meeting, Constant Flag and War. And uh, Harry's going to be talking a little bit more about the, the Seven Rocks later on. And I think that almost preeminently Norman Nicholson is a geologist poet in a whole variety of different ways. On the bottom right, you can see the old ironworks at, at Millen. So there is a plug for uh, the collected poems. But we can take the Anthropocene in all sorts of different ways. And Nicholson, I think, was there first with, with Elm Decline, where he refers to some of the flooding of the valleys in Cumbria, 
but that of course is continued in a number of places, in particular the Peak District and Central Wales, for water supplies to the big cities, Sheffield, Nottingham, Liverpool and Birmingham in particular. And here's a, a poem by Huel Griffiths, or part of it, called Cum Elan. So that's looking at the past landscape of the valley before the flooding and some of the happenings to the sedimentology subsequently. Hill also wrote that uh, in, in Welsh and uh, remember to learn the flooding of a valley and a township, small village, which almost initiated the, uh, the Welsh nationalist movement in the 1950s. Over that, on the bottom, you can see, remember Aberfan. And for people of my age, coming back from school and hearing about Aberfan is still a traumatic moment. And I should remember, remember that Tigre Toast, uh, sort of what you like, Daily Toast, a whole load of poems in Welsh about remembering Aberfan. So this isn't just an English language, it's also uh, a Welsh one and indeed a Gaelic one as well with some of the poets like Sorna MacLean. But I want to come a bit more up to date and look at Simon Armitage, in particular his stanza stones, and you can visit these stones, they're uh, very well worthwhile and there's a poetry trail that you can follow either in completeness, it's about uh, 50 kilometres long, or go from, uh, take a family walk up to these. Uh, Dew is particularly impressive. The trouble with Beck on the right hand side is that you can hardly read it any longer, and that's a great shame because those are, uh, th those are good poems obviously by uh, Simon Armitage in the geology and the environment in that particular environment of the upper Carboniferous. Uh, another Northern poet, Alan Peacock, he quotes my landscape then was to do with limestone, gritstone, water and sky. And I learned that stone was more than the geologist, artist or mountaineer saw. Okay, that's a good point of view. And in Stone Gods, he actually brings the geology, as it were, to life. The behavior of stone is time dependent. Under slow, constant pressure, it bends. The TV geologist showed us with a sheet of plastic, while under sudden pressure, it breaks. The plastic broke. And I think you can get a good view of the TV scene and some things that happen extremely slowly and under great pressure inside the earth with that behaviour of stone. Uh, the Nottinghamshire poet Mark Goodwin, who's also a rock climber, um, produced this in, in his Steps, published by Long Barrier Press, which is just down the lane from here in Sheffield. I'll let you read that. Of course, one of the problems about reading it yourself is that you don't get the timing right for what the poet actually wanted. But in his Rocker's Glass in the geology section, gritstone, and here we have basically, I was going to say a litany, it's not quite that, but what happens to the gritstone eroded from the mountain chains was deposited and on the right hand side you can see an outcrop uh, on the hills not far from here. The wealth of fragments deposited at Delta and Mouths later became our Pennines in Peak. In other words, he is actually incorporating the geology into the poet with, with a geological existence, which is what we tend to think of about how these rocks were formed. Particles of grit compacted, bonded hard, and patient weather set to work, and all the time on Earth. Okay, that's not literally true, but it's quite a long time to enable these rocks which were buried under all sorts of other subsequent sediments to produce the tors and gritstone edges that you see at the present time. Uh, Helen Mort's tribute to Alison Hargraves. When I make slow patterns on a route called name and loss, which is on the right, I am writing to you late afternoon and Stanage is a postcard to your loss stamped with a daytime move. 
and this starts to give the impression of the climber on the hard grit stone making moves above the assembled crowd. And this book by Donald Turville, Granite and Grit, I think is an interesting one, which gives you a good impression of the way people walk and climb on the mountains and hills of the British Isles. Richard Skelton's The Legacy of Ice, and we've already had references to, to glasses today, a kind of savage remixing, the very valley is an index of its last movement, each spur an extremity, a catalogue of resistance, which harks back to, to Ted Hughes in Remains of Elmet, death struggle of the glacier in large the long gullet of Calder, down which its corpse is vanished. And Helen Mort has a, I'm not sure it's been published yet, called The, the Glacier, which goes on this tradition of poets looking at the glaciers uh, and the landscapes of the British Isles. And Skelton also has this towards a lithical vocabulary, which is um, a concrete poem, or should I say geological poem of, of bits meant to look like a wall. Um, it's not the sort of wall that you would normally get in the countryside because of the variety of rocks there, but I think it gives the essence about the construction and that harks back to the concrete poem uh, that Patrick showed earlier on. So one of the things that I've been interested in, as you'll probably gather, is bringing images of science and poetry together using the present is the key to the past. And in particular, how can we bring the dynamics and kinematics and the materials, which are basically geological, in the poems together with the, the geology? And that's one of the things that I've been uh, interested with. So we start with this rather well, fearsome looking at this universal soil loss equation. Well, we'll go into that other than the fact that this is being constructed mainly for use in looking at soil erosion in the United States. And this is a rather fearsome looking equation to look at detachment rate of soil particles as raindrops hit them. And that leads to, to soil erosion, as you can see here on the left, the splash transport per unit with, in other words, trying to quantify what happens when raindrops fall what happens when the runoff takes material off the land. So this is basically a, a model, a generalization of a geomorphological process, but that geomorphological process has taken place over the millennia ever since land was eroded by water. In other words, this is almost one of the fundamental erosional processes. So how might we, we visualize this? Uh, and Drops started off as a, as a static concrete poem, but I suddenly realized not very long ago that we can add PowerPoint and make it a little bit more dynamic. So this is my attempt uh, to do that. So then we start with a universal soil loss equation and that gives you the different components of it. A drop of rain, in its fall from a thundercloud reaches its terminal velocity and finally will explode on soil. Millions of events like this wash soil off the land into the sea. Thank you. Okay. I just said that Hutton would, uh, that was exactly the process that Hutton observed, you know, with on his fields in the, uh, you know, at Haddington, the drops of rain, the water running down. So that's very nice. You've gone on to mute again, Brian. So I'm, we're going to pass to Marion now. Hello. Marion, yeah, there you are. Have you got me? Yeah, we got you. We got your full screen. Okay. Hello, I'm Marion Ashton and I'm in Woodall Spa, Lincolnshire, and it's lovely to be part of this event on National Poetry Day. 
Um, I'm a retired English teacher. I've always loved writing poems and it's great when they're accepted for publication. Uh, my link to geology is through my husband, Mike Ashton, and he's the one who presented me with the Joel Sock magazine, the page about um, Geo Poetry Day, <coughs> and he got me to send off some poems. He has informed me I'm not always totally correct geologically wise, but I assured him that is poetic license. Um, I'm just going to read three short poems. The first one is Releasing the Trilobite. It actually took place in the 1970s. We were students and Mike was doing field mapping as part of his degree. And we were in Southey, South Wales. I was ambling about or reading most of the time, but occasionally picked up a hammer as I did this time. And Mike was extremely impressed with the outcome. And you'll hear that in the poem. The second poem, Cool to the Touch, is about a part of an ammonite that is always here on my desk. I'm not sure where it came from, but I've had it for, for so long. And the third one comes from a day when we were traveling in central Texas. We stopped off at this place, um, a particular place, the Enchanted Rock. So here's the first poem. Releasing the Trilobite. I struck the siltstone, watched it split, release its secret, that ribbed rock creature, perfectly preserved, unseen since prehistory. Here on this hand, the spiny headed form, there its mirror image precisely impressed, inch long time lord, entombed for millennia, serendipitous gift from the god of the mountains. I'll attempt to show you it. There it is. And the next poem, Call to the Touch. It's to do the feel of it, call to the touch. It's weight, heavier than you'd think. The way it fits in my hand, fingers resting along the ribbing, thumb snug against the smooth end. Its colour, mottled silver grey like the underbelly of a seal. Ammonite, a million years old. Part of all this time with you, rock passion rubbing off on me. I picture it whole, coiled creature in the depths of the ocean, soft tendrils sifting seabed sand. If I can show you this, it's always next to me on the desk and it fits into my hand just so. And my final poem, Enchanted Rock. A massive pink whale emerges from the head of the Pedernales River in the heart of Texan Hills. A billion years of groaning through expansions and contractions, century after century of turning seasons, cracking and peeling, revealing layer on layer of crystalline granite. We make the ascent of foolhardy packed in blistering heat, wipe sweat from our brows, replace wet hats, gulp warm water, eye black vultures hovering overhead, to finally reach the summit, make those slow spins, Tonkin braves, monarchs of the green panorama, defending our shrine, seeking commitment, revelations and endurance in the glory of the sun. That's it. Many thanks to all the organizers. I've really enjoyed it so far. Thank you. Hello. You're up on, on screen. Am I up, Pat? Yes, you're up. Grand, thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, that was great, Marion. Um, when I saw this very rich and packed programme, I was going to dip in and out, I thought, because I'd just get...
and fatigue, but I've been following everything, so thank you. Um, my name's Helen Bowden. I'm a writer, editor, community educator and creative facilitator from Edinburgh with a Yorkshire accent. Um, I grew up in the Pennines. I stay beside the Pentlands and places like that, I think, are very much the kind of bedrock to my writing. Um, I'm going to read a new prose poem which has come out of the local lockdown exercise I was taking and just thinking how people have been talking about place identity today. Um, I think the underlying, this is very much about how the underlying geology determines the landscape and its social uses. Um, I'm not going to screen share, I'm just going to read it, but it's a it's a prose poem in, in four paragraphs. Um, and somebody, I'm, I'm now lo losing the thread, but somebody was uh, earlier made an interesting point about poetry and prose and the distinctions between them. And there's been a lot of prose poetry developed in the last few years. And I think they're a very good way about for incorporating science and place and lots of other things. So this is for um, a four piece prose poem um, set in a kind of grid formation and it's called Quadrille. Quadrille. One, geometric shelter belt. A rainless month, permitted exercise, right angling field boundaries at the village edge, a cracked and popular route, not a right of way through desire path tree belts, council designated sloping wooded farmland. 90 degrees, another field length, a distance down stepped along the rigs, drop from raised verge into ditch when someone's up ahead. In an isolation, par de deux, step aside, pause, step in, turn. Take sides across the incised channel of a modified watercourse. Power line, an elevated hypotenuse intersects overhead. High voltage cables graph for key diagonal to from the capital, the power grid, the national grid. Pylons plot a line for the hills across the axes of the shelter belt, the green belt, the central belt. Fire hazard grows. Two, lane. <clears throat> Take an evening turn. Five corners out to Dalmahoy Hill. On the dried muck path, climb through the wind up the igneous sill for the view beyond Lothian. Five corners back to the village. A long ploughed field site straight turn. Gorse verge above freshly audible river incision to help side turn. Down over the water of Leith across glacial meltwater flat, Cockburn Bridge up through Glenbrook, Broadleaf side turn. Along moss wall side, beach het side, fresh trout, fresh ploughed field side, growing lambs alongside, echo off the banquette steading wall, turn. Down, up, over the nameless burn, turn, larch side, John's burn. Possibly some names there that'll be a bit familiar to those who work at Heavy Watt. Three circumstance. Some grids are smaller. How can we measure how constrained, how limited we are in rooms, in gardens if we have them? Mind's triangular. What we learn are the perimeters of our worlds within the circumference of daily walking, the parameters of our interpretation of the guidelines. Streets below tenements don't have space for all the footfall around the block. In the peripheral, field bound, wood side, forest side, unpolluted broom, bloom time, with improving visibility across this moral gray area. How high, how far, how long is two? Four, the Coburn Leith Head Dance. Country lane discipline, swerve and greet, greet and swerve, judge and be judged by those who do not observe the passing protocols. Walking grasps the increase, decrease, increase of fear, blame, compliance of spring, which broad leaves are out and which are still in bud have yet to leave. The further up by the headwaters, the brighter the leaves. After the farm lane stop beyond the last corner that's a curve, 
forest starts. All terrain track describes a dusty earth parabola down to the riverside, swerves up to the moor. Fire risk increases. After two months of the out and back walks of evening turns, the lanes assume small island quiet. Ochinoon, Corston, Dalmahoy, Kames, Ravelrig, the sea cliffs of an imaginable coast. Thank you. I'm going to take a break now till half past, I believe, and I just suggest, as I've got the mic at the moment, go outside, take a few lungfuls of fresh air, have a stretch, see what you can smell and hear, and just absorb some of these richness and have some caffeine or alcohol or something and cake and come back. Loving this, thank you very much. <clears throat> Great. If you stop sharing the screen, I'll put the, yeah. Oh, great. I said, great. Helen, very happy, you know, because she's quite well known. Helen Bowden, she's quite well known. She's quite close, actually, so I'd love to meet up with her. And she's Patrick, an you have the audio on. She lives near the Pentlands, and she obviously knows Harry <laughs> Watt, because those are all the, that's the footpath. We Patrick, we can hear you talking about me. Uh, <laughs> um, so, Patrick. No, I don't think so. Patrick. She might teach it every Patrick, your audio is on.
Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back to GeoPoetry 2020 uh, for this next uh, next session. Uh, my name is Michael McKim, and I'm the geological. I'm a, the user services librarian at the Geological Society of London, um, as well as a poet. Um, I'd just like to say, first of all, what a fantastic day this has been. Um, it's really exciting to see the huge interest in geology and poetry. Um, a big thank you to Patrick uh, for organizing today, for really masterminding it all from the beginning. And I'd also like to thank my colleague, Becky Goddard, for all the work she's put into today as well. Um, my talk is in, the, is in the program as a keynote, but to call it a keynote is perhaps a little grand. Uh, so what I'd like to do is just give a bit of history of the Geological Society's involvement in geopoetry. Uh, first, where it started for us about 10 years ago with the first Geology and Poetry Day. And second, about five years ago, how we celebrated um, a big anniversary in the history of geology and how we used poetry to do that. Um, it has also been my own journey in geopoetry. I was a poet before I worked at the Geological Society and came there with no prior, prior knowledge of geology. Um, but working there has brought these two worlds together for me. Um, today's event is the follow-up to an earlier Geopoetry Day, which was held at the Geological Society in 2011, championed by the geologist Dr. Brian Lovell, as, as Pat has mentioned earlier. Uh, when he became president of the Geological Society in 2010, Brian proposed an event at which, quote, the best geological poetry, original or otherwise, be judged by literary celebrities at an evening of high culture with appropriate refreshment. Well, the evening of high culture soon turned into a full one day conference called Poetry and Geology, a celebration. Uh, many of those who attended are also taking part today. And it's wonderful to see how today's event builds on that earlier gathering. Um, but really, I think um, everyone would acknowledge today's event really expands on, on, on that day massively. Um, one of the main themes that came out of our 2011 meeting was the relationship between poetry, geology and climate change. Um, as Brian Lovell remarked at the event, um, I hope he doesn't mind me quoting him again. As Brian said after the event, I am a geologist, so I do nurse a practical hope that poetry will help to establish true environmental conviction where our scientific prose has failed us. We geologists will need every edge we can gain as the world glides into the Anthropocene. We've already had some brilliant responses today to geology and climate change and more to, more to come, I think. Um, I think that Brian's point has been absolutely proven in recent years in the language shift in the public imagination from climate change to climate crisis and climate emergency. I'm not saying that poetry did that, but Brian was right, the way we talk about these things matter, how the words that we use are essential, and that is what poetry is about. Uh, in 2012, I started to explore poetry's possibilities for addressing climate change in my own writing. I joined Brian on geology field trips, including to the Witch Farm oil field in Dorset, and I visited the eroding Holderness Coast in East Yorkshire with the Hull Geological Society. Uh, the result was a uh, collection, Fossil Sunshine. Um, I'd like to read a poem from Fossil Sunshine, um, which is from a sonnet sequence about the, the Cretaceous geology of Flamborough Head in, in Yorkshire. Um, this poem attempts to answer what Brian was calling for, which is to sort of do justice to the complexity of geological uh, language um, and the description of the rocks, um, as well as, I suppose, uh, you know, try for some sort of poetic revelation. Selix Bay. Like veins of fat in a hock of ham. Fault lines score down heaved chalk cliffs and across the thick shore platform. 
the flints are uniform and calcite clefts indicate the brachiated crush zone occurring to the south of the west-east latitude of tectonic disturbance. It's highly complex to say the least, but there's a rhythm in the chalk, soft and harder beds, nodules, wispy marls, alternating flints, regular as clocks that mark a record of Cretaceous cycles, the whole Earth's orbit accurately ranged. These frequencies a pacemaker for change. And I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, in, hopefully you can see the map. Uh, in 2015, the Geological Society marked the 200th anniversary of the publication of William Smith's delineation of the strata of England and Wales with part of Scotland. Uh, it's the first geological map of a country and it's published in 1815. I don't have time here to go into detail about Smith's life and achievements, but I will put in the chat later a link to our online exhibition uh, curated by our archivist Caroline Lamb for those who would like to find out more. Uh, to mark the anniversary of the map, I commissioned over 30 poets to write. I commissioned over 30 poets to write new poems in response to the map, uh, Smith's life or the science of geology. Um, I was thrilled by their generosity and enthusiasm and the different routes uh, their poems took. Uh, it was published in an anthology um, called Map, Poems After William Smith's Geological Map of 1815. One of the things that struck me in sort of reading the poems and commissioning this is that when most of us look at a map, we look for home and the places that we know. Um, but I've, what I like about geological maps is the colours on a geological map make us see home in a radically different light. And so the poems in the anthology, I do believe, confront the reader with new ways of seeing the landscape and history of Britain. Um, I'll read a poem from Matt, which is the first poem in the, in the anthology, and it's by the poet Maura Dooley. This is Maura's poem, Treasure Island. Like skinning a rabbit, what's revealed, like skinning a rabbit, revealed beneath the old familiar form is the raw shock of shape rude shades of life, a startling blue and rose and the creamy ochre of a jutting jagged backbone, exposed with everything falling from it to the softer limbs of valley, marsh and meadow, or the naked blades of upland, scarp and moor. Like oil and a puddle, both muted and glinting, the colours have settled now, and no matter the bleach and batter of sunlight, damp, the slow turning of years, paper folding in on itself in awkward formation. What's charted here in new translation is the perfect record of truth's imagination. I think that Maury's last line here, the perfect record of truth's imagination, speaks to the coming together of geology and poetry. As a poet, what draws me to geology is its power to see what's no longer there, or isn't there yet. It maps what is hidden from view. It is fundamentally a scientific research for a scientific search for truth, but has always also needed vision and imagination. I wonder, is it this shared investment in truth and imagination that brings poets and geologists together today? Um, I've looked a little to the past today, as geologists and poets often do, but it's wonderful to see that so much interest and in work on geology and poetry is, is going on today in 2020. And that so many new projects are happening and poems being written, it's, re it's really, really exciting. Um, so here's to the next year of Poetry Day. Um, Alison Hallett, who is next in, the pro in today's programme, uh, was, was a speaker at the first Poetry and Geology Day in 2011 
and she also has two poems in map uh, so she has sort of, she has been on this on this journey uh, journey with me as well um, I'm really looking forward to hearing Alison's used poems uh, so it's an absolute pleasure to hand over to Alison Hallett Thank you, Michael. Uh, can everyone hear me? Um, my name's Alison and I'm delighted to be here today launching a new book, Tilted Ground. Uh, but before I do that, I would like to thank the organizers of the day, uh, the Geology Society, Pat Corbett, uh, Becky, who's been working away behind the scenes, and of course, Brian Lovell uh, for starting all this off um, a good few years ago. I've been working with stones for quite a long time. I run a project called the Migration Habits of Stones. Uh, but today I'm here to read some poems from a new book that came from a residency that I had at the Lyle Center at Heriot Watt University last November. The residency was dreamed up by Pat Corbett and it was quite an extraordinary week. Uh, so just five days, I was asked to respond to the heritage of the university, mental health, geology, and we also had a wonderful field trip to Kokodi in Fife. The one uh, requirement was that I write three poems, but I found that I just started exploding after the first couple of days and I was waking up in the middle of the night with poems pressing through. I'd be sitting eating my breakfast and a line would appear. And so in a way, I think that it was, it was a kind of possession and it led to this book, Tilted Ground. So I would also like to thank all the people who supported the making of this book. Uh, it's a limited edition. And also to thank Colin Sackett who came up with the wonderfully kind of simple design for the cover. So I'm gonna share my screen and read six poems. Some of the images uh, relate to the poems, some of them don't, um, but they're from the week that I spent on the residency. And I'm gonna finish with a song, uh, which will be pleased to hear isn't being sung by me, but my dear friend, Mary Lawson, the soprano. Uh, we've had a little collaboration and put one of the poems in the book to music. I'm gonna start with a poem from the heritage section in the book, Heritage Tour. Straight lines, circles, deeper, shallower, all directions at once. The ghosts of Harriet Watt University float in the air like ships without anchors. Here a building, there a building, everywhere a. Sitting on the top deck of a bus at the end of Chambers Street, Pat says, we could be in one of the old lecture theaters sitting here. But I'm in a bus, I want to say, I'm in a bus. Keep up, the road shivers and slips in a coat of rain as demolished buildings build themselves up again. Pat searches the pavement by the museum for a fossilized river fish, believed extinct until someone found it in the sea off Malaysia. Shapeshifter, fresh to saline shifter, and Scotland, relieved of the weight of its ice cap, still rising bit by bit while England sinks. Almost impossible to think the solid ground is lifting. And yet, and yet, it is. While I was on the campus, uh, I was taken to see rock cores. I'd never seen cores before. 
uh, I was taken to the cause store. It was what, one of the two times in the year when the cores are taken out. And uh, I, I think it's safe to say that I fell in love with these rock cores, these nine meter cores that took me so deep into the earth. And um, I was very generously hosted there by uh, Andy, Dr. Andy Gardner and Helen Lieber. And I'm always very concerned about placing humans uh, inside of the whole debate of nature. We're, we're often separate from it. But I, I like to locate human beings within the continuum. And I asked them to do something for me uh, while I was in there. This is my second cause poem. I asked Helen and Andy to lie down at the end of one of the rows of rock samples. I have been warbling on about humans in the continuum, the need to show we're part of nature and not separate from it. In Guadalajara, I watched a woman ice my name onto a chocolate skull. It was sweet and awful. The day of the dead, I could and couldn't eat it. They lie on the tables and smile and fold their arms. And even though we don't talk about femurs and fibias dissolving in silt, we know without doubt that's what we're not talking about. One of the things that I find delicious about a residency uh, is being able to meet so many people who have a different language to me, who study different things. There's just so much to learn and so many conversations to be had. And one of the things that I was rather baffled by to begin with was when I went to a lecture on carbon storage and everyone was talking about a reservoir. And I've always understood a reservoir as a place where water is stored and there are ducks and people sail model boats. Uh, but of course, this was a, a deep underground reservoir um, where we're talking about the porosity in rock and how to store carbon in that porous rock. So this uh, next poem is called a poet attends a lecture on carbon storage at the Sleipner Reservoir. She listened for as long as she could, a mile or so of listening, letting the words sink into her body, her eyes distracted by the lecturer's firefly pointer that flitted from image to image. Two men at the back of the room spoke loudly and a question formed in her mind. An egg building in size and pressure. She put up her hand, aware that she was not a scientist, not trained in matters of geology and pollution. How do we know we can store carbon inside the earth for a million years. There was a silence, then laughter, then silence again. Pat took a photo at precisely the moment she asked the question. Or perhaps it was the second after, when the lecturer stood quietly, his two hands pressed together in front of his chest, as if he was praying. When I was on the residency, it was, it was the end of November, and uh, this is the time of year when my father died. And I find that these anniversaries of death, uh, they kind of, they just run through my body at, at that time of year. So I'll read this, this poem from a day when we were on the field trip in Kirkcaldy. Two herons. 
Two herons flew over, two herons flew. The first slewed a wide angled bend, the second curved tighter. Two herons flew over, two herons sedimented to arcs of gray and cloudless blue. The first threw open its coat, the second dropped a dot of white. Two herons flew over, two herons flew. Not the hunched heron I saw the day my father died, but two well-dressed tornadoes on leave from the other side. When I got back to Bath, uh, where I live, um, I found something in the pocket of my skirt that I'd worn on the day that we made the field trip to Kirkcaldy. Uh, this is called The Lily in the Stone. Friday morning, I find a tiny pebble stashed in the right hand pocket of my skirt. And remember that Pat gave it to me at the end of the field trip to Kirkcaldy Beach. I run my finger over a line of raised white ridges. Crinoid, I say, then stem of a sea lily. It's good to find it again, to remember the day on the beach and how some plants outlast pyramids. I wonder what odds the bookies would give of a Paleozoic lily meeting a human in the Anthropocene. And later, soaking in the bath, six words come again and again, like a mantra or a chant. Praise be for random, synchronous complexity. And I'm going to finish with the song, which is sung by Mary Lawson. The song is called Friday. And I think this probably came after Andy invited me to taste one of the samples in the core store uh, so that I could assess its texture with my tongue. I'd, I'm not sure I'd ever eaten a rock like that before. This is Friday. Thank you to Mary for singing this and thank you to everyone for listening. She dissolved into rock, the fine quartz grains grazed against her skin as they dug their way deeper into the reservoir of her body. Yellow, the fossilized river swam to life inside her. When morning came, she poured herself into her shoes and Thank you. I'll now hand over to Helen. Mm. 
Good afternoon everybody, it's Helen Natras here. I'm speaking to you from Canterbury, Kent. It's a strange path that's brought me here to this conference today. I suppose it began in the late 60s at the Bar Convent Grammar School, York, in the English classes of Sister Margaret Mary Alacock. As a 13 year old, she taught our class poetry, how to write poetry for a whole year. She taught us everything. She taught us about poetic form, use of language, assonant, rhyme. She taught us about sonnets, haikus, free verse, concrete poetry, and we had to write it all for homework as well. Moving on, I studied geology at Imperial College Royal School of Mines in the 1970s. When I think of People who taught me that almost sounds like a poem itself, like George Walker on zeolite, DJ Carter, DFC, on chalk microfossil zoning, Doug Shearman on sabkas. And following that, I spent 40 years in the construction industry doing tunneling and deep basements and all that sort of stuff, that interface between structures and the ground, trying to keep things like um, ground risk under control for big hitting property developers who want to know why their programs got behind. Well, I run, and running in parallel with that, I had this huge music life going on as well, string quartet, orchestra, harpsichord lessons, all that sort of thing. And I decided I had enough of the building site. I'm not doing it anymore. I've had enough of the field of battle. And I retired at the age of 60 thinking, that I would have this whopping massive music life, but it wasn't to be. Hearing loss, be it huge chunks out of my music life and I was devastated. And that feeling was what took me through the door of Canterbury Public Library to Victoria Fields writing for Wellbeing Group. So I'm going to sh share my screen with you now. Being well. No. Here we go. So I'm going to talk to you about writing for well-being and how we've fed geopoetics and geological themes into that from time to time. So what is writing for well-being? It's associated with the movement for bibliotherapy, which is a movement which seeks to use poetry and literature for therapeutic purposes. It can help to facilitate psychological growth and healing. It can reframe difficult life events and aid anxiety and problems with anger and depression. It can help people to express inner conflicts. But writing for well-being is creative. And it's in the moment and it's now. Now, this is where our group meets. Canterbury Public Library's rather grandiose pseudo-Gothic 19th century facade. And behind it, a modern extension, and we meet in a nice modern room there, or well, we did until COVID, but more about that later. And our group began as a spin-off from, Can Canterbury had a literature festival called the Wise Words Festival. And out of that grew Victoria Fields Group meeting in the library supported by Kent Libraries and Registry and Archives Department. And it's a two hour drop-in session on a Friday afternoon. It's not a literary criticism group. It's not a psychiatric therapy group, but it's a group where trust and confidentiality and self-monitoring of what we write is important. It's a safe forum. And perhaps a, a word about sort of containment is, is appropriate. It's it, it, this idea of containment. 
It's this session is contained in time. You have to write now. It's not homework. Um, it's in a room. It's contained in a room. It's contained in a way by a moderator, such as Victoria, or our small group of moderators who've taken over from her now. And it's a, a forum in which people can access their emotions, but in a sense contain them as well. They can approach them because they're contained. And you have to write, it is now, it's not homework. So what do we do? Well, we have the first hour begins just by saying hello to people because it's a drop-in session. We might know some people and some people just come through the door. And we have to remind people of our ground rules about confidentiality. And immediately, without hanging about, we start on a six minute free write. And free write means that the person who's in the chair will give you a word or a phrase. They just write like mad. It's crazy. You just write, 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 write for six minutes and you go stop. And it's always a surprise what comes out there. And then we have a bit of a feedback, a discussion, what came up for you. And then we invite people perhaps for 10 minutes to rework some of the material and, and then read it out. And reading it out is an invitation. It's not an obligation. And if you write something that's a bit personal, that's fine. You just keep it to yourself. Or if you write something that you think might be too upsetting to read out for the group, it's fine. You just keep it to yourself. And so in our a second session, we move on to a poem, which Victoria in the past or one of us now will have chosen. And when we're together, we read it aloud in the group, each person taking perhaps a stanza or a line. And if it's a short poem, we might go around the group you know, it, quite, quite a number of times with, um, that we might have heard it maybe three times by the time we get to the end, or it's a long poem, we might have to go around the group three times to get to the end of it. And after that, we might ask people briefly to, what did you, how did you find the poem? What did it evoke? And then quickly we ask people to write something arising from the poem. And we might give them a lead, maybe a line, a reply to the author. Somebody once wrote a really dreadful reply to William Wordsworth's Daffodils. Well, I think they, they told him they thought it wasn't really very good. Um, and then after that, we have, again, an invitation to read our material to the group. And then perhaps a thought to take away for the week, maybe a, a favourite line for the poem or some, uh, some little nice thing you're going to do for yourself. So in that context, how do we get geopoetry into there? Well, you can't do it every week. So from time to time, I choose a poem that I find with geological or perhaps environmental themes from maybe geopoetry websites or pointers I get from there. And many people have absolutely no idea about the structure and the history of the earth. So they find some of these quite interesting. And during the writing, the discussion that arises is often quite interesting. And through that, you can perhaps promote a bit of sort of subtle education, but at the same time, give some people perhaps some deeper ideas, which they can incorporate into their writing. And some of the discussions we've had are sort of really wide ranging. I mean, you can imagine, Kent, we're in the middle of the chalk. So the chalk, microfossils, stratigraphy, and sensitivity to small environmental changes, very topical. Climate change, you know, we get massive flooding now, but the things like um, greenhouse and all greenhouse gases and ice ages, a lot of people don't know the earth has had five or six of those already. Natural disasters, why do you have tsunamis, why are earthquakes where they are? The end of the world, that's a really big one. Is it the extinction of Homo sapiens or when the sun dies? And then extinctions, we're in one now, a minor extinction event. Drivers for extinctions, survivors, stepover species. And the idea that Homo sapiens is not really that adaptable compared to animals like fishes, rodents, corals, arthropods, ocean vent fauna, you know, we're, we're nowhere compared to those. 
So I'm going to read you now a few poems that have come out of our group. And the first one is by me. So this is homage to Sister Margaret Mary. You can see it straight away. It's a haiku. So this is a pandemic haiku. To live through an extinction event is horribly fascinating. The next one is by Julie. Julie Frith is a retired mental, mental health nurse. She spent all her working life in mental hospitals. And she is one of the people who helps me to lead the group now. So here we are. As confident as a rock, those granite edges softened by the battering of the sea. Would that I were softened, but life's battering has sharpened me. Climate change. This is me in the Pacific Ocean. Atoll haiku. Coral Island, I stand by your coral cliff, witness to higher seas. And here we've got, we had jewels recently, jewellery as a prompt. And I remembered when I'd been in Patagonia with on a field trip, and we found some, we saw some gem quality epidote. So I'm writing, mantle plume, jewels birth passage from earth's belly, flawless epidote. And to finish with, I'll read you one by Patricia Bowler. She's a lady in her 80s and she had a rather disrupted childhood through evacuation and the, the sort of aftermath of World War II. But she's a really plucky person and she did a degree in psychology later in life. And she just walked in through the door one day. And this is one of her poems. Jewels. Mythical and mystical. Mysterious and beautiful. Stones torn from the earth, taken then hammered, chiselled, filed and battered, made to fit with style and mood of the time, worn now by women and girls, where once such strength was male adornment. And these are some organisations who promote bibliotherapy. And I'd like to finish by telling you that although our group can't meet in person now, we still meet every week using email and WhatsApp. And we've got six months worth of writing from the lockdown and we're hoping to publish a book. So thank you for listening and I hope you found that informative. Okay, so it's over to Andrew, uh, if you're out there, Andrew. Been waking patiently all day, I think. <laughs> Slightly tired, but doing well. Okay, I'm doing that. My camera's on, there we go, that's good. Great, uh, super. Good afternoon to all of you in the UK. Good morning to those of you on this side of the Atlantic and good day to everyone else around the world. My name is Andy Abraham. I'm in Toronto in Canada, and I am so honored to be a part of this wonderful event on National Poet Day. Uh, today, I'm gonna to share three poems. The first is a tribute to what we geologists regard as an essential part of our field equipment. I'm now going to hopefully share my screen. And I'll stop the video. So my camera's off, hopefully. Share video. Field boots. On incredible journeys, they have taken me, exploring the vast range of our world's environments, seasons, and geology. Through muskeg, stream, and the complex, sometimes painful crisscross of old burn. 
along wet tropical trails winding through seemingly impenetrable dark green forests, over scorched desert sands, creating a shifting quartz cover over the rocks I sought to identify. Across windswept grasses and lichen-covered crags of the Arctic tundra, and up mountain passes and down steep gulches requiring careful footing. They've experienced spring's dew-covered mornings and softened in the oppressive humidity of summer's heat waves. Grown heavy in torrential rains, welcomed the Christmas of fall and somehow survived the shocking cold of winter. Having traversed the geologic column, they have touched ancient volcanic arcs and laid upon the exhumed roots of mountain chains. Stood upon pre-existing oceans that teemed with Earth's early life and on the fossilized remains of the first great forests. Walked along preserved slices of ocean floor high above sea level and navigated mine workings a thousand meters below. They felt strata from the age of dinosaurs, sensed movement of glaciers in striae formed during the last ice age and endured the heat of recent lava. Traveled the hallways of geochronology labs and straddled the unconformity at Sicker Point that changed our understanding of time. They have trodden on the waste from many minds and carried the imprint of human activity affecting our planet. Rock worn and bush scuffed, protecting and propelling, still carrying the sense of soils long past and memories of outcrops visited. Now with laces limp and frayed and collar worn, they that accompanied me on many adventures and carried me for miles they still upon the garage floor. And now I'm going to go on my second poem is, uh, is actually going to be about, it's, a, it's actually accompanying a piece of art that I've done, a portrait and it's named Fossil. If a fossil I could be, which one would you like to see? A foram or a graptolite? Maybe pollen from a tree? Those are important indicators of environments long ago. They're interesting choices, but ones many would not know. Should I take a coral's form that had felt the tides go by, or the bones of a dinosaur? Now that'll surely catch your eye. Instead, I'll pick an aminoid, nature's masterpiece of design, preserved by quartz and calcite with a spiral so sublime. And my last poem is again with some of my artwork and in time, maybe a little bit too soon for uh, Halloween, but here goes, petrified. A dark force from within Earth's core seeps through crevice, fault and pore. Its unseen fingers dendritically stalk through rocks and beds of sand and chalk. Nothing resists its transforming goal. When your life ends, it takes control attacking with its aqueous knife, destroying cells that gave you life, dissolving each part with cruel relish, supplanting you and all who perish, changing you from flesh and bone to something formed in cold, hard stone, altering your chemistry, left fossilized, no longer free. I wish to thank all of you. It's been an amazing day so far and there's still plenty to go ahead. I'm, as I said, I'm really honored to be here and 
I hope you enjoyed that and uh, look forward to the rest of this event. Thank you. Go ahead, Sarah. Good afternoon. Everybody can hear me properly? I think, yeah, you're yeah. fine. You're fine. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm going to share my screen now. I hope you are seeing my slides. Well, uh, my name is Sila and I lived in Scotland for a while. That's where I met Patrick and he told me about the, the Geo Poetry Day like maybe three years ago. So I was really excited to participate and be here today. So thank you, That's, it's a real honor. Uh, as you can see here, I consider myself a geologist, not so much a poet, <laughs> I'm trying. And um, well, I've, I've, uh, I've come with a slightly different approach to the Geopoetry Day, as lately I'm changing from geologist to teacher of science in a more general way. And I thought poetry could be a really nice way to actually teach geology. Especially, especially in a bilingual context, as in Spain, sometimes I am lucky enough to, to, to teach um, students that have to learn science both in English and Spanish. So I started writing some kind of haikus, uh, geological haikus, and then I thought of this theme of the possibility of using them as a tool for teaching. So. The first thing is for those of you, I mean, probably most of you know more about haikus than me. <laughs> As I said, I'm a geologist. But then um, I'm just going to tell you quite quickly what a haiku is in a very general way. Uh, a haiku is just a, a one kind of poetry that is traditionally Japanese. And there are many translations. This one is from, from Wikipedia, actually. And usually they are about nature and they talk about seasons, animals. So I thought it was a nice format to use in geology. Uh, this is a translation, but uh, one of the things about haikus is that they are quite brief. So uh, when they try to, to translate them respecting the original structure, uh, one of the possibilities is to keep them with a five syllables, seven, five structure, so five, seven, five. That's what I think uh, it was a good teaching tool because it's quite short. You force the students to write a very short thing that has a very strict format. And it's about nature, season. So putting geology in the mix sounds like a likely thing to do. Um, how could you use haikus in geo teaching? Well, you could use them for describing elements, geological elements, any kind, uh, geological processes, which increases the difficulty because you need to understand the process before putting it in such few words. You could actually play with them, offer them haikus already written and pair up with pictures of, of the depositional environment, for example, or the phenomena, the geological phenomenon. Uh, you can actually make them guess each other's uh, topic reading by reading the haikus written by the partner. So you could actually do many things with this. Uh, what kind of advantages this would present so from a didactic point of view? Well, first of all, you are improving the, their language skills. And I'm not just talking about a bilingual class here, but just a geology class anywhere. Uh, you force them to develop nice summarizing skills because you have to describe something that may take a whole book in just three sentences, quite short. It requires a good understanding of the topic and, and control of the vocabulary, the scientific terms they need to use in the haiku. And it's a good way to introduce them to poetry. So this uh, nice links with uh, what Norman was talking about geopoetics, like giving them a different view of the world, introducing poetry, uh, science all together as a way of teaching and as a way of making them more creative and, and making like making poetry closer to them, let's say. Uh, so I think, I believe it would be a useful tool, not just for geology teachers, but also for all those poets in residence which uh, participate in uh, schools, uh, developing their activities. So it could be a nice way of, of doing transdisciplinary activities. I think. 
Uh, one thing I have to remark about trying to do this geo haiku activity in a bilingual teaching context, I'm referring especially to Spanish English, because I don't know if I said it, but I'm from Spain and I'm actually talking right now in Spain. And uh, in Spanish, words and sentences are usually much longer than in English. So for example, this would be the previous poem, the previous haiku. In English, you have five, seven, five syllables. In Spanish, you need 10 syllables to say the same thing, nine and six. So this exercise for a Spanish student who needs to write in English is a very nice piece of work. So that's what I thought it was interesting. Uh, uh, what, what are the advantages of using it in a bilingual context? Well, it's applicable to all levels because you can simplify the language as much as you need. Uh, it promotes, as I said before, the use of scientific terms. Uh, it requires accuracy. You need to select the right word for the right thing. Uh, of course, even if it's a very short format, it requires a good grammar control and you can easily reinforce learning with images. So, uh, as I said, I kind of wrote myself 12 geo haikus and tried to make, uh, to, to make them in a way that it, it, they made sense from a geological point of view. So, as I am a sedimentologist, uh, what I did was, okay, if I had to teach students about how the sediment is born uh, in the source area, surface weathering, dissolution, erosion, goes down the mountain to lower areas, to transportation by water, ice, wind, and then gets deposited or precipitated in different sedimentary environments, depositional environments, how can I translate that into poetry? So that's where I, that's where I came, with, came up with the idea of the 12 geo haikus. And I called the whole set, birth, life, and death of sediment. I'm not going to show all of them because I am aware we are a bit tight on time, but I will read some of them. So before that, just to mention, how did I select uh, the theme for each geo haiku? Well, I looked at this figure basically and thought, okay, I will try to follow a path, a natural path from mountain area through river, wetland, lake, pond, uh, delta area, coastal area, including the beach, shelf, talus, and the, the bottom, the sea bottom. So I was trying to follow a scientific, uh, let's say, direction through the poems. So the first haiku, well, I'll try to read it, doing my best, but I'm not a very good poetry reader. <laughs> I chose the picture because I think it relates to what I'm saying in the haiku, so that's another didactic thing you can do no, to, to relate the pictures with the haiku. So I'm going to read the first one. Drop by drop rain falls, wind, ice, sun, and exposure. Sediment is born. With this haiku, I wanted to refer to the weathering, material, uh, the erosion, and how the sediment forms in the upper areas of the mountains. Uh, I'm skipping the second one, talking about braided rivers, and I'm going for uh, the formation precipitation of carbonate in caves or in tufa rivers. Murmur of water, white leaf petrified in time, calcareous plant. As you can see, I'm trying to reinforce with images of petrified leaves and fill pictures, basically, to increase engagement. Geo haiku four would be about the river, uh, probably a Mandarin river, and I will read it now. Flood plain, flat and rich, water serpent slithering. At the end, the sea. And I'm skipping the intermediate ones because I don't have so much time, but I have reunited here three haikus. Uh, it would be easier to just use a different kind of picture, but because they were the last ones, I chose a more kind of uh, down, uh, dusk image. But you could use here an image about the beach, which is basically the shelf, which is your haiku 10. This would correspond to the turbidites forming in the talus, and the last one to the sea bottom. So I'm going to read the three of them. Your haiku 10, 
sunbeams shining through red corals in clear water, flat depth, shallow sea. Geohaiku 11, corresponding to the talus. Debris on steep slope, broken starfish, cracked seashells, turbulent mark flow. And the last one would be Geohaiku 12, about the sea bottom. Silent clay settles, a calm, deep destination, end and beginning. So as you see, this is a proposal to use poetry as a way of teaching geology and also applicable to a bilingual context. So, well, uh, the haikus were intended to be real haikus. I know it's quite far from the, the typical haiku theme, but I thought it was a nice way to, to try and use poetry in the, in the geology teaching environment. So thank you very much. And thank you for allowing me to be here because it's, it's been an amazing day and I'm really enjoying it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sila. Am I here? You are here. <laughs> okay. My, my name is Alice Major, um, and I'm joining you here from Edmonton, Alberta, Western Canada. I am uh, here on Treaty 6 territory, which is a region that has been inhabited by Indigenous peoples for perhaps 14,000 years. I'm going to read you just one poem today. But first, I want to give you a sense of the landscape and geology that inspired it and have inspired a lot of my work. So if I may, I'm going to start sh sharing my screen. All right. This is what you can see from a viewpoint just west of Edmonton city downtown, this bowl of Aspen parkland. It's a landscape that has been shaped by glaciation. If you were here beside me, you'd be standing on what was the bed of Glacial Lake Edmonton, which formed at the end of the Wisconsin glaciation. You can't see it from here, but down in that valley is the river that made it. At that point, the river, which had been blocked by the ice sheets, resumed its easterly flow towards Hudson's Bay. And in the process, it began carving down through the lacustrine clay, through the layers of glacial till below that, down to the Cretaceous sandstone, which is the bedrock in our region. This is the North Saskatchewan River, 3,000 kilometers end to end its water flows. Here in Edmonton, we've got about 18 bridges across it. The one on the right here is the one that carries our subway system. And if you walked across that bridge and turned upstream, you'd come to this path down towards one of the lowest benches of the riverbank. And here you can see layers recording floods that have deposited mud and silt on the wide floodplain. And one particular layer, which is a band of ash from the enormous explosion of Mount Mazana, 1,500 kilometers away and 6,800 years ago. It's that white groove towards the bottom of the stack. The ash blanketed the floodplain, other floods followed and laid down their own deposits. But up close, you can see quite clearly the ash layer and you can scrape its fine dust out with your fingernail. The river has gone on cutting its path downward, shaping its valley, 
of accidentally exposing the memorials of the history of the region that are also somehow personal. And now I'd like to read my poem, Mazama Ash. Mourners, we hold our funerals beside the river. Memories of flood stack the valley wall below the bridge that bears the subway shuttling on and on, bank to bank. Mud layers, thick on coarse, thick as coarse on coarse of brick. They build a mausoleum of routine catastrophes. Interrupted by a pale discontinuity, a line of ash that clings fine and gray to fingers. Diaspora of dust from a ruptured mountain that scattered this funeral pall millennia ago. A penumbra dropped across the sun, a time when all should have stopped, but carried on. Thank you so much. That's from a collection called uh, The Occupied World, um, which happens to be my most geological book. It's been a wonderful to be part of this. Uh, thanks to all the presenters and especially to the organizers. And now I guess we get a 10 minute break. We do better than that. We have uh... A break, I think, until 4.55, if I'm correct, when Ken Coburn will come back. Ah, so, there we go. So uh, 4.55, so we've actually got a 25-minute break. So I think that's nice because we've had so many beautiful things. And Alice, your, your voice carries beautifully across the pond, you know, across that golden pond almost. I uh, really appreciate that, the images uh, and the you know, the pointing out that, you know, to see you put your nice clean hands in that dirty ash layer, you <laughs> know, um, that was beautiful. So thank you very much. And we'll see everybody uh, with Ken at five, five to five for our last session. Thank you very much, everybody.
Yeah. <laughs> Alice, you're already still on.
Okay. Let's work. So, you want to join?
Nice to see you there, Ken. You ready to go in a couple of minutes? Ready to go when, uh, yep. Yeah. Everybody's back, as it were. Give people a couple of minutes to come back for this last session. Yep, yep. We'll see who's still standing. We've, you know, we've been somewhere between 100 and 120 all day long, so. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, it's great. <laughs> it's uh, it's uh, double what we would have had in that in the poetry library. Mm. So that's great. Yeah, no, great having people beaming in from, from all over. Real sense of connection. Isn't technology amazing? Yeah, it has its, it has its benefits, definitely. Shall I just get started, Pat? Absolutely. Yeah, I think uh, it's time by my watch. Great. Um, well, welcome back, everyone. Uh, my name is Ken Coburn, and I'm speaking to you from Edinburgh this afternoon. Um, great to be here. Great to, to be with people in such a wide uh, variety of places, um, talking about such a wide variety of, of subjects, um, all connected by geology. Um, I'm going to be um, talking about Edinburgh, um, reading some poems and a piece of prose by a poet um, about Edinburgh. So I'm just going to go into um, screen share mode to do that. So um, I'm a poet. Um, I lived in Edinburgh for um, 30 years and I run Edinburgh Poetry Tours, walks with poems in the old town of Edinburgh. And it was on one of these walks a couple of years ago that I met Pat. And uh, at the end of it, he said, uh, there's actually quite a lot of geology in those poems, you know. And it hadn't really struck me before, but um, all cities are determined by their geography and their Geo underlying geology. In Edinburgh, it's perhaps more evident than in other places. Um, sorry, I'm pausing. I'm trying to get my machine to go onto the next image and it's not doing it. So let me try, um, let me try again. There we go. And um, yes, Edinburgh, the the underlying geology is very obvious. Um, this is a picture taken from Edinburgh Castle, looking over the city towards Salisbury Crags, um, that cliff that you can see there, and uh, the hilltop of Arthur's Seat um, beyond that, very much in central Edinburgh. The church spire you can see on the left of the image, in fact, there's a, a second and a third beyond it. That forms the line of 
what's now called the Royal Mile, the four streets that made up um, the old town of Edinburgh, Castle Hill, Lawn Market, High Street and Canongate. And that's the area up where I tend to lead the, the walks. I'm going to read a poem by a contemporary poet called uh, Valerie Gillis, um, just called To Edinburgh, where she talks about the, the crag and tail, the rock that um, Edinburgh Castle is built on and the tail beyond it. Um, the rock is a volcanic plug. And when the glacier um, came along past it, it, um, it couldn't move. Uh, the, that, that volcanic rock, but it left uh, a long, narrow hill uh, beyond it, um, one of the defining features um, of, of Edinburgh. I'm just going to, while I read the poem, I'm just going to show this map, an old map of Edinburgh, showing the castle on the left-hand side, that long street on the tail beyond it with the Holyrood Palace, and the abbey at the bottom. To Edinburgh. Stone above storms, you rear upon the ridge. We live on your back, its crag and tail. Spires and tenements stacked on your spine. The castle and the palace linked by one rope. A spatchcock town, the rib cage split open like a skelly a kipper, a gutted haddie. We wander through your windy mazes. All our voices are flags on the high street. From the sky's edge to the grey firth, we are the city, you are within us. Each crooked close and wind is a busy cut on the crowded mile that takes us home in Eden, Edinburgh, centred on the rock, our city with your seven hills and heavens. So the town is a bit like, uh, a, bit like a kipper as well, the, the backbone of the fish and all these little closes and wines, as they were called, the little streets going off, uh, which you can see visually there on that map. I'm going to read a piece of uh, prose now by um, the English poet Samuel Taylor Coleridge. He spent about 24 hours in Edinburgh at the end of a long walking tour of the Highlands. Um, and he was pretty exhausted when he came to Edinburgh and really quite keen to get back to um, Cumbria, where his friend Robert Southey was waiting for him. But, but he wrote a wonderfully descriptive letter um, to Southey from Edinburgh describing the city. Um, he starts the letter saying, there are about four things worth going into Scotland for, to one who has been in Cumberland and Westmoreland. The view of all the islands at the foot of Loch Lomond from the top of the highest island called Inchdevenock. Two, the Trossachs at the foot of Loch Catron. Three, the Edinburgh, sorry, the chamber and antechamber of the Falls of Foyers. Fourth and lastly, the city of Edinburgh. So Coleridge is seeing the city as a, a kind of natural phenomenon. And it was the, particularly the height of the, the buildings that so impressed him. Edinburgh um, stuck to um, that small area around the castle principally for reasons of defence. Um, and so in, in order to get more people in a small space, the buildings were built very high. Um, he compares them, uh, or he uses the phrase, a Brobdignag spoon in this letter. And Brobdignag was the land of the giants in Gulliver's travels. He writes, what a wonderful city Edinburgh is. What alternation of height and depth. A city looked at in the polished back of a Brobdignag spoon held lengthways, so enormously stretched up are the houses. When I first looked down on it, as the coach drove in on the higher street, I cannot express what I felt. 
such a section of a wasp's nest striking you with a sort of bastard sublimity from the enormity and infinity of its littleness. The infinity swelling out of the mind, the enormity striking it with wonder. I think I have seen an old plate of Montserrat that struck me with the same feeling, and I am sure I have seen huge quarries of lime or freestone in which the shafts or strata have stood perpendicularly instead of horizontally with the same high thin slices and corresponding inter interstices. I have no idea if that's the plate that Coleridge saw, but I think you get the idea of uh, the impression that the buildings of Edinburgh made on him. I'm going to read a poem um, of my own now, uh, Close. Um, close means a, a small passageway running off the main street. And this was written really as a, a reflection on Edinburgh's history. Um, flesh market close named for the, the flesh market, the butchers that were there. Um, but the poem itself has become a historical document now as well. It refers to newspaper men. Um, and at the time I wrote the poem, the, the Scotsman newspaper was published in a, a huge building, uh, the bottom of which formed the lower part of Flesh Market Close. Um, and the poem describes waiting for a bus uh, there as well, and the area is mainly pedestrianised. And I wanted to read it just because the, the last line of it, um, where the airy bridges touch the high street rock, sums up um, the, the two parts of Edinburgh, the old town and the new town, and the way in cities that we have to ground ourselves on the, the bedrock that's there, but our imaginations uh, bridge that in new and imaginative ways. I am, I've made a little film of this, which I'm going to show. Um, I'm going to turn the volume up full, but it's slightly quiet. So for the duration, uh, you may want to um, turn the volume up. The view here is looking up the high street. Um, the spire there is St Giles. And if you kept going, you would come to uh, Edinburgh Castle. Sorry, I'm just trying to get my cursor back. The poem is in the, the pack if you want to have another look at it. Oops. Um, and that's an image just to give you an idea of um, the old town in the background built on the rock and North Bridge uh, that the bus goes down, kind of floating in, uh, in, in the air there. Um, I've got one more poem um, and we're going to go down to the foot of the mile for this. This is a poem about the new Scottish Parliament building uh, opened in October 2004. And this, this is an image made in concrete on the side of the building itself. It's a kind of plan 
uh, or sketch really of the, the parliament, the, the boat-like shapes in the middle of the image are the main buildings, they're, they're, they're connected, um, though you can't see that in this in the sketch. Um, and then it's a bit like a body really, they're the, the, the head and the shoulders of it, and then the torso and the legs uh, moving down um, are areas called the garden tails that, that reach towards uh, Holyrood Park and Salisbury Crags. But you can see from that just the difference in the shape of the buildings of the Parliament and the more square um, right angled uh, shapes of the buildings uh, around it. The poem is by um, James Robertson, uh, well known as a novelist, um, but also a poet. It's called The Vision of Enrique Morales. Enrique Morales was the uh, Catalan architect who designed the parliament. Um, he died uh, during its construction in the year 2000, so he never saw it completed. But he thought very carefully about the location of the building, um, wanting it to be to fit both in its locale, but also to have the scale of a national building. This is a photograph of it taken from the New Calton burial ground on the side of Calton Hill. You can see the slope there of Salisbury Crags and Arthur's seat above it. And the parliament is the building in the middle uh, there with the curved roof. Um, again, I'm going to play a little film of this. Um, the sound in this is a bit better. So um, hopefully you won't need to turn up your volume again for this one. The Vision of Enrique Morales by James Robertson. A subtle game of views and implications is what I play. Once Edinburgh was this, a mountain and some buildings, synthesis of human and geological formations. What we create must fit with what's on hand, cut through the old town's grain and yet enhance be mindful of the past and yet advance. A parliament that sits within the land, a gathering where land and people meet. The land itself will be a building block. To me, this is of greatest consequence. The parliament will grow from Arthur's seat, a bridge between the city and the rock, a mirror of the land it represents. So thank you very much. I'm going to finish there. Um, there's poems um, of Edinburgh at uh, my website, um, edinburghpoetrytours.co.uk, uh, the close poem and um, some extracts from the Coleridge uh, letter are in the, the pack. Uh, I'm just going to stop share. And I'm going to hand over now to, I think it's Harry Wally who is uh, speaking next. So. Thank you. Right, there's a lot of buttons to click all at once doing this, isn't there? Uh, thank you very much, Ken. I'm also um, in Edinburgh and I'm a composer. Uh, I've written some, some poetry, but um, music is where my field lies. Uh, and I'm also the son of a glacial geomorphologist and a fellow panel member who spoke earlier, Brian. So my talk is about uh, a commission from the Norman, Norman Nicholson Society uh, to write some music about uh, and in response to his suite of poems, Seven Rocks. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about that and play some extracts and then um, talk a little bit more about um, ideas of interpretation and how that's led on to some other projects that are geologically related. So broadly speaking I think when you're trying to uh, take a scientific subject 
and represent it in an artistic form, there's a balancing act to, to do. Um, sometimes we read about pieces like, uh, I don't know, putting a, a note value to uh, a, a letter name in a DNA strand and then somehow listening to DNA. And it's so representational that it actually misses the essence of what DNA is. You know, the, the structure of the du double helix uh, and the way it divides and um, these sorts of uh, coded features of the, uh, the DNA RNA might be a, somewhere that, 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 that is further towards the real meaning of it, even if it's slightly less representational. And on the other side, sometimes people uh, sort of go into past sort of metaphors and into metaphysics and talk cross purposes. And I think there's a sweet spot in the middle. Um, and that's where I'm in, in this work I'm trying to be, but it's a hard balance and sometimes maybe it's easy to fall one side or the other. One of the things that really appealed to me about Norma Nicholson was that it feels like a poetics of description. Um, there's a lot of beauty in the structure of the, the, the words and the verse. And as a, as a musician, I'm often listening to the cadences of the spoken word. But there's also a real honesty about it. I mean, uh, Seven Rocks uh, is written, uh, laid out in the order of their geological formation. And that just kind of feels like the right way to have done it. Uh, so it's deeply connected to the, um, to the sort of the truth of the matter, if you like. So it was commissioned by uh, Norman Nicholson Society. Uh, the first performance was three of the four quartet members. So there's actually two versions of it. I've been lucky to have it performed um, in various places uh, and by various ensembles. Um, there, there's only a couple of good recordings. So um, I'll, I'll glaze over some of the sections that are uh, you know, for the sake of, of time and for that reason too. So Nicholson starts the poem with a sort of preface, which is actually a, a quote from Dante's Inferno. And that slide I had about, uh, if I go back to it, this um, I sort of network graph. Every time a, you know, that Dante's Inferno um, tells you something, about his approach, it's it's a reference to whole air, another area of this sort of network of con concepts, um, and it also tells you something about the layers and the digging down and all sorts of things. So the first section, school of slate, um, I'll play a section of, um, and here I really had two pictures. Um, one was this. Um, the process of how slate is formed. Um, and the other was the feel of slate itself. I've done some rock climbing and been unfortunate enough to have done some quarry climbing. Um, and so you get quite intimate with both the coldness of the slate and the sh real sharpness of slate edges. <laughs> that I used were a lot of it involves water which has come up a lot today and how it shapes, uh, shapes the landscape these little mountain streams and the sort of fractal nature of that um, in, in this section I was quite inspired by some of the rhythms uh, in the poem <laughs>
I have lost my screen sharing. I should go back. Um, yeah, we're still seeing you now, but you're not in uh, show mode. Yeah. Did, um, the chat panel came up, and then everything went wrong. So let me try again. Okay. Yeah, bad luck. <laughs> this is um, um. Okay, I don't. Next link. Share. If somebody can signal whether it is or isn't working. Um. Yeah, at the moment you're still in um, preview mode. Sorry, sorry about that. Yeah, that's it. In coal, uh, Maryport coal, the, um, the the process of compression, uh, this is towards the, the more representational sort of level that I was uh, alluding to earlier. So it's a repeated motif, uh, and you can hear the process of compression. Compositions. The, the uh, uh, notes at the top are the directions to the musicians, uh, which includes a musical term and then one related to the, the structure of the geology. This led to um, a residency at the Bank Centre in uh, Alberta, um, where I had a, a cabin uh, and gave myself the task of trying to think about how long geological timescales might be represented in music, because uh, music as an art form uh, exists in time. Uh, so I, I ended up uh, coinciding with a, the Mountain Writers um, residency and uh, met Helen Mort, um, who encouraged me, because I was struggling with this almost impossible task, to write it in words or um, a poem. 
so I, I did that, and I think I'll probably just about have time to, to do this before uh, the next speaker. Water over time. Spindrift falls as secondary snow. A playful afterthought, now sitting patiently waiting for the sun to remove its crystalline structure. A memory of what it was like to flow would have to wait. Instead, the sun goes down. It is winter's turn. Almost unaware of the mo movement, despite its magnitude, compressing, cracking and refracting in glacial time, emitting a unique hue to nobody. Playing a game with entropy, the goal to return to water. Meanwhile, the moraine in anticipation waits, but the journey is disparate. And while it's lifted up on a colossal shard, the reality of the situation unfolds. It is the ice that moves the mountain. At last, a sudden liquid gasp. A droplet, a stream, a river, a fjord, the horizon. In a sacrifice of identity, if not death, so forgive life. Surface tension, broken and refound, first carried by wind, then through Gaia herself to fire, moving continents like a shadow play, or a slow dance, with metronome set to the constant turning of the stars. A great rhythmic complexity, evident in the grooves of the mountain that play an ancient song. Slow your heart. Slower. Slower still. Slower until. And uh, I'll leave it there for the next speaker. So thank you very much. Um, it's been a real ple pleasure and a privilege to uh, join people and so many people from Edinburgh virtually. It would be nice to meet in person around Salisbury Crags or similar someday. Thank you. Hello. Hope you can hear me. Yeah, you're good to go, Nia. Thank you. Um, I'm Nia Davis. I'm a, a poet. Um, I'm currently I'm currently in the middle of um, researching ritual and poetry, and I've kind of deep in that and, and trying to surface. Um, so it's very um, it's very beautiful to come up and um, to share something with you here. Um, I'm going to make this these poems, ritual poems, in that I'm going to um, dedicate them to the geologists uh, and uh, invoke the geologists um, to my aid um, because um, geology has always been with me. My father was um, is a retired geologist. Uh, he's now a karate teacher, uh, but for most of my childhood, he worked offshore on oil rigs. So. Um, Geology has always been with me, and um, I was fascinated by the idea of the oil rig. It just existed in my imagination as this um, fascinating place where all these things happened. Um, I actually had no idea what that was. I wanted to visit the oil rig, um, and later, you know, it was also the tension that the oil rig was a very dangerous place, um, and the oil rig also extracted. Uh, carbon which then led to um, that being burnt up and led to lots of problems. So there's lots of actual tensions in my mind around what geology is um, and so that couldn't help but inform the poetry. So uh, I am going to share a load of poems which um, I'm flashing in and out because I've got in the background um, the oil rig because I always wanted to go to the oil rig and I've now got it in the background here um, but instead of um, I'm going to just share my screen briefly and show you So here's uh, my father drilling in Australia, and next one should be him in the oil rig in the North Sea oil fields. And then I'm gonna take off the weird background now. 
There we go. So, um, so I've also brought some uh, some objects to share. Um, I can stop this. These are my totem objects for the ritual that's going to progress now. This is a piece of slag from the Copperworks um, in Swansea, where I live. This has been um, created from the, um, the huge compacting of different kind of uh, processes that went into making copper. Uh, so this, I keep this on my desk as my scholar's rock. Um, my other virtual objects are this ammonite and um, my first attempt at oil painting from lockdown. So I hope those things are gonna be my score to guide me through the poems here. So I've mashed up um, three different poems, four different poems from um, different times uh, in my poetry writing history. And so some of the stuff in here is really old. Um, I wanted to do that because it kind of felt like geological time um, is sort of opening up as this extremely fascinating strata. Early on, um, there was a talk by Neil Hodgson. I really enjoyed that. Um, he's sort of thinking about how um, these layers of uh, geology, geology um, can show, show us the kind of history of uh, huge epochs in time that we can't even imagine. Uh, but there's also missing, um, missing records um, where we don't know, you know, we don't know what happened. And this um, different idea of time, I also think this may be a sort of poetic time um, and ritual time. Um, so that's my next, uh, that might be my next project summing out of today. So thanks very much for um, bringing us all together to, to be in this weird moment together. So the poems. Oil rig gift shop. The gifts are listed. Records, sham, rough, teddy in overalls, early trolls, old t-shirts, oil rig snow globe, fairy tales in Norwegian. Two weeks on, two weeks off. Offshore, onshore, offshore, onshore, offshore, onshore, onshore, offshore, onshore, offshore, offshore onshore, offshore, this ingrained pattern. An Aberdeen psilocybin moving through the stealth of Friday nights, a pattern so tight that each anticipation hurts. Oil rig exotic, roughneck, occidental, log jam ethic, yeah, so it is, mug logger, two weak friction, put my hand against, put my hand against, Ocean Nomad. Um, and a little bit of Charles Olson's poem in the middle, which kind of inspired me to think about this. This is from Charles Olson's I Maxima, uh, Maximus of Gloucester to you. Offshore by islands hidden in the blood, jewels and miracles, I Maximus a metal hot from boiling water, tell you what is a lance, who obeys the figures of the present dance. So, Ocean Nomad, this is a very old poem. <laughs> On the super sickness of the open, I wanted to go home to the steel islands. Petro geo shifters adrift on North's flexion, its compass, its treeless decks. Ocean nomad unbilicized to the wells until the derrick hands unleash her on her buoyant ribs. Ocean nomad assembled Trusfic from this 1975, ghost yard of oil boilers and steel riggers, birthplace of endurance and other Antarctic scoopers, of killers, the Jason, the Pelican, the Frey. Ocean nomads still drilling Kells Staffer Field with three mud pumps. Ocean nomad, semi-sub driller, a 
and distributor of long wearing embroidered crew t-shirts, daggy red frayed collar, pelagic sun bleach. Ocean nomad sitting 12 hours with a tray of sandy sludge. Smells and lights, long awake arms, musk of helicopter, taxi jet, a t-shirt, 12 years of amber grease, 12 days bound for home, for home's tepid bath, home's awakened mess. A poetics on diamonds. Think of a diamond body. The diamond body is a light body and the rainbow body, a multiple body, the most sacred body, the subtle body, the blood body of bliss. I can tell you how it affects its this hard edges are useful. I can learn how to cradle the diamond body, this spacious cut surface. When I was a child, I had a book that explained the oil rig. In the book was a diagram of the drill. The drill had spirals of diamonds corkscrewed around it. The picture showed the diamonds had been cut in order to cut. The diamond is selected to drill the ocean floor because it is the hardest substance in the world. The diamond is not just an adornment, it is the hardest extractor. It is a mineral to find the other minerals to burn up and change the minerals, the minerals forever. A crumple in this, a toxicity report, grapple, breath, was only surfaces, licks, the inner intimate, extimate. When I invoke, I swell, middle seas ripple, and that's the life for me. Mere seas, slight juncture this way, that way, I swell, that's the life for me, functioning. Mm. Lost. I've lost the end of the poem to leave you with the diamond body. The final bit of poetry um, is <laughs> all that oil, oil field trash. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to um, read finally a bit of poem which actually draws on another geo poets maybe um, as well as Charles Olson we've got David Jones um, the Anathemata is um, a book that I've been reading for uh, two three years I still haven't finished um, so I've got some poems that kind of work with that um, so in the Anathemata David Jones tries to kind of um, get into the geological time of the British Isles um, and goes back to some really early history, um, so sort of lithic movements. Super pellist stalled in crystalos from the gospel side choir all the Boreal Scholar, that's David. That's the kind of thing we're dealing with, David Jones. A wing ago, I took five mountains to break, now it's three. My salts take the plastic of the earth, now they are salts now, because I ingested the plastic and the salt. I ingested the plastic and the salt of the table. It is 5,000 things ago. It is the ache of 2013, a special species of before, a special species of aftermath. Think what a score, a ritual score for the riches of David Jones's lithic movement would be or a score for the drastic measures of 2018, score for a sea trout versus uh, a score for a river trout, score for artifacts, David's rosy made thing, a thing we constructed into being via the tongue. For those whose works follow them, every heap of myself, one day or two expressos, 
and two wines or two eggs, usually two eggs, very rarely one egg. The points of the day, Hemera, David would say, because he can't just use an ordinary word like day, dia, dies, dwinod. All of Hemera's hips and elbows and nose, these would be the ritual structure, its determined points. I set about my lithic movements. I set about David's anathemata like an unexpected downpour in the south of Karnataka, near the border with Tamil Nadu, near the Calvary, near the Tibetan refugee villages, between each village, their language and wild tamarind. So on Jupiter's work day, do my works follow me? These special humid paradises of the third age by David David Jones. Now we are in the fourth age. Apologies in the delay in responding to your email. Crustaceous carbon emissions, abandoned dream diaries, recycled chutney jar, now full of ritual water, scar talk. I just made this, I made just made this heap of all I could find. And now the time is for the funeral games of the greater Mammalia. So thank you to David Jones, Charles Olson and all the geologists. You're ready to go, Poker Swedges. Okay, hi. Hi, everybody. We are Poker Swedges. We're an acoustic musical duo from Chesterfield in Derbyshire. Tell them about the dancing. Mm, dancing? I don't know anything about dancing. So my name's Dave. I'm a geologist at the Department of Engineering, who hiss at the University of Glasgow, and this is my mate, Kev. I've got no geological credentials whatsoever. Um, I come from Johnston near Paisley in the west of Scotland, and I just happened to sing a wee bit. We're going to try and sing two or three songs for you today. Two of them are about the water that you find in flooded coal mines, because that's a lot of what I work with at the moment. Um, the first one is called Vigo Lane, and it's about a folk character called Elsie Marley, after whom a very well-known folk tune is written. But it turned out that she ran a pub near Chesterley Street in County Durham, and she met a very sad end by drowning in a flooded coal mine. So this song is about Elsie Marley. About Berkeley Town, under the sign of the swan, lived a gentle barwoman by the name of Alice Marley. From noon till late at night, by day and by lantern light, brass of ale and scram to bite from the hand of Alice Marley. As the swan does love the water clear, and man does love good ale and beer. All oh, did love this woman dear, the lovely Elsie Marley. Now Marley's end was a handsome sight, till the roving Dutch passed by to fight, and to subdue the Jacobite, and they shot the swan to pieces. But Ralph and Elsie respect no fate, they kept the swan with the children eight, till the year of 1768, when Elsie Marley sickened. As the swan does love the water clear, that flows from the fells in the time and the weir, as man does love the amber beer, all loved Elsie Marley. I tell the news and tell it plain She's been found dead down by Vigo Lane She's in a coal pit fallen down Into the ochre water And tell the news to Geordie and Jane The fearful news from Vigo Lane Elsie Marley, she is slain Drowned in the ochre water As the swan does love the water clear 
that fills the pits down by the weed. As Amanda's love the ochre beer, all loved Elsie Molly. Now Elsie drinks the blood red water, for the coal has taken Harrison's daughter. Drink ochre ale and coal black porter in a toast to Elsie Molly. From Biker Hill to Walker Shore, we'll, we'll call your lads forevermore. We'll dance a jig, we'll rant and roar to the tune of Elsie Molly. From Biker Hill to Walker Shore, we'll, we'll call your lads forevermore. We'll dance a jig, we'll rant and roar to the tune of Elsie Molly. From Biker Hill to Walker Shore, where we'll call your lads forevermore. We'll dance a jig, we'll rant and roar to the tune of Elsie Molly. Tune of Elsie Molly. Tune of Elsie Molly. Tune of Elsie Molly. Second song we are going today is going to do today is inspired by the classic American novel by John Williams, Stoner. Um, it does contain some geological metaphors, I should say, hence um, hence the reason for it. That's our excuse for singing it anyway. It's a fantastic book, highly recommended. <laughs> You were turned up in some farmer's field By the curve of the plow Thrown out of your furrow Into day and snow All grit and clay and calcite Shaped by wind and rain Worn down by abrasion of words passing through your brain There is no sign in the desert telling you what to wear There's no one there beside you You run on pure instinct And you wage your wars for the long haul Against your wife and peers You don't show much emotion And you don't show any fear Stoner Stoner You see why some folks doubt You're a man that's built a flesh and bone Stoner, stoner, you see why some folks ask if there's anybody home, and inside every heart of stone, a residue of summer heat. Insulated by the snows of winter and the pounding of all those feet. A tiny spark of fission from some decay of a nucleide. A glow of love and lust and kindness. Find some place, some place to hide. And given the run of many years, the stone will wash away and disaggregate its hardened self to a bed of common clay. Inertia versus entropy, we know who wins in the end. You hardly try to fight it, you just welcome that old friend Stoner Stoner 
You see why some folks doubt You're a man that's built of flesh and bone Stoner Stoner You see why some folks ask If there's anybody home At all at all is there anybody So if we've got time, we're going to sing one final song, which is another song about mine water. And of course, a lot of technology, the steam engine and so on was, you know, it kind of evolved out of the need to pump groundwater out of flooded mines. But if you look far enough back in the literature, you find that there's all sorts of weird and wonderful ways before the steam engine that they managed to pump water out of mines. They used windmills and water mills and all sorts of weird stuff. And there was a particular person from Lancashire who was an expert at designing these wind and water powered mechanisms for getting water out of mines. And we don't know his name, apart from the fact that he went by the name of the mechanical priest of Lancashire. We can only assume he was some kind of vicar who was interested in engineering. But that's the title of our final song, which is called The Mechanical Priest of Lancashire. The year is 1708, the ships are our new gods. Sent from heaven to spare the peasant from turning up the saw. They mill our grain, they pump the rain that seeps down into Hades. And not the between, they need a man to keep. It's dry. The Earl and Bar, the Lairds of Fife, have all sent out the cry. Oh, the man with no name, a mythical fame, and no small skill with the ladies. And from Rossendale to Rochdale, he keeps the coal mines drier. Than they've ever been on Rother or Tyne, and the water comes no higher. And ordained by the priest, a mechanical priest, the priest of Lancashire. Oh, oh, oh. It is like a spell or wonder work to drain the blood from our faces. His wheels they run in the quickening vex, his mills on the high places. They take the strain and they pump the rain that seeps down into Hades. And from Macrington to Darwin, he keeps the coal mines drier than they've ever been on the Rother or Tyne, and the water comes no higher. And ordained by the priest, the mechanical priest, the priest of Lancashire. Oh, oh, oh. Well, that cheated Tom New Covenant and that infernal Scot. That sorcerer's apprentice by the name of young James Watts. From near to far, Dudley to Elsicar, they have brought our priest to naught. And from Macrington to Darwin, he keeps the coal mines drier than they've ever been on the Rother or Tyne, and the water comes no higher. And ordained by the priest, 
the mechanical priest, the priest of Lancashire. And from Rossendale to Rochdale, he keeps the coal mines drier than they've ever been on the Rother or Tyne, and the water comes no higher. Grand ordained by the priest, the mechanical priest, the priest of Lancashire. Oh, oh, oh. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I hope the sound was all right. We struggled a lot with it, but there we go. Bye. It was great. Everybody was loving that. And you'll see the comments. Everybody heard that brilliantly. Thanks, guys. So it's over to John. OK, Patrick, have I pressed the right thing? You are. You're on the screen. OK. Um, this is a drawing in because I haven't got I don't know how to do sharing screens. So I think to lift this up, got a bit more of a basic system in. Got a little thing there. It's a picture here. Of, this is, so this is when it's when it's pass, um, which is in Derbyshire, um, and this is a drawing I did. Um, with, um, yeah, that's the pass, which I visited when I was fifteen on a geography field 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 trip. I've got two pieces about that. The first is a short poem about an imagined combination of the gr grassy slopes of Winnet's Pass with, with its ocean bottom prehistory. Deep sheep. The other one's a bit more serious. Um, so this is called Blue John Way, which is the name, um, a name I gave to Winnet's Pass. And it's about bringing home some um, Blue John for my mum and I, th I don't think you can take Blue John from when it's past now but at the time this is a long time ago I think it was okay well, we didn't we weren't told it wasn't and we just went up in the evening and just went foraging around and found this Blue this blue John um, and so this is about Blue John and Blue John Way I found it on a field trip up in Derbyshire lying loose along a side of Winnet's Pass, with its veins of blue and arteries of yellow. I gave it to my mum, that little something from the school trip, and she looked at it and thought it was a class item from up Blue John Way. This little lump of fluorite, we can't say how it evolved. I've read that crystal lattice dislocation may have been involved. Did the Romans like to polish such a pretty bit of England to mingle in the forum in some style in the early Permian period? Blue John, it was hot stuff for a while. In the furnace of creation, it was quite a conflagration, but every constellation will cool down. It's all cold, old rock when it cools down. Cold old rockers, maybe still my mother put that semi-precious baby from above the upper, upper mantle on the mantelpiece, our piece of the earth's crust. It was worth taking down and dusting every Friday afternoon with the doily underneath it too. The sun that you dressed up in blue brought it home to you from up blue, John Way. Um, and there's a draw, I've drawn a drawing here of me, but Pat, Patrick, tell me if I need to bring it in closer. Uh, so there's me holding the blue, John. That's fine. Mom. And um, there's a, I've written a, a little caption for this. I thought a bit of blue, John, would go down well. My mum was quite mineral minded. What with her getting me to do that etching on a piece of slate, sprinkling iron filings all over the floor and marrying a diamond, a small one. Um, so the Winnet's Pass 
uh, it was surprising to me to find out that it was immersed in water at one time. I think you, you hear some of these things, these geological things, um, but the fact that having walked on it, to, to, to hear that it was covered at one time uh, in water was just an incredible thing. And I'm, uh, in the pack is mentioned um, John Keats's poem to Ailsa Rock, and I'm just going to read a few lines from it because he speaks about that rock um, being immersed in water. Hearken, thou craggy ocean pyramid. Give answer from thy voice, the sea fowl screams. When were thy shoulders mantled in huge streams? When from the sun was thy broad forehead hid? How longest since the mighty power bid thee have an airy sleep from fathom? Sorry, I got that last line wrong. How longest since the mighty power bid thee heave to airy sleep? from Fathom Dreams. Um, and so there's some other poems in there relating to Ailsa Rock, but I'm gonna go on now um, to a piece about Francis, uh, Florence ba Bascom. Um, so I had a chance to, obviously like many of us have had, we've had a chance to research geological things. And uh, I found uh, this um, woman geologist, her, her years 1862 to 1945, and there's, for anybody interested, there's a, there's a very good uh, uh, podcast uh, on her on a website called STEM, STEM Fatale. It's an American uh, site. So this is for Florence Bascom. At university, they put me behind a screen, for I was not to be seen by the studying men. Was this, I be, was this because I was such a blinding distraction? Or was I an unfortunate fact to be kept from the fiction of a superior fact-finding gender? Anyway, day in and out, I was put in doubt behind that screen, hidden, but not pretender. For whose discovery was it that local cycles of erosion were not the suggested two or three, but at least nine? Yep, it was mine in spite of the persistence of the efforts to erode my existence. So when I went to university myself, um, I mean, I'd, I've always had an interest in science. Um, I did biology. I got the same grade in biology as I got at A-level in English. Um, I, I, I wrote a poem about amoeba. Um, you don't have to have a partner to start a family. You can divide by mitosis. You don't need meiosis or any help from me. Um, so I carried on my interest into, in science into university and did a, a module on my first year at Bradford University called the, dif, uh, called the Difference Between Truth and Adequacy. Jack Morell, our excellent nature of scientific activity tutor, explained that with scientific theories, near is sometimes close enough. He gave the example of a law of which science had been sure, which had been obeyed unquestioningly since it was made, but which was later discovered to ignore certain variables. Sometimes what is seen as objective fact is in fact only a rough guide which does the job of ordering rather than describing reality. Applying this idea to what is printed here, adequacy might say, it's there in black and white. Whereas I think the truth would rather cite two shades of gray of which one's extremely light. So Jack Morrell, um, thanks to him, fantastic teacher. Uh, later on, we're going to have um, a piece by WH Auden and talking about his boyhood love uh, of limestone and when I was a lad, I used to go up to the chalk pit. And this is a song about that. Um, OK, Geo Poetry, let's rock. Uh, 
I don't know who it was took me the first time up to see it But I do know that it wasn't a girl I reckon I was nine and I took a shine To the bald raw face of the world Sitting in the chalk pit I felt I was at home in it The second time I went back a little while later With a blue sky I went up alone there was solitude and quiet and the chalk face dazzle and I clawed my way to the top from the rubble at the bottom and I had a bit of trouble but I did it and I went home with the chalk under my skin and underneath me fingernails. The linger of the chalk pit. I was in the world and look it was a bit of it. The third time, this was quite a few years later, the data was now different. There was such a lot of grass that had grown. No more sign of the shine and the dazzle. And I had a bit of a moan. But who was it back at the front of the classroom, clearing off the chalk with the felt face rubber, the chalk face rubber? Who was I to talk about the compromise of calcification? Um, so we move on now to um, this picture here. And this is a picture that was done by Roger Jones. And I think I'm going to try and hold this up while I do it, because I just saw this at the weekend. Um, and I wrote, being, and having got very geology minded of late, I wrote, can you see it? All right, Pat. We, we can see it. That's great. We can see you as well. Okay. Jeff. It's called Apple of My Eye by Roger Jones. With their delineating threads of white around them, the blues, the red, the turquoise and the pink. It's a bit geologically mapped like this, I think. There are black sections for marking out the deepnesses, the chasms and their night. There is an area of blues smack in the middle where you cannot tell where one bit starts and one more is beginning. But that's all right, in my eyes. Not fast, nor hard or border fixed a celebration of the element of mixture. So um, really this is what, to me, this is, we're having today is a celebration of mixture, a mixture of poetry, um, mixture of many things, mixture, we had a, a long, a lovely long talk about workshop techniques earlier on. And I think the mix has been beyond um, what one expected and, um, I, I, I won't ever look at Arthur's seat again uh, after I heard the phrase bas basalt intrusion. I, I'd never heard, heard that before. And um, Neil Hodgson talking about a silent library of strata, which is such a beautiful um, way of expressing that. Um, so we have the, we have the, uh, the, the caption contest, um, which is uh, to find a caption for that drawing there. And uh, uh, there's a, the prize is um, a, a drawing of um, Florence, uh, Florence Bascom there, um, which, which uh, I'll, I'll, the winner can say what their, what their favourite rock is. And I'll, I'll uh, put that in there and in the dog's mouth there. The dog looks a bit like it's got a potato, um, but obviously Florence doesn't because it's too big. OK, uh, I think we're on to my last piece before we go on to um, W.H. Auden. And this is called Core Valued. Um, and I'm going to move on to this instrument. So what's the score with our planet's core? So far below the Rocky Mountain skin. Enormous quantities of iron gold and nickel without it it's a pickle we'd be in all right 
For at the core is found the source of the Earth's magnetic force, which ensures the vital ozone shield won't yield to solar blowing. Without this dead hot bullseye at the center to sustain, solar wind would have its rise. Eighteen hundred miles of distance down. Way beyond the distance we can grapple with and bore The outer and the inner and the inner inner spinner of the core The planet, like its people, has its deep down precious elements A hidden and perpetuating part a little along the lines of the heart of an apple. I think that's 15 minutes, Patrick. Excellent. So I, I guess you're going to take over the reins of introducing In Praise of Limestone. Um, OK. Uh, we were asked by Nick Walton, who was one of the Joel Sock board, to include you know, the most famous poem about geology. And he said that's In Praise of Limestone. And so I thought it would be a good idea if we just read part of that. I put it in the document that's there, but I thought it would be a good idea if we asked John to, um, to read that. And then, you know, maybe I could come back uh, with a little bit of some thought about that uh, as, a, as a geologist. In other words, a response to that. So, yeah. John, would you, uh, and would, you, would you start by reading that? Yeah. Okay. Um, I did a, I did do a drawing of W H Auden, um, but that's um, that's him in Iceland in volcanic terrain, so that's not applicable here. Um, so this is in praise of limestone. Just the first uh, the first part of it. Um, it. It's it's a very lovely. I, I I hadn't I had read this once before, but because I've been asked, and this is one of the wonderful things you've you've made us concentrate, bring our focus in on things, and I'm very grateful in praise of limestone. <clears throat> if it form the one landscape that we, the inconstant ones, are consistently homesick for, this is chiefly because it dissolves in water. Mark these rounded slopes with their surface fragrance of time and beneath a secret system of caves and conduits. Here, the springs that spurt out everywhere with a chuckle, each filling a private pool for its fish and carving its own little ravine whose cliffs entertained the butterfly and the lizard. Examine this region of short distances and definite places. What could be more like mother or a fitter background for her son, the flirtatious male who lounges against a rock in the sunlight, never doubting that for all his faults he is loved, whose works are but extensions of his power to charm. Hmm? From weathered outcrop to hilltop temple, from appearing waters to conspicuous fountains, from a wild to a formal vineyard, are ingenious but short steps that a child's wish to receive more attention than his brother's, whether by pleasing or teasing, can easily take. Thanks for that. You read it so beautifully. And um, I've also listened to Auden reading it. And, you know, he reads a different version from the, the book in the catalogue. So it's a poem that has a number of different versions. But you know, limestone as a geologist, you know, I have a house called limestone. Um, it's the name of my house. In fact, my house, I'm trying to do a John Hegley here with my limestone. Uh, that's a piece of perfect limestone. 
uh, with its, uh, it's got some fossils in it. Maybe you can see some fish tooth fossils in there. So that's a piece of limestone. It's, it's pretty hard stuff. And, you know, I went on a uh, pilgrimage to Rokop, that's how you say what looks like Rookhope, but Rokop is where Auden used to go in the northern Pennines. And I went to look for this rounded hillside, and sure enough, in the pictures people have, there's a picture of a rounded hillside. But that rounded hillside is all Carboniferous sandstone. It's not limestone at all. So that was confusing. Um, he talks about limestone being soft. Well, limestone does make beautiful pebbles, round pebbles. We've all done this on a beach. Pick up the roundest pebble you can find. Um, and they, they do weather beautifully round. And it's partly because they dissolve, but they also ablate. And they're quite isotropic materials. So you'd end up with a lovely round stone. Uh, probably the, this one came from uh, somewhere in Greece, probably used in a slingshot at some point in the past, perhaps. But, you know, I did find some limestone underneath this rounded hillside. And this is the hardest, sharpest limestone you'd ever want to find, you know. And it's not rounded at all. It's from a cast. And it's, it's very, very angular. And so this was underneath. So for me, what I think Auden inspired by the limestone was the, the mines underneath this Carboniferous sandstone in the uh, veins and the faults in the mine you know, came all the minerals that from that. And he talks about the water coming out. So I think it's almost like about the hiddenness of what's underneath the surface. I don't think he was talking about the surface. I think he was talking about what's underneath. And he was a, you know, at that time, I guess he had a, a male partner and he was living, uh, he was living in an island, uh, Ischia, in, um, in Italy when he wrote this poem. And that island is actually volcanic. That's not limestone at all. So... I, I'm interested, people say, of course, it's a love poem. It's not a poem about geology, but it's interesting how he used the geological image and he gets people uh, feeding off that. And I think um, for me, you know, having been suggested, uh, like John says, we all go away and do our homework. In fact, I found a poem called In Praise of Sandstone. Um, In Praise of Sandstone is a poem about the buildings in a city in Australia. So maybe In Praise of Limestone is is back to... St. Paul's Cathedral and, and, and the fact that it's a building material. So, you know, I think it's, there are so many levels you can go into and, and that's what's been fascinating. So I think um, we may see some uh, comments coming back in um, the... the uh, so, so some people think that... Yeah, Brian, Brian Wally uh, is saying that it's a love poem, yes. Uh, and, and Brian Rosen is saying, um, yeah, it's got limestone and coals. The coals and the shales, uh, those are from the Carboniferous, and the limestone is underneath the, that. So it's, it's, um, it's certainly a good place to go and look at topography, and, and obviously had a big impact on Auden. So I think, uh, and what's been fascinating with John, I mean, for those that don't know, John, behind the scenes, John's been going away and doing all this geology almost from scratch. You know, we end up with a little conversation where uh, he was put in touch and he said, OK, and uh, he's, he's gone and mined his history and he's gone and mined his local area and come up with all these lovely ideas. You know, even some that he's actually discovered, you know, since he last sent me an email because he sent a lot of emails. But... Uh, and, and many people have come back and said that image is just like the thin sections, you know, the thin sections that um, we had earlier on. Uh, we had some images uh, from, from Faith, uh, I think, uh, of a thin section that was just before lunch. And what's lovely is all the interweaving of all the things that have gone on, musical, artistic and, and poetry. So I thought I would just end uh, by um, wrapping up, uh, going back to the presentation, uh, and so I can share my, my slide. Um, and, and people have asked, what do we do with this poetry, comp uh, with this caption competition? Uh, so um, I had put there, and you have shown people uh, what the uh, picture is, um, and you've told people what you will get. Uh, uh, Dr. Florence Bascom holding a, rump a lump of rock and the rock to be determined. And people have already sent in some captions, so send that to me, and I will anonymize them and send them to John, and he can pick one, 
and then we can get back in touch. And just by Sunday night. So if you could do that by Sunday night, not going to take very long on this. So uh, as closing comments, you know, I've written down a few things along the way uh, as uh, we've been going through this. Um, I think we've covered an incredible wide spectrum of geology. I think we've been through every period. We've been through most rock types. Um, and, you know, we've, we've been through a lot of geologists present. Uh, and, we, you know, we've seen how the next generation has been inspired by geological fathers. We've seen geologists write poems. And we've seen a whole range of poetic forms. And Scylla's haiku, Scylla haiku is a special type of haiku. Uh, so we've also seen some new forms. I think this uh, whole idea, which I thought was great coming in very early on, this whole thing about place identity, geo-identity, uh, shapes all the years of things I heard, can't, can't be separated from your, your place of birth. And for me, with that Perbic poems, is absolutely true. Uh, the purpose of rocks, I rather like that. The purpose of rocks is to record time. Somebody told, said that. Uh, well, what about the missing time? And I think... Neil has, has, has captured many people's imagination by pointing out that most of the geological record is missing. You know, it's the missing time, and that's the bit that we have to make up often. Um, there's a very close link between appreciation of landscape and appreciation of its geology and appreciation of the people in the landscape, whether they are mining people or uh, people uh, observing the landscape, talking about the landscape. Uh, I like the point that geologists and poets share truth and imagination. Um, and uh, Alison's random synchronous complexity, I guess we're all working in that, this lovely uh, complexity that came from today. Uh, you know, we, we had all these, we asked people to submit things and we got all this stuff and what are we going to do with it? So we just accepted everything and then tried to fit it all in. And I'm sorry if some people didn't have enough time, but... And then people said, oh, there's far too much. But then those people have also shared the fact they've been with us all day long. So I'm very pleased about that. Um, you know, coming back to this, I was interested in getting a definition for geopoetry and geopoetics because everybody asked me that. What's the difference? And so I think Norman helped, Nori helped lay out there the fact that, you know, is geopoetry a couplet and geopoetics the stanza? Is that the connection or are they both couplets? Um, I think uh, going forward from this meeting, you know, in the uh, output from this meeting, which we hope to be a publication, we hope that the Edinburgh Geological Society will publish this. Uh, I will help edit it. Norman's volunteer to help it. The question mark there is if anybody else wants to help, they should let me know. Um, we, uh, as everybody happy with posting these abstracts online as the document? Uh, if you're not, you better let me know. Um, people have been happy to share that with the community. We do have now a community. And I wonder whether that community, I think the Geological Society does not want to start a poetry group. Um, and it would be a rather limited poetry group. And we've all appreciated the broadness and it may be that the Scottish Centre of Geopoetics is a home for all of us, so we should all join the Scottish Centre of Geopoetics as a member. Uh, it has some very interesting get-togethers uh, along these lines, if you're interested. Um, so uh, the publication, yeah, uh, I don't know when it will come out, uh, but I will be in touch with all of the panellists and ask exactly what they mind or do not want uh, going into this volume, which will come out together. And I think it would be, you know, a Bible of uh, geopoetry, geopoetics going forward. And I think it's a really exciting project. And thanks everybody for submitting their work and being so patient with all this awful technology we have to work with. But in some ways, uh, the event has been so much better, bringing people from all over the world. Uh, we haven't had to be out in the rain. Um, but we've missed the interaction that we would have had, and we missed the beers that I promised um, I promised that we would have at the end of the day to John Hegley, that we would all end up having a beer together at the end of the day. So I just have to say thanks to, to Becky, because she's held, held together the whole technology part at the Joel Sock and the team there, and this Scottish Energy Forum, which meant that we could do this without charging anything, because the license we need was all paid for by them so thank you very much everybody and i know there's some uh, board members of the scottish energy forum have been listening in today so thanks very much to the sponsorship 
And, and that's all I have to say. Uh, so I'm just going to stop sharing. Uh, I shall uh, keep talking a bit and I shall open a beer because I'm going to have a beer. It's been too much of a stressful day for me and I need to calm down. So thank you very much, everybody. Um, and, you know, safe journey home. That's what we usually say at the end of a meeting. And we look forward to seeing you again, maybe at a Scottish Centre of Geopoetics meeting. And we could also have a discussion about geopoetry 20 something else, uh, but I'm not sure uh, where that should be. So, uh, Brian, I, I see this. Thanks for all the things that are coming through. Um, Brian has raised his hand. I'm not sure how we can answer somebody raising their hand. Oh, here we are. Uh, I tried to unmute. Uh, Brian, did you want to talk? No. Does anybody want to talk? Uh, which Brian? Uh, Brian Rosen. Yes, hello. Um, you raised your hand a few times. Thank you, just to say goodbye, because it's been such a fantastic day and you've all done so well with the organising in spite of all those numbers. And it's very sad that we couldn't all be in Edinburgh, as everybody's saying. But thanks so much. Thank you for saying that, Brian. And thanks for all the feedback through. And I'm sure we can all keep in touch through email. And I can be a person to direct things if you can't find people's email addresses. But the panellists were all in the handout document. Well, most of them. OK. I will stay here and say goodbye until all 80 participants disappear. <laughs> we we had about 100 120 people all the way through the day and i'm i'm really pleased about that it's double what we could have fitted in this poetry library uh, if you want to borrow some poetry books from the scottish poetry library you can do that online and you can go and pick things up it's almost open You know, down to 36 people disappearing. Lovely. Thank you, everybody, for the messages. Thank you, Helen in Canterbury. Tina, nice to see you. Jonathan, yes, you got the address for the caption competition. Yeah, ciao, Scylla. John, you're still logged on. Yeah. Thank you very much.